Number 10, the murder of Eliza Jane Davis. 15-year-old Eliza Jane Davis spent the night of June 17, 2007, partying with one of her housemates and one of her housemates' friends. Both were 16-year-old girls. The trio spent the night drinking and doing methamphetamines at their home in Collie, Australia. The next day, the two 16-year-olds decided that they wanted to murder someone because they wanted to know what it felt like to kill a person. They had talked about killing someone before, but on that day, they decided to carry out the murder. Since one of the girls had to travel back to Perth later that day, they didn't want the murder to be messy. They also decided that their victim would be Eliza. The two girls were able to sneak up on Eliza as she was flipping through some old yearbooks. Using a wire from the stereo system, one of the girls strangled Eliza, and then the other one put a rag soaked in chemicals over her mouth and her nose. After a few minutes, Davis stopped moving. They then buried her body under the house and reported her missing to the police. Over the next two days, the girls helped Eliza's family look for her before they turned themselves into the police, and they confessed. The girls said that they regretted the murder because of all the trouble it caused, but they showed absolutely no remorse for killing their friend. They have never given a motive for the killing, other than saying that they wanted to see what it felt like to take a life. In 2007, the two girls were sentenced to life in prison with a 15-year non-parole period. Number 9. Isaiah Fowler On April 27, 2013, 12-year-old Isaiah Fowler of Valley Springs, California was home alone with his 8-year-old sister Layla. The rest of the family had gone out to a little league game about 5 minutes away from the house. Short time later, Isaiah called his stepmother and father to tell them that he saw an intruder run out of the house. Isaiah then called 911 and he told the 911 dispatcher that someone had broken into his house. At first, Isaiah told the dispatcher that the intruder was a black man, but later in the call he said that it was a Hispanic man. Then, a minute and a half into the call, the dispatcher asked Isaiah if anyone else was in the house, and that is when Isaiah revealed that his 8-year-old sister had been stabbed. When the police and the paramedics arrived at the house, they found 8-year-old Layla dead on the top bunk of a bunk bed. She had been stabbed over 20 times. For the next two weeks, the police searched for the supposed home intruder, but then in a surprise move, they arrested Isaiah. The police believe that Isaiah used one or two steak knives from the kitchen to stab Layla. He then washed the blood off himself and the knives, and about 45 minutes after the stabbing, he called his parents and then 911. Isaiah was found guilty of murder, and in 2015 he was sentenced to 16 years in prison. He has always claimed that he is innocent, and his family supports him. His lawyer said that the police found DNA on Layla's body, and the DNA does not belong to Isaiah or anyone associated with the Fowler family, and this proves that there was an intruder in the house that day. However, no match for the DNA has ever been found. Isaiah will be eligible to be released in 2022 when he is 22 years old. Number 8. Alyssa Bustamante December 17, 2006 was a Friday, but it was a day off school for 15-year-old Alyssa Bustamante. She spent the day digging two shallow graves in the woods near her house in St. Martin's, Missouri. Four days later, Bustamante got her 6-year-old sister to go to a neighbor's house and asked her friend, 9-year-old Elizabeth Olton, to come out to the woods. Once there, Bustamante surprised the girl. She strangled Elizabeth, slit her throat, and then stabbed her. After Elizabeth was dead, Bustamante buried the body and went home. Once at home, Bustamante wrote about the murder in her journal. The passage from that night reads, I just f killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my god, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now. LOL. After writing the entry, Bustamante went to a dance at her church and acted as if nothing had happened. Meanwhile, the police were searching the woods where Elizabeth was buried, but they were unable to locate her body. Two days after Elizabeth disappeared, the police received an anonymous letter implicating Bustamante in the disappearance. The police talked to her and she led them to the body. When Bustamante went to trial, it was revealed that she had a dark fantasy life. A police officer testified at her trial that she killed Elizabeth because she wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. Also, on one of her social media accounts, she listed one of her hobbies as killing people. Bustamante pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and armed criminal action. She was given life with the chance of parole. Number 7. Evan Savoy and Jake Aiken On February 15, 2003, Evan Savoy and Jake Aiken, who were both 11 years old and were best friends, 
were hanging out in a park in Ephrata, Washington. At some point, Savoy pulled out a knife and said that he wanted to go on a killing spree. So the boys went to the trailer home of Craig Sorger. Craig had just turned 13, he had an IQ of 93, and he had mild autism. They asked him if he wanted to come out and play, and he agreed. Craig joined the two boys, and one of them suggested that they build a fort. Savoy told Craig to put his hand to the ground and then hold it there for 10 seconds to see if the ground was wet. So Craig got to his knees and started counting. When he got to 9, Savoy dropped a rock that was about the size of a basketball on the back of his head. Craig cried and tried to run away, but Savoy attacked him. He then took out his knife and stabbed Craig multiple times. Savoy then taunted Aiken, so Aiken picked up a stick and started to beat Craig with it. The attack lasted for several minutes, and then the two boys washed off their clothes in a nearby pond, and then they went home. When Craig didn't return home, his mother went looking for him, and sadly, she found his dead body. An autopsy was performed, and Craig had been stabbed 34 times and hit 16 times. Since the boys were the last ones seen with Craig, they were questioned, and originally they denied the murder. However, they were charged with the murder, and when they went to trial, Aiken confessed to taking part in the killing. In 2005, Aiken was sentenced to 14 years in prison, and Savoy was sentenced to 26 years in prison in 2006. Number 6. Sharon Carr On June 7, 1982, 18-year-old Katie Ratcliffe was found stabbed to death on the side of the road in Camberley, England. She was nearly naked and she had been stabbed over 30 times with a 6-inch blade. She had also been sexually mutilated. The police thought that the killer was most likely a man. It was actually 12-year-old Sharon Carr. Carr, who had a history of mental illness and was known to torture animals, picked Ratcliffe at random. After killing the young woman, Carr wrote about the murder extensively in her diary. For example, she wrote, I was born to be a murderer. Killing for me is a mass turn on and it just makes me so high I never want to come down. Every night I see the devil in my dreams, sometimes even in my mirror, but I realize it was just me. The murder of Katie Ratcliffe would go unsolved for five years. Then, in 1997, Carr was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison for stabbing a 13-year-old classmate. Once in prison, Carr admitted to killing Ratcliffe and her diary was used as evidence. Carr was originally sentenced to a minimum of 14 years in prison, but that was later lowered by two years. While in prison, Carr attacked other inmates and staff, and she was sent to live at Broadmoor Hospital. That is where she met Robert Lane, who was institutionalized after killing his mother by gouging out her eyes. The couple got married in 2001. Currently, Carr is in a psychiatric hospital. She is the youngest female convicted of murder in modern English history. Number 5. Girl A On June 1, 2004, 12-year-old Satomi Maitare went to school at the Okobu Elementary School in Sasebo, Japan. During lunch, the students ate in the classroom, but Satomi was lured away to an empty study room by an 11-year-old female classmate. The teacher first noticed something was amiss when the girls didn't return to the classroom after being away for about 15 minutes. When the 11-year-old returned to the classroom with blood on her, the teacher went looking for Satomi and she found her bleeding in the study room. An ambulance was called, but the 12-year-old was pronounced dead at the scene. The 11-year-old girl, who has never been named publicly and has only ever been identified as Girl A, was taken into custody. At first, she said that there was no motive for the murder. Then she later said that it was because Satomi had said some mean stuff to her online. Apparently, Satomi had made fun of the girl's weight and called her a goody-goody. So Girl A lured Satomi to the room and had her sit in a chair. Then, using a box cutter, Girl A slit Satomi's throat and then proceeded to cut her arms and her neck with the box cutter. Girl A spent a total of four years incarcerated, and she was released in 2008. Her identity has never been made public. Oddly enough, the murder is the basis of an internet meme called Nevada Tan. Number 4. Aaron Keen When Aaron Keen was eight years old, his mother died of cancer, and he went to live with his father in Woodbridge, New Jersey. After his mother's death, Keen became an angry and violent child. He hit one playmate with a baseball bat, and he would throw rocks at kids in the neighborhood. On March 26, 2003, Keen, who was 11 at the time, was at his local library for a tutoring session. Also at the library was three-year-old Amir Beeks, who was there with his sister. Keen managed to lure the three-year-old boy back to his backyard, where there was a plastic log cabin. Once inside, Keen beat the boy with a baseball bat. He then left Amir face down near a stream not far from his house. Sadly, Amir died the next day in the hospital. The police found out that Amir was last seen with Keen, and the 11-year-old was arrested. He was charged with the murder, and he pleaded guilty. The only motivation he could give for the murder was that he got angry when the boy asked to use a scooter. Keen was sentenced to 18 years in prison, and he was paroled in November 2016. Number 3. Christopher Pittman 
In 2001, 12-year-old Christopher Pittman of Oxford, Florida ran away from the home that he shared with his father and his sister. When the police brought him back home, he threatened to commit suicide. This led to him being put into a psychiatric hospital for six days where he was diagnosed with clinical depression and he was prescribed Paxil, an antidepressant that is no longer prescribed to people under the age of 18. Instead of going back to live at his parents' house, Pittman went to live with his grandparents in Chester, South Carolina. When Pittman went to see a doctor in Chester, the doctor didn't have any samples of Paxil, so he put him on Zoloft instead. Nearly immediately, his family noticed that he was suffering from the negative side effects of Zoloft. He was fidgety and he said that it felt like his skin was on fire. On November 28, 2001, Pittman got into a fight with another boy on the school bus. After he got home, his grandparents took him to church, but they had to leave the service early because Pittman was causing too much of a scene. At home, his grandfather supposedly spanked him with a belt and talked about sending him back to Florida. After his grandparents went to sleep, Pittman stayed awake in his bedroom. Then, at around midnight, he got a pump-action shotgun out of his grandfather's cabinet. In his signed confession, Pittman said, I went to the bedroom. I just aimed at the bed. I shot four times. After killing his grandparents, he set the house on fire and then drove off in one of their vehicles. He was stopped a short time later and arrested. Pittman's lawyers argued that he wasn't responsible for the murders. Instead, it was caused by the side effects of the Zoloft. However, he was found guilty of the double murder. After a lengthy legal battle, in 2010, Pittman was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Number 2. The Murder of Pierre Bura. On October 29, 1993, three children, ages 8, 9, and 10, who lived in the Paris suburb of vitre sur saint were on a holiday from school. They were visiting with two homeless men that they had befriended who had set up a shack in a vacant lot in their neighborhood. Problems arose when another homeless man named Pierre Bura tried to join the group. They rejected him, and in response, Bura set the shack on fire. Angry over the fire, one of the homeless men, 37-year-old Jean-Marc Ledoux, punched Bura, knocking him to the ground. He then told the children, I now leave it to you. The children then proceeded to beat and torture Bura, who was 40 years old, for two hours before they pushed him into a well while he was still alive. Lardu and the children were charged with the murder a short time later. At the time of their arrest, the children, who have never been identified, didn't grasp the gravity of what they had done. Nevertheless, they were convicted of the murder and two of them were released to the custody of their parents and one of the children was placed in a government home. Lardu was given two years in prison for his role in the murder. Number 1. Craig Price Even at the age of 13, Craig Price of Warwick, Rhode Island was a large and imposing figure. He played football and his nickname was Iron Man. Price had a long history of breaking and entering into houses, and on July 27, 1987, he went to the home of his neighbor, 27-year-old mother of two, Rebecca Spencer. Price found a door unlocked and he let himself in. Inside the house, he found Spencer asleep in front of the TV in the living room. She woke up and was startled to see Price there. She hit him and told him to leave. Instead, Price picked up a knife and stabbed her 58 times. He then walked out of Spencer's house and threw the knife into a corner of the backyard. Two years later, on August 11, 1989, Price, who was now 15, broke into another home in his neighborhood. As he was looking around for something to steal, he woke in 39-year-old Joan Heaton. Joan tried to run away from Price, but he attacked her and tried to strangle her. The commotion woke up Joan's two daughters, 10-year-old Jennifer and 8-year-old Melissa, and when they came out of their room, they found Price attacking their mother. Joan told her daughters to get the phone, but they were too terrified to move. Price grabbed a knife that was in the kitchen, and he stabbed Joan, Jennifer, and Melissa, killing all three. In total, Joan suffered about 57 stab wounds. After killing the family, Price put sheets over their bodies, and then he walked into the backyard and threw up. Price then went home and acted like nothing happened. As the police investigated the murder of the Hedons, they learned that the killer had cut himself and left some of his blood at the scene. FBI profiler Greg McCary was called in and he said that the killer would most likely be someone who lived in the neighborhood. So the police scoured the neighborhood looking for someone who was wearing a bandage and two detectives happened upon Price who had his finger bandaged up. He told the police that he cut it when he smashed a car window trying to break into it. The police looked into his story and there was no record of a car being broken into, so they brought Price in for questioning. Price agreed to do a polygraph test and the results showed that he was being dishonest. This led to the police getting a warrant and they searched the Price's house. Inside they found the knife from the murder and some bloody clothes. Price confessed to the four murders and he pleaded guilty. 
At the time, the state of Rhode Island had a law that if someone committed a crime under the age of 16, the longest that they can be incarcerated is until their 21st birthday, and then they are released with a new identity and a clean record. This upset a lot of people, especially the family of the Hedons. They actively campaigned to change the young offender laws and they wanted Price to stay in prison for as long as possible. While they were successful in getting the laws changed that a young offender can be tried as an adult, it couldn't be retroactively applied to Price. However, Price didn't get out of prison when he was 21, and at the time of this video, he is still in prison. Price kept getting time added on for altercations with correctional officers. He is currently set to be released in 2022. Number 3, Isaiah Fowler. April 27, 2013 was a Saturday, and it was a warm day in Valley Springs, California. That morning, 8-year-old Layla Fowler stayed home with her brother, 12-year-old Isaiah Fowler, while the rest of the family was out at a Little League game. The brother and sister apparently had a great relationship, and it was normal for Layla to stay home with her brother. At around noon, Isaiah called his father and stepmother. He said that a strange man was in the house, and he ran out the back door. Isaiah didn't say anything about his sister being hurt. His stepmother then called 911, and she said that an intruder had been in the house. A few minutes later, Isaiah called 911 himself, while his father and stepmother raced home. A minute and a half into the call, he said that his sister had been stabbed. A paramedic arrived on the scene, and he found Layla's body on the floor of her bedroom beside her television. He noted that Layla's body was cool to the touch. The police arrived at the house and concluded that Layla had been stabbed on the top bunk of her bed. The wall beside the bed was splattered with blood. The first person that the police interviewed was Isaiah. He said that at around noon he was in the bathroom and Layla was in her bedroom. He heard a man yelling and then heard his sister screaming. He got out of the bathroom and he saw a man with long gray hair running out the back door. He then called his stepmother and his father. Isaiah walked into the kitchen to grab a knife in case there were more men in the house and then he went looking for his sister. When he got to her room he found the wall covered in blood and Layla beside her TV. Based on Isaiah's version of events, the police started searching for a man with long gray hair and showed Isaiah some mug shots. While the police were searching for a suspect, an autopsy was performed. The medical examiner concluded that Layla had been stabbed 20 times. 14 of the stab wounds were called prod injuries. They were shallow stabs like she was being poked as a way to abuse her or intimidate her. The forensic unit noted that there was no blood between the bunk bed and where her body was found across the room beside the TV. They think that she was carried there very quickly or thrown from the bed across the room. The rest of the house was searched and the police found a set of J.A. Henkel's serrated steak knives in the kitchen. The tip of one of them was bent. The knife didn't appear to have blood on it but they dissected it, and traces of Layla's blood was found under the composite handle. Two weeks later, the police announced that they had a suspect, 12-year-old Isaiah. They said that he stabbed his sister, washed all the blood off himself and the knife, and then about 45 minutes after his sister was dead, he called his father and stepmother. This explains why Layla's body was cool when the paramedic touched her. The police said that they didn't find any evidence of anyone else being in the house that morning. They also said that the chances of someone breaking into the house in broad daylight on a Saturday is very unlikely. The main reason they suspected Isaiah was because he was in the house when Layla was attacked. He used the knife from the kitchen and washed it afterwards. He also gave inconsistent statements to the 911 dispatcher and when talking to the police. Isaiah went to trial in 2015. Isaiah's lawyers said that he wouldn't have been able to wash all the blood off himself, especially his clothes. 
The crime scene was quite bloody, but Isaiah only had a smear of blood from his right wrist to his right elbow. Layla's DNA was also found on a Ghostbuster shirt in Isaiah's room. The shirt had a reddish stain on the back left shoulder and a discoloration near the abdomen. On the reddish stain, they found Layla's DNA. On the discoloration, they found a mix of Isaiah's and Layla's DNA. So how did 12-year-old Isaiah manage to clean himself so thoroughly? If he showered, there would have been traces of blood in the shower, but there were no traces of blood in the washroom at all. They even tested the pipes and found no traces of Layla's blood or cleaning supplies. As for the knife, the police think, but they are not 100% sure, that the steak knife is the murder weapon. Isaiah's lawyers argue that the murder weapon was a different knife. They say that Layla's blood was on the knife, but it could have gone there at any time. They said the same thing about the DNA on Isaiah's shirt. The tests only show the presence of the DNA, and not when the DNA got there. His lawyers also say that there is DNA evidence that indicates someone else was in the house around the time that Layla was killed. During her autopsy, Layla was examined to see if she was sexually assaulted. She had not been sexually assaulted, but near her buttocks, the medical examiner found a strand of long brown hair. The hair belonged to Layla, but on the hair they found genetic material belonging to someone else. It was male DNA, and it did not belong to Isaiah. In fact, it didn't belong to any members of the Fowler family. Isaiah's lawyers say that this proves that someone else was in the house that day. The result of the trial is that Isaiah, who was 15 at the time, was found guilty of second degree murder. He was sentenced to the maximum, which was 8 years. He will be released from prison around the age of 23. His family supports him and think he is innocent. They think that the person who killed 8 year old Layla is still out there. Number 2. Susie and Roger Bailey In June of 1969, Charles and Ruby Bailey of Parkersburg, West Virginia had 13 children. Twelve of the children lived with them in a tar paper house in a poor area of town. Charles and Ruby were also first cousins. Around 1 o'clock on the morning of June 8th, the fire department was called to their property. When the fire department arrived at the fire, the house was engulfed in flames and they could hear family members inside screaming. There appeared to be only one person who made it out of the house. That was the grandfather, 63-year-old Obi Bailey, who was staying with the family. He climbed out of a window to safety, and when the fire department arrived at the home, they found Obi sitting on a chair watching the fire. At first, it was thought that Charles and Ruby, along with 12 of their children, who ranged in age from 17 to 5 months old, perished in the fire. Hours later, the authorities learned that two of the Bailey children weren't killed in the fire. 15-year-old Susie and 13-year-old Roger lived in a two-bedroom building that was detached from the rest of the home. When the fire started, Susie and Roger ran to a nearby store and called Susie's boyfriend, 19-year-old John Baumgartner, to come pick them up. Baumgartner and Susie were first cousins. Baumgartner then took Susie and Roger to another relative's home. The fire marshal quickly determined that the cause of the fire was arson. There was an open gas can in the home, and there were several large places where the fire spread quickly. The first suspect was Obi. On the morning of the fire, some of the relatives were sitting around a table discussing why Obi might have started the fire. Then Roger supposedly spoke up and said he knew Obi didn't start the fire. He said that he and Susie splashed the gas around the home. Then they went outside, lit a piece of paper on fire, and then threw it through a broken window. When he was asked why they did it, he said it was because Susie was mad at their father. He had forced her to stop dating Baumgartner. When Susie was questioned, she also admitted to starting the fire. 
Both Susie and Roger were arrested and charged with 12 counts of murder 24 hours after the fire. In October, these charges were dismissed because the confessions were considered inadmissible. When they were interviewed by the police, neither Roger nor Susie, who were both minors, had attorneys present. By the time Susie was interviewed, she had been denied food and sleep for 24 hours. She also had an IQ level of around 71, so she had the mental capacity of a 10-year-old. Roger was taken in by a woman who lived in North Carolina. Susie was sent to live with a foster family in Ohio. She was given a new name, Laura Jean Boone, and her old records were destroyed. Susie was constantly in trouble for having young men in her foster family's home while her guardians were at work. She also ran away several times. At least once she ran away to be with Baumgartner. Then in June 1971, she was committed to a psychiatric hospital in Athens, Ohio. She spent six weeks in the hospital and then ran away. She stopped in to visit her brother in North Carolina, but where she went afterwards is unclear. In October 1971, Susie sent letters to her brother and her older sister that didn't live in the house at the time of the fire. In the letter, she said she had gone married and she was moving to the Northeast. Her family doesn't know where she went and her current whereabouts are unknown. Number one, Zachary Whitman. On October 2nd, 1998, 15-year-old Zachary Whitman of New Freedom, Pennsylvania stayed home from school because he was sick. His parents went to work and his younger brother, 13-year-old Gregory Whitman, went to school. At 3.06 p.m., Gregory got off the bus and headed towards home. Zachary had left the key in the lock in the front door so that Gregory could let himself in. At 3.09, a friend of Gregory's called the Whitman house. The friend knew that there were at least two phones in the home and they made different noises when they were picked up. This call was answered on the downstairs phone. Whoever picked up the phone hung it up immediately without saying anything. Gregory arrived home at 3.10. At 3.15, the friend called again. Zachary answered the phone that was on the second floor of the home. He said that he didn't think that Gregory was home yet, and he hung up the phone. The friend said that Zachary sounded fine, and she noticed nothing unusual about him. At 3.17, Zachary called 911. These are clips from the actual call. Listen to me, is he breathing? No, no. He's not breathing? No. All right, stay on the phone with me a minute. Come on. I gotta call my mom. Okay, you need to stay on the phone with me for now, okay? I gotta call my mom. No, you need to stay on the phone with me. Okay. Uh, come on. Come on. All right, what's your name? I'm not Zach. Your name is Zach, your yeah. last name? Whitman. Whitman. Yeah. Okay. I gotta call my mom. Okay. Do work. What's your phone number there, Zach? 7929 I hear them. Okay, they're on their way. I'm gonna go ahead and hang up with you. Oh, You're on. sure there's nobody else around? I don't see anyone. I don't see anyone. I didn't look. I don't want to look. I don't want to look. Listen to me a minute. Okay, you say you were upstairs and you heard a bang and that's it. Not a bang. It's Not like, a bang. You heard a loud like, noise. It's just like suffering almost, like like not going around. Yeah, and then, and then I come downstairs and the door's cracked and just lying there. Just lying there. Paramedics arrived at the home seven minutes later. The police arrived not long afterwards. As the police searched the home, Zachary was outside screaming that he needed to call his mother. A paramedic found Gregory's body in the laundry room. It was clear that he had been stabbed dozens of times and he was nearly decapitated. The detective then stepped outside to interview Zachary. He had some blood on his hands, his shirt, and blood on the bottom of his socks. There was also blood on the cordless phone that he used to call 911. 
The police asked him what happened, and Zachary said that he was upstairs in his parents' bed. He answered the phone on the second floor when Gregory's friend called the second time. After hanging up, he heard what he thought sounded like Gregory wrestling with one of his friends. He went to the staircase and he saw a lot of blood and a broken table at the bottom of the staircase in the front foyer. He went down the stairs and walked to the laundry room where he found Gregory's body and then he called 911. Just after midnight, the police sprayed luminol, a chemical that reacts to blood, around the Whitman property. They found blood trails leading throughout the first floor of the home. They found one trail that led to the back door, but there was no blood on the back door itself. Outside, at the side of the house, luminol lit up a mound of dirt beside the family's hot tub. Buried in the dirt was a pair of soccer goalie gloves and a one and three quarter inch pen knife. An autopsy was performed and Gregory had been stabbed over a hundred times. 65 of the wounds were to his neck and this nearly caused his decapitation. The knife found buried beside the hot tub was consistent with the wounds. The police concluded that Zachary ambushed his brother with the knife in the foyer of the home after he walked in the front door. He came up behind him and slit his throat. He threw Gregory into the side table, breaking it. He then carried Gregory through the dining room, through the kitchen, to the laundry room that was near the back of the home. After nearly decapitating his brother, he ran through the house, out the back door, around to the side to the hot tub, and buried the gloves and the knife. He then answered the call from Gregory's friend when she called the second time, and then he called 911. Eight days after Gregory was killed, Zachary was charged with first-degree murder. Zachary and Gregory's parents hired a lawyer named Christina Gutierrez. The result of the trial was that Gregory was found guilty. Even though he was 15 at the time of the murder, Zachary was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. His parents still believe that he is innocent, and over the years, several experts have suggested that the case should be re-examined. The first aspect of the case that is questionable is the timeline. Gregory arrived home at 3.10, his friend called at 3.15, and Zachary supposedly answered the phone that was upstairs. Zachary called 911 at 3.17, and he stayed on the line till 3.24, when the paramedics arrived on the scene. That gives Zachary about seven to seven and a half minutes to stab his brother over a hundred times, run out the back door to the side of the house, bury the evidence, go back inside, go upstairs and answer the phone, and then call 911. Is seven and a half minutes enough time to do all that? If someone else killed Gregory, they had the time between when Gregory got home and when the paramedics arrived, which is about 14 uninterrupted minutes to kill Gregory, bury the evidence, and flee. Also, if Zachary did kill his brother, why did he call 911 so quickly after the stabbing? Zachary said he had blood on his shirt from trying to help his brother. If he killed his brother, why wouldn't he have changed out of his clothes before he called 911? Another problem is that when Gregory's friend called at 3.15, she didn't notice anything out of the ordinary about Zachary. Notably, he didn't sound like he was out of breath. Stabbing someone over a hundred times would take several minutes and most likely leave the killer winded. Secondly, there were no traces of blood on the second floor of the home. That means whoever killed Gregory didn't go upstairs after the murder. If Zachary really did answer the second phone call that came in at 3.15 on the second floor phone, then he couldn't have been the one who stabbed his brother. Besides the timeline, some experts had several problems with the murder weapon. The first is that the knife is pretty flimsy. Could a 15-year-old have used this knife to nearly decapitate someone in under 7 minutes? According to one expert who specializes in knives, the neck is pretty difficult to cut through with any knife, let alone to do it in under 7 minutes. 
Also, could the knife withstand that type of attack without being bent or even broken? The expert thinks that the knife was used in the murder, but it wasn't the primary knife. If the pen knife was used in the murder, the killer probably would have cuts on their hands because the knife would have probably slipped down on the killer's hand because the knife doesn't have any grips or a guard. Also, the blood would have made the knife slippery. Zachary's hands had no new cuts or scratches on them. If Zachary wore the gloves, there probably would be cuts on them, but there weren't. The last problem with the case is that there was no motive. The brothers seemed close and no one saw any animosity between the boys. Just before Gregory was killed, Zachary built him a soccer net. Another problem that Zachary faced when he went to court was his lawyer, Christina Gutierrez. Gutierrez will be familiar to people who listened to the first season of NPR's podcast, Serial. She was the lawyer of Adnan Saeed, the subject of the podcast. For most of her career, Gutierrez had an excellent reputation. However, starting in the mid-1990s, several of Gutierrez's clients, including the Whitmans, noticed her acting oddly. She would ask the Whitmans, and several other clients, for thousands of dollars and say it was to pay expert witnesses. She was also supposed to hold money in trust funds. It turned out that Gutierrez just kept the money instead. In Zachary Whitman's case, she also didn't file motions, and when she did, many of them were late. In 2001, a record number of people filed complaints against Gutierrez. The complaints were filed just after she spent months in the hospital. She had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She agreed to be disbarred instead of fighting the charges. In total, 28 claims against Gutierrez were paid out. This included the Whitmans. The Whitmans said that Gutierrez's ineffective counsel ensured that their son was found guilty. Gutierrez died in 2014. Zachary has always denied killing his brother and his parents support him. They visit Zachary almost every week in prison. They still live in the same house where Gregory was murdered. The chief deputy prosecutor says that he is sure that Zachary is guilty, but says he is sympathetic to the family. He said that based on the tragic circumstances where one son murdered the other one and is serving a life sentence without parole, that they need to believe that Zachary is innocent just as a way to go on with their lives. He said that they manufacture reasonable doubt to sustain themselves. In 2012, the United States Supreme Court ruled that sentencing a person under the age of 18 to life without parole was unconstitutional. In 2016, it was made clear that the ruling was retroactive. So whether Zachary killed his brother Gregory or not, someday he'll get a chance at being free. Number 3. Anthony Jacques Foussard Milpitas is a sleepy city just north of San Jose, California. In the early 1980s, the city had a population of about 38,000 people. According to the newspaper, San Francisco Weekly, it was best known for being the home of a large landfill. On November 3, 1981, 14-year-old Marcy Conrad skipped her afternoon classes at Milpitas High School and she went to the home of Anthony Jacques Broussard. Broussard was 16 years old, and he attended the same high school. Broussard was a large young man. He stood 6 foot 4, and he weighed 240 pounds. Broussard was apparently on LSD that afternoon. He said Marcy was sitting on his lap, and then she said something he didn't like. Apparently, she teased him about his dead mother. When Broussard was seven, he found his mother dead from natural causes in the shower. After her death, Broussard apparently started acting strangely. After she made the crack about his dead mother, he got angry and strangled her to death. Afterward, he violated the ninth grader's body. Once he was finished with her, 
He placed her body in the back of his pickup truck and he drove to the outskirts of the city. He dumped her half-naked body in a wooded ravine and drove off. When Marcy didn't come home that night, her mother reported her missing. This over 24 hours later, Broussard's friends were hanging out at a local arcade. When Broussard got there, he bragged to his friends that he had killed Marcy. They didn't believe him. To prove it, he took a group of them out to the ravine. One of the young people who saw the body was an ex-boyfriend of Marcy's and the ex-boyfriend's eight-year-old brother. At first, they thought the body was a mannequin, so someone poked the body with a stick. When they realized the body was real, they weren't sure if she was dead. One boy apparently dropped a rock on her head to test for signs of life. That proved she was dead. Amazingly, none of the kids told the police or their parents about the murder. The next day, Broussard attended school and he bragged to more people about the murder. He again took groups of people out to see the body. One of the people who went to see the body was 16-year-old Kirk Rasmussen. Rasmussen asked Broussard why he killed Marcy and apparently Broussard just laughed. Before leaving the ravine, Rasmussen put leaves over the body to try and conceal it. In total, Broussard took at least 12 fellow teenagers and an 8-year-old to see Marcy's body. It wasn't until the afternoon of November 5th about 48 hours after Marcy was killed that one of the kids who saw the body finally went to the police. He was part of the first group of kids to see the body. He said that as he had dinner that night with his family and sat in classes the next day, he kept thinking about seeing her body. Around the same time, another person who saw the body on the second day called the police. The police went to the ravine and they found the body. As the police were blocking off the crime scene, more teenagers drove up to look at the body. When they saw the police, they turned around and drove away. Broussard was arrested and the teenagers who saw the body were brought in for questioning. They were asked why they didn't go to the police. Some said that they didn't want Broussard to get in trouble. A few said that they didn't want the police to think that they were involved in the murder, so they chose to keep quiet. After Broussard was arrested, two sisters, who were 13 and 14, went to the police and said that Broussard had sexually assaulted them. In exchange for dropping the two sexual assault charges involving the sisters, Broussard agreed to a prison term of 25 years to life. Rasmussen was given three years for trying to hide the body. He was the only other teenager convicted in connection with the murder. The murder, and the fact that the other kids knew about it, yet no one reported it for nearly 24 hours, shocked people across the country. Violent movies and heavy metal music were blamed for the murder and the callousness of not just the killer, but the other teenagers who said and did nothing after seeing the dead body of their fellow schoolmate. Broussard has been eligible for parole since October 1997, but he has never been granted it. At the time of this video, he is 53 years old and he is incarcerated at the Correctional Training Facility in Soldad, California. Number 2. Joshua Phillips November 3rd, 1999 was a nice cool day in Jacksonville, Florida. Around 5 o'clock that afternoon, 8-year-old Maddie Clifton told her mom, Sheila, that she was going out to play. They lived on a quiet street and Maddie was a good kid, so Sheila wasn't too worried about her youngest daughter going out to play. At 6.30, Sheila called out for Maddie and her sister to come home for dinner. Only Maddie's sister returned home. She said she had not been playing with Maddie and she didn't know where she was. Sheila and her husband Steve 
decided to call 911 right away and the police arrived shortly afterward. Search groups were made up from people in the neighborhood and they looked for the little girl. Over the next seven days, hundreds of people searched for Maddie, but no trace of her could be found. It was like she walked through a hole in reality and vanished. Seven days after Maddie vanished, a neighbor of the Cliftons, Missy Phillips, was cleaning up around her home. She lived across the road from the Cliftons with her husband, Steve, and her 14-year-old son, Joshua. Missy, Steve, and Joshua all helped look for Maddie on the first night that she went missing. By most accounts, Joshua was just a typical teenager. He had a C average in school, he liked baseball, and he liked hanging out with his friends. While Missy was cleaning up, she noticed some liquid near the base of her son's waterbed. She thought that the bed might be leaking, which would explain the horrible smell that had started emanating from his room. She lifted the mattress and saw a small, discolored human foot. She dropped the mattress, walked outside, and found a police officer. She led the officer into her son's bedroom. Hidden in the base of the waterbed was the body of Maddie Clifton. One of the boards of the bed's base was broken and it was held in place with tape. Maddie's body was stuffed into the base and then the board was put back in place to conceal the body. For six nights, Joshua slept in the bed while Maddie's body decomposed below him. Maddie was naked from the waist down but there were no signs of sexual assault. Her pants and her underwear were hidden under the bed with her. Joshua also made attempts to cover up the smell. Beside his bed, there were air fresheners and incense. They were sitting beside one of Maddie's missing persons posters. The police had searched the Phillips house three times before and they even noticed an unusual smell. Missy said that the smell was probably just from their pet birds. Joshua was in school when the body was discovered. He was pulled out of class and brought to the police station. With his dad by his side, Joshua confessed. He said that on the day that Maddie was killed, she came over to his house and wanted to play baseball. Joshua told her that he couldn't play, but she kept pestering him. He relented and they went into his backyard to play baseball. Joshua said that he was batting and he hit a ball that struck Maddie in the head. It caused her to start bleeding and she started screaming. Joshua said he panicked and he dragged Maddie from his backyard into his bedroom. While he was dragging her, she lost the bottom half of her clothes. In the bedroom, Maddie kept screaming and he began to panic more. Joshua's father had a strict rule that Joshua wasn't allowed to have other children in the house when no adults were there and his father would be home at any time. Joshua said to get Maddie to stop screaming, he hit her in the head with his baseball bat three times. He then stabbed her three times in the throat. He stuffed her body under his bed and left her there. His father arrived home not long afterward. After his father was in the house, Joshua heard Maddie moaning and he realized that she wasn't dead. So he went back into his bedroom, pulled out her body, stabbed her a few more times in the chest and then pushed her back under the bed. The police found both the baseball bat and the knife hidden in his room. Several months later, Joshua went to trial. He was charged with first degree murder and even though he was only 14, he was charged as an adult. Joshua's defense was that Maddie's murder was a bad decision he made because he was panicking or at the very least, it was not premeditated. Therefore, he should be guilty of manslaughter or second degree murder but not first degree murder. The prosecutor said that Joshua was lying about what happened 
and he said that Joshua was a monster. The prosecutor introduced the autopsy report as evidence. The report said that Maddie had been struck three times in the head with the baseball bat and she had been stabbed ten times, three times in the throat and then seven times in the chest. The chest wounds happened after his father arrived home. Maddie was still alive after the second round of stabbings and she died after she was stuffed back under the bed. The prosecutor pointed out that there was no physical evidence backing up Joshua's version of events. He said that they were playing baseball and Maddie was hit in the head with the baseball resulting in a cut on her head. Joshua said he then dragged Maddie from the backyard into his house and into his bedroom. The first problem is that Maddie didn't have a cut on her head. Also, there was no blood found anywhere else other than Joshua's bedroom. Finally, neither Maddie's body nor her clothes had any dirt or twigs on them. The prosecutor introduced evidence that before Maddie was killed, Joshua was at home looking at violent pornography. After he killed her, he went back to looking at porn. However, Maddie had not been sexually assaulted. Something odd that was found in Joshua's room was a photograph of Maddie's 11-year-old sister. The Clifton's home had been broken into before the murder, and it is suspected that Joshua was the one who broke in, and he stole the photograph then. Joshua's defense attorney rested without calling a single witness. He just told the jury that the death was a result of the 14-year-old panicking. The jury deliberated for just over two hours before finding Joshua guilty. At the age of 14, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. The Cliftons thought that the sentence was fair. However, other people thought that locking up and throwing away the key on a 14-year-old was cruel and unusual punishment even if his crime was horrifying. In 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that giving juveniles life without parole was unconstitutional. In the summer of 2017, Joshua was given a new sentencing hearing. The Clifton's feelings towards Joshua have changed slightly over the years. Sheila doesn't hate Joshua anymore, but she still doesn't think that he should ever leave prison. She says that Maddie doesn't get a second chance at life, so why should he? Maddie's father and sister both agree with Sheila and think that Joshua should pay for what he did by living out the rest of his life in prison. The judge agreed with the Cliftons and Joshua was resentenced to life in prison. Joshua has been in maximum security since the age of 15 and he has been a model prisoner. He graduated from high school and he got a college diploma as a legal assistant slash paralegal. He helps tutor inmates who are trying to get their GED. He says that he is not a monster. He was just a kid who did something horrible. He hopes that one day he'll be released from prison. Number 1. Sinitrio Azuma In February 1997, the peaceful city of Kobe, Japan was rocked by a series of violent attacks on young girls. In two separate attacks, two preteen girls were struck in the head with a hammer. They luckily both survived. Just a month later, on March 16, 1997, there was another pair of attacks. Ten-year-old Ayaka Yamastad was struck several times in the head with a hammer and she was also stabbed in the head as well. She died as a result of her wounds. An hour after she was attacked, a second girl was attacked. She was stabbed and left to bleed to death. Luckily, she survived. Murders, especially child murders, are very uncommon in Japan and everyone in Kobe was on edge. Then, a month later, the citizens of Kobe were shocked by another horrible crime. On May 21st, 
11-year-old Jun Hana went missing. Jun was a boy, and all the other victims were girls, and none of them went missing. The people of Kobe were wondering if a second person was preying on their children, or was the killer changing their modus operandi. Three days after Jun went missing, a custodian at a junior high school in Kobe made a horrifying discovery. Near the back gate of the school was the head of a young boy in a plastic bag. The police were called and they were also disturbed by what the custodian found. They were able to identify the head. It belonged to June. The head had been removed with a hacksaw and the body wasn't at the school. The boy's eyes had been gouged out and the sides of his mouth had been cut to make it look like a grotesque smile. Inside the boy's mouth, there was a note written in red ink. In part, the note reads, This is the beginning of the game. You police guys, stop me if you can. I just really want to see people die. It is a thrill for me to commit murder. A bloody judgment is needed for my years of great bitterness. He signed off with the name Sasi Kobera Seto, which uses the Japanese symbols for the words Saki, Devil, Rose, and Sacred Master. On June 6, about two weeks after the murder, a local newspaper in Kobe received a letter written in red ink and signed off as Saki Kobera Seto. The killer also added a designation that was written in English. He called himself the school killer. The police compared the handwriting to the note that was found in June's mouth and they concluded that the letter was from the killer. In his letter, the killer discusses his hatred of the Japanese school system. He also wrote, It's only when I kill that I am liberated from the constant hatred that I suffer and I am able to attain peace. It is only when I give pain to people that I can ease my own pain. He also wrote that he was mad because the newspaper had gotten his name wrong. They called him Anibera, which means Devil's Rose. He then wrote, From now on, if you misread my name or spoil my mood, I will kill three vegetables a week. If you think I can only kill children, you are greatly mistaken. The newspaper decided to publish the letter and it terrified the citizens of Kobe. Children weren't allowed out of their parents' sight, and even adults were nervous that they may be the next person to be attacked. The police relentlessly pursued any lead that came their way. Near the end of June, they got a tip from two boys who had been beaten up by a 14-year-old classmate. They said that the boy who beat them up, who was only identified as Boy A, may be responsible for the murders. Boy A was the oldest of three children and he was from a middle class family. The boys thought that Boy A may be responsible because he had killed several animals in very sadistic ways. The police got a warrant and searched Boy A's bedroom. In his bedroom, they found a journal detailing the murders of June and Ayaka. The diary entry from the day that Ayaka was murdered reads, I carried out sacred experiments today to confirm how fragile human beings are. I think I hit her a few times, but I was too excited to remember her. In the diary entry from the day after that, he writes that he learned that both girls he attacked didn't die. He was surprised that killing someone wasn't as easy as he thought. The police found the hacksaw in a nearby pond and arrested Boy A. At the police station, he confessed to the two murders and the three other attacks. He said that when he killed June, he strangled him in the mountains and removed his head. He brought the head home first and then dropped it off at the school. Boy A was convicted of the two murders and in October 1997, he was sent to a juvenile reformatory. He was paroled in March 2004 at the age of 21 
and his parole ended later that year, leaving him free with a clean record after serving just seven years. In June 2015, Oye, who was then 32 years old, found himself in the national headlines in Japan yet again. He wrote a book about his crimes and his time in the reformatory, and it was published by a major Japanese publisher. The book is titled Zeke, which loosely translates to Desperate Song. The families of the victims were appalled by the publication of the book. Before the publication of the book, the killer wrote the families an apology letter every year. When the book was published, he sent them a copy of the book, along with another letter of apology. The families were upset because they were not consulted before the book was published, and they didn't think that the killer should profit off his crimes. The book was an instant bestseller, and the initial run of 100,000 copies were all sold. The writer supposedly made 15 million yen, which is about 150,000 US dollars, on the first printing of the book. In the epilogue of the book, the killer says that he is remorseful for his actions, but the content of the book made several people question if he really was sorry for what he did. People suspected that he got enjoyment from reliving the attacks while writing the book. The book also contained shocking and lurid details about the murders that had not been made public. The most shocking claim in the book is that when he took June's head home, he locked himself in his bedroom and did something that was, quote, far more heinous than murder, unquote. Months after the book was published, Japan Today reported that Boy A had launched a vanity website. The website was called The Unbearable Transparency of Being and it featured several odd pieces of artwork. They were pictures of a man, presumably Boy A, and he was shirtless and wearing a mask. In one picture, he is nude and it looks like a xenomorph from the Alien franchise is coming out of his crotch. There is another photograph that features his torso on the body of a scorpion. Not long after the website was launched, a Japanese tabloid decided to break Japanese privacy laws and they revealed the identity of Boy A. His name is Sinitrio Azuma. He currently lives in the Siadama Prefecture, which is north of Tokyo, where he works as a welder on construction sites. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Please don't forget to visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases and buy merchandise. Please also check out our Patreon page where you can get access to an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching. Number 3. William Bresnahan Jr. William Bresnahan Sr. was a physician and he lived in Broomfield, Colorado. He was married to a woman named Laurel and they had four children together. On August 3rd, 1964, the couple, who were both 39, were camping with their four children near Silverthorne, Colorado. The next morning, two surveyors in the area happened upon a disturbing scene. William Sr. had been brutally murdered, Laurel was missing, and three of the four children were locked in the family's camper. The children were all unharmed. The couple's eldest son, 16-year-old William Jr., said that his parents were attacked by a man with kinky hair. He said that his mother's body was at the bottom of a nearby ravine. The bodies were sent to the medical examiner and he concluded that William Sr. and Laurel had died brutal deaths. Both had been stabbed several times and they had been bludgeoned with a blunt instrument that was similar to a baseball bat. The police looked for a man with kinky hair who had been in the area that night 
but their search turned up nothing. The police soon suspected that William Jr. may have been the killer. He had cuts on his hands that could have been caused by stabbing his parents. William Jr. was interviewed by the police and he eventually confessed. He said that he never really liked his mother. He didn't really explain why he didn't like his mother, he just said it was a bunch of small things. On the evening of August 3rd, while they were camping, William Jr. said that he tried to talk to his mother about buying him a car, but she refused to listen to him. This made him angry, so he found a knife and started stabbing his mother. She kept screaming, so William Jr. picked up a tree branch and beat her until she stopped screaming. He then picked up his knife and stabbed her some more. Once she was dead, he dragged her body to the edge of the ravine and rolled it down. He then found his father, who was relaxing near their campsite. William Jr. told his father that he had killed his mother. He said that his father got angry and charged at him. William Jr. ran and his father chased him. Then his father tripped and William Jr. pounced on him. He stabbed him several times and then left him to bleed to death. But William Sr. didn't die from the stab wounds and he managed to drag himself for about a mile looking for help. And William Jr. discovered that his father wasn't where he left him. William Jr. followed the trail of blood and when he found his father, he picked up a tree branch that was about the size of a baseball bat and used it to beat his father to death. At his trial, William Jr. planned on pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. He was examined by three doctors who said he was disturbed but sane at the time of the murders. The doctors also said that it was possible that William Jr. was abused by his parents. Instead of pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, in November 1964, William Jr. pleaded guilty to two counts of first degree murder. In January 1965, William Jr., who was 17, was sentenced to two concurrent life sentences. After he was sentenced, he was placed in the Colorado State Penitentiary. Nine months later, he was caught trying to escape the prison. Using a hacksaw, he cut the bars of his cell's window and he got outside the prison walls. He had made his own wetsuit and he got into a creek that was on the prison grounds. The creek had underwater bars in it, and he set to work cutting those with a hacksaw. That was when he was caught, and he was ordered to stop. After the escape attempt, William Jr. started to focus his attention on his education. He took courses from the University of Southern Colorado, and four years later, he graduated. He had a perfect 4.0 average, and that made him top of his class. After he graduated, his case was brought to the attention of Governor Richard Lamb. Lamb commuted William Jr.'s sentence from life to 26 years and 10 months. Two years later, in 1977, William Jr. was paroled after serving 12 years in prison. When he was paroled, he moved in with his defense lawyer and his family. While William Jr. was on parole, he attended medical school at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. He finished medical school and he became licensed to practice medicine in both Colorado and California. When he was in prison, William Jr. said that the Hispanic inmates protected him. So after he became a doctor, he moved to California, where he treated non-English speaking migrant workers. In 1987, William Jr. was granted unconditional pardon by Governor Roy Romer. William Bresnahan Jr. still practices medicine and he lives in California.
We're just going to take a quick break from our video to bring you a word from our sponsor, which is one of my favorite mobile games, Vikings War of Clans. Vikings is an addictive RPG strategy game that reminds me of some of my favorite games from the 1990s, like Command and & Conquer and Civilization. The game is constantly evolving because Vikings has over 20 million online users who fight over resources, make new alliances, and even compete in live events. This month, Vikings is having a contest where you can win one of four drones. You can find all the information about the contest by following the link in the description box. Support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links in the description box and get the special bonus of 200 gold and a protective shield. Also, please don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under my nickname, Criminally Listed. And now, back to our video. Number 2. Jennifer and David Bailey In early March 1988, Susan and Richard Bailey eloped. Richard was in the Air Force, so the young couple moved around a lot. In 1990, Susan gave birth to a daughter named Jennifer. Four years later, the family grew with the birth of a son named David. The Bailey family eventually ended up settling in Roanoke, Texas. Over a decade after David was born, Susan and Richard got divorced, and Susan was given custody of the children. When Jennifer and David were in their teens, Susan struggled to financially support the family. She had several part-time jobs, and this kept her away from home quite a bit. When Jennifer was a teen, and David was a preteen, they began to show behavioral problems. Jennifer was known to steal from people, while David rarely did his homework, he got into fights at school, and he was known to cut himself. When Jennifer was 17 years old, she started to date 16-year-old Paul Henson, who attended the same high school as her. Paul was known around school for his odd behavior. He had violent mood swings, and he told people that he had a split personality. Susan did not like her daughter's boyfriend. She thought Paul was weird, and Jennifer's grades began to slip after they started dating. Shortly after they started dating, Paul befriended a 14-year-old girl who attended their high school. The 14-year-old girl wasn't identified in the media, but in Donna Fielder's book about the case, she calls the girl Mary Lee. So for the sake of simplicity, she'll be referred to as Mary Lee for the rest of this video. Paul explained to both Jennifer and Mary Lee that he had two different personalities. He then explained that one personality was in love with Jennifer, and the other was in love with Mary Lee. Both Mary Lee and Jennifer accepted this, and Paul started dating both girls. Shortly afterward, he got Jennifer and Mary Lee to hang out together, and eventually, they all started a three-way sexual relationship. Just like Susan Bailey, Mary Lee's mother did not like Paul, and she did not approve of Mary Lee hanging out with him. In the summer of 2008, tension in the Bailey household had escalated. Susan and Jennifer were constantly fighting about Paul. Eventually, Susan banned Jennifer from seeing him. In the spring, Jennifer had graduated from high school, and she was set to start art school in Dallas in October. Jennifer wanted to move into an apartment in Dallas, but Susan couldn't afford to pay for an apartment for her. Instead, Susan planned to buy a newer car, and then she would let Jennifer use her old car. Jennifer hated that idea. She didn't want the old car, and she thought she was entitled to drive the newer car. But then it turned out that Susan couldn't afford a second car. So Susan suggested that Jennifer should take the train to school every day. Jennifer hated this idea as well. Around the same time that the mother and daughter were arguing about transportation, David was acting out more than usual. One day while Susan was at work, she received a call from the police. Her neighbors had called the police because David, who was 14 years old, 
had been running around the backyard naked. In September 2008, unbeknownst to Susan, Paul and Mary Lee were spending most of their time at her home with Jennifer. When Susan was at work, which was a lot of the time, Paul and Mary Lee hung out in the open. When Susan was home, they either hid somewhere in the house or hid in the park across the road. Little did Susan know but the teens were hatching a plan. On September 23, 2008, Mary Lee's mother woke to find her daughter standing over her. Mary Lee was holding a large butcher knife. Her mother backed away from her quickly and she grabbed a phone. She called 911 and yelled at Mary Lee to drop the knife. Mary Lee cried and demanded her mother's cell phone and the keys to her car. The police arrived minutes later and they took Mary Lee to a juvenile detention center. The next day, Paul's dad reported him as a runaway. He also said that Paul had stolen his 22 caliber Ruger pistol. Paul had made threats against his high school and the police were worried that he was going to shoot up the school. The morning after Paul was reported missing, the police went to the Bailey's house and found evidence that Paul had been there, but Paul wasn't in the home, so the police left. At the time, that wasn't the only problem the Baileys were dealing with. The day before, David had been suspended from school for bringing a knife to school. Not long after the police searched her home for Paul, Susan went to work her shift at a dress shop, and then she went to her second job at Bed Bath & Beyond. She returned home around midnight, exhausted. She walked upstairs, and she was ambushed. 16-year-old Paul came up from behind her and put a cloth with a chemical over her mouth. Susan then saw her two children, who were wearing handkerchiefs over the lower parts of their faces, move towards her. 17-year-old Jennifer and 14-year-old David then started stabbing their mother in the chest. Then, from behind, Paul slit Susan's throat twice. Susan fell to the floor and someone started stabbing her in the back of the head to make sure she was dead. Then Jennifer, David and Paul got into Susan's car and started driving. Three days later, the trio were arrested in Yankton, South Dakota. The city has a curfew for youths and the teens were found at a closed gas station at around 3.30 a.m. The officer who found them talked to Jennifer and she kept changing her story. The officer had a bad feeling about the trio so he got in contact with the police in Roanoke. Two days earlier Susan's mother had called the Roanoke police because she couldn't get a hold of her daughter or her grandchildren. Officers went to the Bailey's house and they found 43-year-old Susan's dead body lying face down at the top of the stairs. Inside the house, the police found an overwhelming amount of evidence that Jennifer, David, and Paul were the ones who killed Susan. The original plan was that Mary Lee, Paul, and Jennifer were all going to kill their parents and then run away to Canada. Jennifer told David about the plan and he was excited by it. David said it was just like in the movies. Before the murder, David rode his bike to a local store and he bought a cleaning solution that the kids used to try and clean up the crime scene. But they did a terrible job of cleaning up. Notably, Paul cut his hair and he left the hair in the bathroom. Jennifer and David left behind the handkerchiefs that they wore during the murder and the police were able to get their DNA off the handkerchiefs. The police found weapons hidden in other rooms and chocolate pudding in the refrigerator that had been poisoned. The police realized that the kids had set up multiple rooms so that they could have killed Susan in any room she might have walked into. An autopsy revealed that Susan had 26 wounds. The medical examiner said that it looked like she had been stabbed by three different people. 
After the teens were arrested in South Dakota, officers from Roanoke were sent to pick them up. Jennifer was put into one car, and Paul and David were put into another. During a pit stop, the boys were left alone in the car, and little did they know, but they were being recorded. David talked and laughed about how his mother urinated when they killed her. Then Paul mocked Susan, saying she looked like an ape. The police asked Jennifer about her relationship with her mother, and she said that they didn't see eye to eye. In December 2008, Jennifer and Paul were indicted for capital murder, and David was labeled a young offender, which in Texas is called a child in need of supervision. Since they were under 18 when they committed the murder, none of them were eligible for the death penalty. But Jennifer and Paul could have been sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole, and David could have been sentenced to up to 40 years in prison. Mary Lee agreed to a plea deal, and she pleaded guilty to aggravated assault. She was sentenced to five years probation. In June 2009, Paul took a plea deal, and he was sentenced to 60 years in prison. He'll be able to apply for parole in September 2038 at the age of 57. He confessed to taking part in Susan's murder. He said that he, Jennifer, and David swarmed Susan once she got to the top of the stairs. Jennifer also took a plea deal and she received a sentence of 60 years of prison. She claimed that Paul went nuts and killed her mother while she begged him to stop. She said that David wasn't involved in the murder at all. The physical evidence lines up with Paul's version of events. Finally, David also took a plea deal and he was given a 26 year sentence. He'll be able to apply for parole in 2021. Number 1. Sean Sellers Sean Sellers was born in May 1968 in California. His mother, Vonda, was just 16 years old when she gave birth to him. When Sean was a toddler, his father left him and his mother. When Sean was five, his mother married Leo Belafado, who was a trucker. Leo was the main father figure in Sean's life, and Sean called him dad. Vonda would often join Leo on his long hauls, and Sean would be left with different family members. Sean later claimed that his mother, grandfather, and an uncle all abused him. Throughout his childhood and his early teens, his mother and stepfather moved around constantly. Sean moved with them each time. Because of the constant moving, Sean never stayed in one school for very long and he found it difficult to make friends. When Sean was 15, his family was living in Greeley, Colorado and he was happy there. He was a member of the Civil Air Patrol and he was doing well in school. But then came the news that they were moving to a different state yet again. Since the age of five, Sean had moved 30 times. This time, they were moving to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. In Oklahoma City, Sean developed an interest in Satanism. Two aspects of Satanism were incredibly appealing to Sean. It promised freedom and control over his life. In his chaotic life, power and control were what the 15-year-old wanted most. Sean read the Satanic Bible several times, he performed Satanic rituals, and he even drank his own blood. He became friends with other people who were interested in Satanism, and they would drink each other's blood. One of these friends was Richard Howard, who was a year older than him. Sean and Richard talked to each other about dark fantasies that they had. Many times, Sean said that he wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. Now, on September 8, 1985, Sean and Richard decided that would be the night Sean killed someone. 
Originally, they planned on killing Richard's girlfriend's father, but then they changed their minds. Instead, they decided to kill Robert Paul Bauer, a 35-year-old man who worked the midnight shift at a nearby convenience store. Sean didn't know Bauer, but Richard did. In fact, he was mad at Bauer because he tried to buy beer from the store a week earlier and Bauer denied him because he was underage. Sean and Richard grabbed a 357 Magnum and a 44 caliber rifle from Richard's house, then they performed a satanic ritual in the yard. They drove to the store where Bauer was working and they hung around inside the store for a while. They asked Bauer about the store's security and if there were any cameras. Bauer, not realizing that the two teens were planning to kill him, answered their questions honestly. He told them there were no cameras in the store and there was only $50 in the cash register and he didn't think that anyone would hurt or kill him to get to the $50. After about an hour, Richard convinced Bauer to come out to his car to check out his clutch pedal. He had just installed it, and Bauer wanted to put a new clutch pedal into his own car. Sean followed them out to the car. As Richard and Bauer walked back to the store, Sean grabbed the Magnum out of the car and then started to walk behind them. When they got back inside the store, Bauer went behind the counter. Sean raised the gun, and Bauer saw the gun pointed at his head. Sean fired, and he missed. Bauer ran, and Sean chased him, and then suddenly, Bauer tripped. Sean shot at him again, and this time, Bauer was hit, but he wasn't killed. Bauer then got behind the counter. Sean saw the scared look in Bauer's eyes as he stuck his head above the counter. Sean pointed the magnum at his head and pulled the trigger a third time. It was a kill shot. 35-year-old Robert Paul Bauer died on the floor a few minutes later. The two teenage boys got into Richard's car and they drove away. As they drove to Richard's house, they laughed because they felt giddy. Once they got back to Richard's house, they put the guns back where they found them. Six months later, the investigation into Bauer's murder remained cold. Sean didn't keep it a secret that he was the killer. He bragged about committing the murder to several friends and co-workers. Unfortunately, none of them went to the police. Shortly after the murder, Sean started dating a 15-year-old high school dropout named Angel. Sean's mother, Fonda, hated Angel, and she did not want Sean to see her. Sean thought his mother didn't like Angel because she reminded her of herself when she was 15. When Vonda was 15, she became pregnant with Sean. The fighting between mother and son got worse, and it even got physical at one point. Then on March 4, 1986, about six months after the murder of Bauer, 16-year-old Sean decided that his mother and stepfather had to die. While they were awake and in a different room, he went into their bedroom and grabbed a 44 caliber pistol out of his stepfather's dresser. That evening, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Sean's stepfather, Leo, had talked to Sean about rebuilding the engine of Sean's pickup truck. After 32-year-old Vonda and 43-year-old Leo went to bed, Sean supposedly performed a satanic ritual in his bedroom. Then he went into his parents' bedroom, only wearing black underwear. He shot both of them once in the back of the head. He said that after he killed his mother and stepfather, he felt relieved. After shooting his parents, he had made it look like there had been a break-in. He then went to his friend Richard's house and told him what happened. Richard hid the gun for him and let him spend the rest of the night. The next morning, Sean went home and called the police. He told them there had been a break-in and his parents were dead. 
Two days later, Sean was interviewed by the police, and after talking to him, he was arrested for his parents' murder. Richard Howard was also arrested, and he led the police to the gun that killed Robert Bauer. Sean was charged with his murder as well. Richard was originally charged with first-degree murder, but those charges were dismissed. He agreed to testify against Sean in exchange for five years deferred for his roles in the murders. In September 1986, Sean went to trial for the three murders. Sean's lawyer argued that he was not guilty because he had been brainwashed by Satanism and the occult and he was addicted to Dungeons and Dragons and couldn't tell the difference between real life and make-believe. Sean didn't testify, but his lawyer said that he had no recollection of the murders. Sean was ultimately convicted of all three murders. Sean was 16 years old when he committed the murders, and he was 17 when he was convicted. Despite being a juvenile, Sean was sentenced to death. After Sean was sentenced to death, he did interviews with People Magazine and Oprah Winfrey, and in the interviews, he said he remembered the murders. He said that when he killed Bauer, his mother and stepfather, he wasn't himself. He said he was possessed by a demon named Ezeret, and Ezeret was responsible for the murders. After a few years on death row, Sean started a website that had journal entries about his day-to-day -day life on death row. He also posted a complete confession of his crimes. While he was on death row, Sean became a Christian. He also appealed his death sentence, saying he wasn't responsible for the murders because he suffered from multiple personality disorder. He claimed it was the other personality that performed the killings and not him but his appeals were denied. Anti-death penalty advocates fought to get Sean off death row. They argue that since he was 16 years old when he committed the three murders, he did not understand the full consequences of his actions. They also said that his transformation from a Satanist to a Christian showed that he was worthy of mercy. However, many people weren't convinced that Sean's conversion to Christianity was legitimate. They thought he found religion just to save himself from being executed. Sean eventually asked for clemency from the governor. On February 2, 1999, the governor denied his request. On February 5, 1999, at 12.17 a.m., Sean Sellers was pronounced dead. He was 29 years old. His last words before he was executed via lethal injection were lyrics from a Christian song. They were, Set my spirit free that I may praise thee. Set my spirit free that I might worship thee. Since 1976, there have been 22 people who have been executed for crimes that they committed when they were under the age of 18. Sean Sellers was one of those people. Number three, Philip Chisholm. In the fall of 2013, Colleen Ritzer was 24 years old. Ritzer was passionate about mathematics and she taught it at Danvers High School in Danvers, Massachusetts. Ritzer was a popular and dedicated teacher. In addition to teaching, she was also pursuing her master's degree. On the night of October 22, 2013, Ritzer did not come home. Around 11.20 p.m., she was reported missing. The police went to her school to search for her. In a second floor washroom, they found a large amount of blood. The police then searched the area around the school. In the woods behind the school, the police found the dead body of 24-year-old Colleen Ritzer. The police said her body had been posed sexually. 
She had been stabbed multiple times in the neck area. The pathologist would later determine she had been stabbed 16 times. She had also been sexually assaulted. The police noted that Ritzer was not the only person associated with Danvers High School who was reported missing that day. Earlier that afternoon, 14-year-old Phil Chisholm was reported missing when he didn't come home from school. Chisholm had just moved to Danvers from Clarksville, Tennessee with his mother who had recently gone through a vicious divorce. The police found Chisholm walking along the side of a highway about an hour after Ritzer's body was found. The police looked in his backpack and they found a play box cutter. They also found some of Ritzer's possessions. Chisholm was brought in for questioning and he confessed to killing Ritzer. He said that Ritzer had asked him and another student to stay after class that day. Chisholm claimed that he attacked Ritzer because she had said a trigger word to him. The other student who had been asked to stay behind said that Ritzer had asked Chisholm about the differences between Danvers and Clarksville. The other student said that Chisholm became visibly upset and Ritzer changed the subject. At some point, Ritzer left the classroom and went to a nearby washroom. Chisholm followed her into the washroom and he said he hit her with a karate chop and this knocked her out. He then dragged the box cutter across her throat but she didn't start bleeding. So he did it again and this time she started bleeding. Chisholm was asked if he sexually assaulted her and he said no. He claimed that the murder wasn't sexual. The police checked the school's CCTV footage and they found the following footage. Ritzer is seen walking in the hallway towards the washroom where the blood was later found. Chisholm steps out of the classroom and looks around. When he sees that no one is around, he pulls his hood up over his head and stalks towards the washroom. Then, just before he enters the woman's washroom, he puts on gloves. Nearly half an hour later, he exits the washroom wearing a mask and he's pulling a plastic garbage bin. Then Chisholm is later seen without the mask, pulling the garbage bin through the hallway. In the garbage bin was Richard's body. The police learned that Chisholm brought the box cutter, a change of clothes, the mask, and the gloves with him to school that day. Phil Chisholm was charged with murder the day after Ritzer was killed. Chisholm went to trial in November 2015 when he was 16 years old. Even though he was 14 when he committed the crime, he was tried as an adult. The prosecution argued that Chisholm knew precisely what he was doing that day. He brought the murder weapon with him along with the mask, the gloves, and a change of clothes. He followed her into the washroom, sexually assaulted her, and cut her throat. He then loaded her into the garbage bin and dragged the bin out to the woods. But Risser was not dead yet. After he got Ritzer out of the bin, he sexually assaulted her again and then stabbed her multiple times. Chisholm was found guilty of murder and two counts of sexual assault. In 2013, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled that people under the age of 18 could not be sentenced to life without parole. Chisholm was sentenced to life with a chance of parole after 25 years for the murder conviction. For the sexual assault convictions, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Colleen Ritzer's family criticized the sentencing and the ruling that minors could not be sentenced to life without parole. 
After Risser's senseless murder, her family set up a scholarship in her honor. To help fund the scholarship, they hold an annual 5K run and thousands of people participate. Philip Chisholm will first be able to apply for parole in 2053 when he is 54 years old. Number 2. Christopher Simmons and Charles Benjamin In September 1993, Shirley Crook was 46 years old. Shirley lived with her husband, Steve, in a mobile home just outside of Fenton, Missouri. Both Shirley and Steve worked as truckers. The couple had a son and a daughter who were both grown up and they had both moved out. On the night of September 9th, 1993, Steve was away from their home because he was working. He returned home the next day and found Shirley missing. The home was in disarray and Steve got the sense that Shirley didn't leave of her own volition. Steve called the police and reported Shirley missing. Shirley's description matched the description of a woman who was found dead hours earlier. Fishermen had found her body in the Merrimack River. Using fingerprints, the police determined that the body was 46-year-old Shirley Crook. Shirley had died a horrifying death. She was only wearing underwear and cowboy boots, and a towel was wrapped around her head. Under the towel, her head had been wrapped in duct tape so that her eyes and mouth were covered. Her wrists were bound behind her back with a dog leash and then her ankles were wrapped up in electrical tape. Then the dog leash and the electrical tape were tied together with a belt from a bathrobe. Shirley had suffered several broken ribs. It's believed that, while Shirley was alive and tied up, she was thrown off a railroad trestle that was 40 feet above the water. The pathologist determined she had drowned. Shirley's van was found parked in a mobile home park across the road from her home. The police interviewed people who lived in the area where the van was parked. One person said that they saw 17-year-old Christopher Simmons near the van. That afternoon, the police picked up Simmons at his high school. At first, Simmons denied having anything to do with the murder. But after 90 minutes of questioning, he confessed. He said that he and two friends, 15-year-old Charles Benjamin and 16-year-old John Tesmer, planned on robbing the crook's home. They met that night, but Tesmer backed out and went home. Sometime between 1.30 and 2.30 a.m., Simmons and Benjamin broke into the crook's home. Shirley woke up and saw them. Simmons and Shirley knew each other. They lived less than a mile from each other and they had previously been in a car accident. Simmons said to ensure she stayed quiet, they decided to kill her. They wrapped her mouth and eyes in duct tape and then they tied her up. They loaded her into her own van and drove out to the state park. Simmons parked the van and they got Shirley out. Her ankles were freed and then they got her to put on cowboy boots so she could walk. They forced her to walk to the trestle where they hogtied her. What exactly happened next is unclear. Either Simmons put Shirley into the water himself or he and Benjamin tossed her into the river. After they threw her into the river, they abandoned her van at the mobile home park. They stole all the money that Shirley had in her purse, which was six dollars. Hours later, Simmons and Benjamin went to school and acted like nothing happened. 
After Simmons confessed, 15-year-old Charles Benjamin was arrested as well. They were both charged with first-degree murder. Benjamin went to trial first. In May 1994, he was convicted of first-degree murder. The 16-year-old was sentenced to life without parole. Christopher Simmons went to trial in June 1994. One witness who went to school with Simmons testified that he had heard Simmons talking about planning to kill someone. The witness said specifically Simmons wanted to tie someone up and throw them into the river. The witness testified that Simmons said that he would get away with it because he was a minor. The same witness testified that the morning after the murder, Simmons joked that he and Benjamin had drowned a woman. Simmons said, bubble bubble, and then he laughed. Simmons' defense lawyer tried to show that Simmons was a good person who made a mistake. He pointed out that Simmons did not have a criminal record. Also, when Simmons was a child, he was physically and mentally abused by his stepfather. As a teenager, Simmons used drugs and drank hard liquor daily. A doctor testified that Simmons was mentally ill. But none of this helped his case. The jury deliberated for five hours and they found him guilty. They recommended the death penalty. In August 1994, a judge followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Simmons, who was 18 at the time, to death. Simmons appealed his sentence, citing ineffectual counsel. His appeal said that his age caused him to act impulsively and that should have been brought up at the sentencing hearing. His appeal made it to the Missouri Supreme Court. In August 2003, the Missouri Supreme Court ruled to vacate Simmons' death sentence because of his age. He was subsequently sentenced to life without parole. The state of Missouri appealed the decision to have Simmons' death sentence overturned to the United States Supreme Court. The case was argued on June 13, 2004. The hearing resulted in a landmark decision. In a 5-4 decision, which was released in March 2005, the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to execute someone who was 16 or 17 when they committed the crime. In 1888, the Supreme Court had already ruled that no one could be executed for a crime that they had committed when they were under the age of 16. Both Christopher Simmons and Charles Benjamin are still in prison. At the time of this video, Benjamin is 42 years old and he is serving his sentence at the Eastern Reception Diagnostic Correctional Center in Bon Terre, Missouri. Simmons, who is 43, is currently incarcerated at the Southeast Correctional Center in Charleston, Missouri. Number 1. Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoaf In the summer of 2012, Skylar Neese was 16 years old. She was an only child and she lived with her parents, Dave and Mary, in Star City, West Virginia. Her mother worked as an administrative assistant and her father was a product assembler at Walmart. Skylar was an honor student at school and she planned on going to university. She wanted to become a criminal lawyer. Besides attending school, Skylar also worked part-time at Wendy's. On July 6, 2012, Skylar went to work and then she returned to the apartment that she shared with her parents. Her parents went to work the next morning and Skylar's bedroom door was closed. 
That afternoon, her father returned home and found her bedroom door still closed and locked. He checked the outside of the apartment building and he found her bedroom window open. Her father could tell she had snuck out the night before. In her bedroom, he found her cell phone. To her father, this meant that she had only planned on going out on a short excursion and she had planned to return home. Skylar was reported missing, but the police thought that she ran away. So they did not do much in the way of investigating her disappearance. They did look at the CCTV footage from Skylar's apartment building. It shows Skylar climbing out of her bedroom window. She then goes across the road and gets into a sedan and then the car drives off. The police were able to determine that the car belonged to 16 year old Sheila Eddy. Just before she went missing, Skylar had been exchanging text messages with Eddy. Eddie attended the same high school as Skylar. They had been good friends in grade school, but in high school, they drifted apart. In high school, Eddie started to spend more time with a girl named Rachel Shove. Eddie was interviewed, and she said that Skylar came out with her and Rachel Shove, who was also 16. Eddie said that they drove around and smoked some marijuana. Eddie said she dropped Skylar off a short distance from her apartment a few hours later. Eddie said she didn't know what happened to Skylar. Rachel Schoff was also interviewed and she confirmed what Eddie had said. Several people thought that their story was odd. It appeared that on the two days before Skylar went missing, she was mad at her friends. In one tweet, she wrote, It really doesn't take much to be off. Another tweet reads, Sick of being at home. Thanks, friends. Love hanging out with you all, too. A tweet from the day before she went missing reads, You doing like that is why I can never completely trust you. Two months after Skylar went missing, the West Virginia State Police and the FBI got involved in the investigation. But in the first several months of their investigation, they could not locate Skylar and they didn't find out who may have been responsible for her disappearance. David and Mary Neese went through Christmas without knowing what happened to their only child. In the months after Skylar went missing, Rumors began swirling around her high school. The most predominant rumor was that on the night Skylar disappeared, she was hanging out with Sheila Eddy and Rachel Shove. They were doing drugs and Skylar overdosed. So that they wouldn't get in trouble, Eddie and Shove hit her body. Where Skylar overdosed somewhere isolated and the girls just left her there. While Skylar was missing, Sheila Eddy was active on Twitter. On the day after Skylar went missing, Eddy posted a tweet wishing another friend a happy birthday. Most of Eddy's tweets were mundane American teenage girl tweets. One thing that the FBI noted was that Skylar and Eddy were supposedly good friends, but Eddy rarely mentioned Skylar's disappearance in any of her tweets. Eddie did mention Rachel Shove quite a bit though. On November 5th, four months after Skylar went missing, Eddie tweeted, No one on this earth can handle me and Rachel. If you think you can, you're wrong. Just after Christmas, the FBI asked both Eddie and Shove to come in and take a polygraph exam. Eddie took the polygraph exam. Shove did not take the exam. As she was on her way to take the test, she had a mental breakdown. She ended up being hospitalized in a psychiatric facility for five days. 
On January 3, 2013, after Shof was released from the hospital, she went to the office of her attorney. In her lawyer's office, there was also an investigator with the West Virginia State Police and an FBI agent. Shof sat down for the polygraph exam and she was asked if Skyler had overdosed or choked to death. Shof answered no to both questions. Then Shof said, we stabbed her. Everyone in the room was shocked by the revelation. Shove explained that for months, she and Sheila Eddy had planned to kill Skylar. On June 10, 2012, they started to develop firm plans on how to do it and get away with it. Less than a month later, they put their plan into motion. Shove explained that she and Eddie had lured Skylar out of her home that night. They told her they were going to smoke some marijuana. They ended up just over the Pennsylvania state line near the small town of Brave. Eddie parked the car, all three girls got out, and they walked a few feet away from the car. Eddie tried to light the joint, but her lighter didn't work. Skylar said she had a lighter, but it was in the car. She turned and started to walk back to the car. Shove said she counted to three and then she and Eddie pulled out kitchen knives that Eddie had taken from her kitchen. Then they started stabbing Skylar. Skylar tried to fight them off. Skylar had managed to steal Shove's knife and she cut Shove on one of her legs. Shove showed the scar to her lawyer and the two investigators. Shove said that once Skylar stopped moving, she and Eddie stood over her and watched her die. Then they dragged her body down to a nearby creek. They had brought a shovel with them and they planned on burying the body. But the soil was too hard. So they covered Skylar's body with rocks, some dirt, and some brush. Then they went back to Eddie's car. They had brought handy wipes, paper towels, and a change of clothes with them. They both got out of their dirty clothes and wiped themselves off. Cho said that she and Eddie were high on adrenaline and they had sex. Then they put all the knives and bloody clothes into a garbage bag. Finally, they put on their clean clothes and drove away. Shove said that Eddie dropped her off at home and she went to bed. Shove said that Eddie got rid of the garbage bag with the bloody items. Shove was asked why they did it and she said they didn't like Skylar anymore. Shove also said that she and Eddie didn't want to be friends with Skylar anymore. After confessing, Skylar took the investigators to the area where Skylar's body was hidden. The area was covered in snow and Shove couldn't remember precisely where they hid Skylar's body. Because of the snow, the police couldn't properly search the area and excavate a body. They had to wait for the snow to melt a bit. While all this was going on, Sheila Eddy was carrying on with life. Five days after Shove confessed, Eddy tweeted, Staying home on Tuesday is the best because Law & Order SVU is on all day. On January 13, 2013, nearly two weeks after Rachel Shove confessed, the police went back to the area. Several minutes after the search began, the body of a teenage girl was found. Because of the level of decomposition, the remains could not be identified right away, but the police were sure that they had found the body of 16-year-old Skylar Niece. She had been missing for about six months. Just over two months later, on March 13th, 
the police announced that the remains of Skyler had been located. After the announcement, Sheila Eddy posted a tweet which reads, Worst day of my whole life. Less than half an hour later, she posted a tweet that features three photographs of her and Skyler. The tweet reads, Rest easy Skyler, you'll always be my best friend. I miss you more than you could ever know. A month later, Sheila Eddy was arrested and charged with murder. Just before Eddy was arrested, she tweeted, We really did go on three. This tweet alludes to the fact that she and Shelf attacked Skyler on the count of three. In January 2014, eight months after she was arrested, Sheila Eddy pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. She was given a life sentence. She'll be able to apply for parole after 15 years when she's 33 years old. Rachel Schoff agreed to a plea deal. She pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and in February 2014, she was sentenced to 30 years of prison. She'll be able to apply for parole in 2023, a month before she turns 27. Number 3. Nicholas Browning In early 2008, the Browning family lived in Cockeysville, Maryland, which is an upper-class suburb of Baltimore. Patriarch John Browning was a prominent and respected business lawyer. His wife, Tamara, was a homemaker. John and Tamara had three sons, Nicholas, Gregory, and Benjamin. They were all considered good boys, and they were well-liked at their schools and in their neighborhood. All three boys were active in organized sports, and John and Tamara were at many other sporting events, cheering them on. Nicholas, who was 15, spent the night of February 1st, 2008, at a friend's home. The next day, at around 5 p.m., his friend drove him home. A few minutes later, Nicholas came back outside and told his friend that his father was dead. Nicholas called 911 and he told the dispatcher that he thought that his father had died of a heart attack. When the first responders got inside the house, they were shocked by what they found. 45-year-old John Browning was dead on the couch on the main floor. It was clear he had not died from a heart attack. His body was covered in blood. The police searched the rest of the home. They found the dead bodies of 44-year-old Tamara, 13-year-old Gregory, and 11-year-old Benjamin. They had all been shot to death in their beds. The police determined that the family had been killed with a 9mm handgun. The house had been ransacked, but nothing appeared to be stolen. The police decided to interview the only surviving member of the Browning family, Nicholas. Nicholas was just a week shy of his 16th birthday. At first, Nicholas denied knowing anything about the murders. The investigators noted that Nicholas didn't seem upset or even seem to care that his entire family had been murdered. The police became even more suspicious of Nicholas when a key to the family's gun safe was found under his mattress. A 9mm handgun was missing from the safe. After several hours of questioning, Nicholas admitted to shooting his family. Why Nicholas killed his family is highly debated. Nicholas claimed that his father was an alcoholic who physically and emotionally abused him for years. He said that his mother was nothing more than an enabler who allowed the abuse to continue. But if that was the case, then why did he kill his brothers? Nicholas said that he killed them because he thought it would make the scenario of a robbery gone wrong more plausible. 
The district attorney contended that Nicholas killed his family in cold blood for the inheritance money. When Nicholas was being interviewed by the detectives, he talked about his parents' wealth. He also said that his parents were good to him, albeit a little strict. During the interrogation, Nicholas did not say he was abused, and he only talked about it afterward. Also, even if his parents did abuse him, that did not give him a reason to kill his 13-year-old and 11-year-old brothers. In October 2008, 16-year-old Nicholas Browning pleaded guilty to four counts of first-degree murder. In January 2009, he was given four life sentences. Two of the sentences are to run concurrently, and two are to be served consecutively. With good behavior, Nicholas may only have to spend 23 years in prison. Nicholas Browning is currently serving a sentence at the North Branch Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland. If nothing changes with his sentence, the earliest he can be released is 2031. He'll be 49 years old. Number 2. Joshua Jenkins George and Eileen Jenkins adopted their son, Joshua, in 1980 when he was a baby. They lived in Los Angeles, California. From the age of five, Joshua was enrolled in special classes because he had learning disabilities. He had dyslexia. He had also been diagnosed with ADHD. George and Eileen moved Joshua around to different schools to find one that would suit his needs. In 1993, George and Aileen moved the family from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, Nevada. At the time, Joshua was 12 and his sister, Megan, was seven. Like Joshua, Megan had been adopted. By all accounts, Joshua loved his sister and he was often protective of her. When Joshua was in the 8th grade, a school psychologist thought that his problems were much more severe than learning disabilities. The psychologist noted that Joshua spent much of his time alone. He also exhibited some bizarre behavior. For example, he would carry on conversations with aliens. Joshua said that one time he was watching TV and needles flew out of the TV it went into his arm. The psychologist thought that Joshua was showing symptoms of schizophrenia. George and Aileen decided to get a second opinion. The second doctor prescribed Joshua medication for ADHD. Unfortunately, the medication might have had an adverse effect if Joshua did have schizophrenia. As Joshua got older, his mental issues got worse. He became more volatile and violent. When Joshua was 14, he broke his father's arm with a baseball bat. Both George and Aileen told people that they were afraid of Joshua and they were worried about what he might be capable of doing. George and Aileen decided it was best to send Joshua to a boarding school for troubled use in Los Angeles. Joshua started at the boarding school in the summer of 1995 when he was about 15 years old. On February 2nd, 1996, George, Aileen, and Megan drove from Las Vegas to Los Angeles and picked up Joshua at the boarding school. Then they drove to Aileen's parents' home in Vista, California. The family was planning on staying at Eileen's parents' home for the weekend. In a few days, Joshua had a doctor's appointment and it was expected that he was going to be prescribed antipsychotic medication. At about 4 p.m. on the day after they arrived, the fire department was called to the home. The firefighters discovered that the fire had been started in the master bedroom. Inside the bedroom were five dead bodies. 
They were 50-year-old George Jenkins, his 48-year-old wife, Aileen, and their 10-year-old daughter, Megan. The other two bodies were Aileen's parents, 7-year-old Bill Grossman and 74-year-old Alan Grossman. They had all died violent deaths before the fire was started. The next morning, the mass murder was front page news in the area. The article about the murders contained a photograph of Joshua along with the car that he was most likely driving, which was his parents' Mercedes-Benz. A clerk at a convenience store in Vista saw the article. That same morning, Joshua came into his store. The clerk called the police and Joshua was arrested a few blocks from the store. Once in custody, 15-year-old Joshua gave a full confession. He said that he found a claw hammer among his grandfather's tools. He grabbed the hammer and he went to the room where his parents were sleeping. But he did not do anything. Instead, he went into the living room. At around midnight, Joshua heard his father heading to the washroom. Joshua surprised him in the washroom and struck him 18 times on the head with a hammer. The sounds of the attack woke up 48-year-old Eileen. There was a phone in the kitchen, but standing between her and the phone was her son, Joshua. Eileen made a dash for the kitchen, but Joshua jumped on her back and struck her a dozen times in the head with a hammer. 74-year-old Ellen Grossman heard her daughter being attacked, and this drew her out of her bedroom. Joshua struck her 14 times with a hammer. Joshua then moved on to his 78-year-old grandfather, William, who was getting out of bed. Joshua struck him 17 times in the head and the neck. At this point, none of his family members had died. Joshua went to the kitchen and got a knife. He went back to his father and slit his throat. He then stabbed him multiple times. He then went on to stab his three other family members multiple times. 10-year-old Megan awoke sometime during the murders. Joshua told her to lie down and cover her head with a pillow. After Joshua had finished killing his parents and grandparents, he moved all their bodies into his grandparents' bedroom. He then grabbed himself a root beer and sat down on the couch to watch some TV. He said he watched TV all night and then Megan woke up. Joshua told her that their grandmother was sick and the rest of the family was at the hospital with her. Together, they drove to a local hardware store and Joshua bought a large axe. Then they went back to their grandparents' home and continued to watch TV. Later that afternoon, Megan, who was 10, goes off on the couch while sitting up. Joshua said he got the axe and he swung it at her head like it was a baseball bat. He hit her with a blunt side of the axe head. Joshua said he hit her six more times and then stabbed her multiple times. He put her body in the bedroom with the rest of the bodies and then he started the fire. Joshua said that after he started the fire, he drove to a parking lot in Vista and fell asleep. He had planned on driving back to Las Vegas and killing himself in his family's garage. But he was arrested before he left Vista. Joshua Jenkins went to trial in May 1997, about 15 months after the murders. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The district attorney said that Joshua was emotionally disturbed, but he was not psychotic. He also said that the murder of Megan was much more disturbing than the story Joshua told the police. Joshua said he chose the axe because he thought that it would cause the least amount of pain. The district attorney said that the evidence showed that something much different happened. 
there were tiny cuts on Megan's neck. The prosecutor said that this was evidence that knife had been held up to Megan's throat. Also, the police searched Joshua's bedroom and they found two photographs that were hidden. They were both inappropriate photos of Megan that were taken while she was asleep. The district attorney said that Joshua held a knife to Megan's throat because he was trying to sexually assault her. But something went wrong and instead of hitting her with the axe, Joshua threw her against the corner of the fireplace several times and stabbed her nine times. Joshua's trial lasted for five weeks. The jury found Joshua Jenkins sane when he committed all the murders except for his father's murder who was the first person he killed during his rampage. The jury was deadlocked when it came to deciding if he was sane or not during that murder. In June 1996, Joshua, who was 15 at the time of the murders, was given 112 years of prison without the chance of parole. However, on Joshua's public prison record, it said the earliest he could have applied for parole was February 2020. The records indicate he chose to waive his right to a parole hearing for a year. He'll apparently have his next hearing in July 2021. At the time of this video, Joshua Jenkins is 40 years old and he's incarcerated at the Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California. Number 1. William Lemke At the end of 2000, William Lemke was 16 years old. He lived with his family in a wooded area in Stevens County, Washington. Their home was about 60 miles from Spokane. William's 49-year-old father, Robert, was a logger. His mother, 43-year-old Diana, had multiple sclerosis and she did not leave the house often. William had an older sister, Jolene, who was 18, and a younger brother, 13-year-old Wesley. William was a bright kid and he got good grades in school. But he was also a troublemaker. For example, he got in trouble for hacking into one of his teacher's computers. In the autumn of 2000, William spent two months in a juvenile detention center. He had broken into a neighbor's home and stole some coins and a silver bar. Around Christmas 2000, no one saw or heard from the family except for 16-year-old William. William told people who called and stopped in at the house that the rest of his family had gone to California to visit a sick uncle. But several people thought his story was odd. Notably, all their vehicles were still in the driveway. Also, people who stopped by the house noticed that their purses and wallets were still there. On December 29, 2000, a family member got in contact with the police and asked them to do a welfare check. Officers went to the family's home. They noticed that there were several blood splatters throughout the house. The officers confronted William and demanded to know what happened to his family. William started shaking and crying. He confessed they killed his family and dumped their bodies two miles away in a ditch. William was brought to the police station and he told the detectives what happened. He said that on the night of December 23rd, he got into an argument with his 49-year-old father, Robert. William said that his father got angry at him for not getting firewood and he threatened to kick him out of the house. When Robert got into the shower that night, William picked up two rifles. After Robert showered, he was in the hallway of his house. William walked up behind his father and aimed his rifle less than a few inches from the back of his head. He then pulled the trigger. William shot his father twice more with the rifle. William went into the kitchen 
and he opened fire on his 43-year-old mother, Diana. At some point, his rifle jammed, so he switched to the other rifle. His mother was shot four times in the hands, right arm, and right shoulder, and three times in the head. It's believed that she put up her hands to try to shield herself. William then went into the living room, where he found his 18-year-old sister, Jolene, and his 13-year-old brother, Wesley, were both trying to hide. William shot Jolene twice in the back and once in the back of the head. He then shot his brother twice in the back of the head at close range. William then admitted that after he killed his family, he sexually molested his sister's body. He then dumped their bodies in the ditch. William then went home and tried to cover up the crime scene by painting over any blood he found splattered on the walls. 16-year-old William Lemke was subsequently charged with four counts of first-degree murder. William went to trial in August 2001, about eight months after the murders. His lawyers argued that there was no premeditation. William had simply snapped because of the fight over the firewood. William's lawyer argued that since there was no planning, he should only be found guilty of second-degree murder, which carried a less severe sentence. The prosecution argued that the motive for the murders was much more disturbing. There was evidence that William had secretly been recording his sister, Jolene, as she showered. On the same videotape, he recorded himself masturbating. The prosecution said that William's parents either found the tape or they learned that William had been recording Jolene. The prosecution said that on the night of the murders, William was confronted by his parents. They may have even threatened to send him away. In response, William wiped out his family. The medical examiner found evidence that Jolene had sex sometime around her death. However, the DNA found inside of her was too badly compromised to make a DNA profile. The prosecution asserted that since William confessed to molesting his sister, it was most likely his DNA. That evidence also made it clear that he did more than molest her body. He actually had sex with her dead body. William's trial lasted for a week. The jury deliberated for an hour and a half. During that time, they broke for lunch. They ended up finding William Lemke guilty on all four counts of first-degree murder. William was sentenced on the same day he was found guilty. The judge said that deep down inside, William was a monster. Since he was a monster, he felt no problem sentencing the 16-year-old to life in prison without the chance of parole. William Lemke is 35 years old at the time of this video. He is serving his sentence at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We hope you found it interesting. If you're looking for some new videos to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark, and see if you can solve the mysteries in the videos. If you like riddles, puzzles, or escape rooms, Chapter Dark will be right up your alley. A link to Chapter Dark should appear on the screen momentarily, and you can also find a link in the description box below this video. If you enjoyed the video you just watched, we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a thumbs up. Please also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Roku. The links are in the description box. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching and please stay safe. Most parents believe that their children are miracles and often 
When their children are born, it gives their lives new meaning. When a parent holds their child for the first time, it's awe-inspiring. The parents in these videos probably never suspected that their wonderful children could be capable of the violence they would later unleash. If you haven't watched the first video in this series, we'll have a link to it at the end of this video. But before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a role-playing game that's done right. Raid is an epic game with amazing artwork and over 500 heroes that you can build and customize. But Raid is also easy to get into and fun to play. It's also free to play on both your mobile device and your PC. You can download the game by clicking on the links in the description box below this video. Raid has a bunch of different game modes to play, so you're bound to find one you love. They have a player versus player arena that's a ton of fun, and you get a lot of great rewards that help you level up your heroes. Personally, I really enjoy the dungeon battles. In this mode, your team takes on giant bosses that are really intense. Raid's also fantastic because they're always coming out with new features. They just released the Artifact Forge, which allows you to craft artifacts directly. They also just introduced the Advanced Quest System, where players can win some amazing rewards. They've recently released some new champions, and they look awesome. Currently, they are working on the Doom Tower, which looks amazing. I'm super excited for it. With so many updates and so many exciting things coming up, there's never been a better time to start playing Raid Shadow Legends. Go to the video description, click on the special links, and if you're a new player, you'll get 100,000 silver, 50 gems, 50 mystery shards, and one free champion, Hexweaver. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. If you need some advice, you are not alone. Subscribe to the guide on the Teleria world to find out the whole truth about Raid Shadow Legends. The link is in the description. Good luck, and I'll see you there. Number 3. Clay Shroud Union, Kentucky is a small town close to the Ohio border. In spring 1994, the population of the city was about 1,200 people. It was home to the Shroud family, who lived in an upscale neighborhood. They had moved into their home in 1987. Walter and Becky Shroud had met in university, and they got married after they graduated. They went on to have three children, Clay, Kristen, and Lauren. In the spring of 1994, Clay was 17, Kristen was 14, and Lauren was 12. Before Becky became a homemaker, she was a school teacher. She had recently returned to school to get her master's in education. Walter was an executive at a computer paper company. The family attended church regularly. Walter was a church elder and Becky taught Sunday school. Becky was also a member of the PTA. Clay, Kristen, and Lauren were considered bright children, and they were all honor students. Both Kristen and Lauren were involved in gymnastics, and they rode and showed horses. Clay had a part-time job at a fast food restaurant. He was a smart kid who had excellent marks in trigonometry and physics. He was also considered a whiz when it came to computers. Many people thought that Clay had a bright future ahead of him. Clay was also a bit of an outsider. He often wore a black trench coat and black combat boots. For most of his life, Clay seemed to hate violence and guns. But starting sometime in 1993, he supposedly became fascinated with gore and death. He started collecting knives and brass knuckles, and he started making pipe bombs. At the end of 1993, Clay's girlfriend broke up with him, and he was devastated. Clay started smoking marijuana and using LSD. In mid-May 1994, 
Clay suddenly quit his job at the fast food restaurant in the middle of his shift. On May 22, 1994, Clay got into trouble because he brought a stun gun and bullets to his school, Ryle High School. The school ordered him to serve 50 hours of community service. His parents grounded him from driving, talking on the phone, and he wasn't allowed to listen to his CDs. Clay liked heavy metal and alternative bands. On the night of May 24, 1994, Walter and Becky went to Ryle High School to watch Lauren play in a student concert. She played the xylophone. That night, 17-year-old Clay set his alarm clock to go off at 5 a.m., and then he went to sleep. When the alarm went off the next morning, he got out of bed. He went out to his father's Jeep and grabbed a 380 Mustang pistol, which his father kept in the vehicle. He then went into his parents' bedroom, where his parents were still sleeping. He shot his 44-year-old mother first, and then his 43-year-old father. Clay then went into the bedroom of his 14-year-old sister, Kristen. The gunshots had awoken her, and she was sitting on the edge of the bed. Clay told her he had accidentally stepped on a gun, which caused it to fire. Kristen then started to lecture him about gun safety. That's when Clay shot her. Clay started walking towards his sister Lauren's bedroom. To get to her bedroom, he had to walk past his parents' bedroom. When he got to the doorway of their bedroom, he saw that his father wasn't dead. He was dragging himself towards the bedroom door. So Clay shot him twice more. Clay then went into the bedroom of his youngest sister, 12-year-old Lauren. Lauren was awake, and she told Clay about a nice dream she had just woken up from. Clay shot her to death as well. Clay then went and got his father's cell phone. At about 6 a.m., he called his best friend. Clay then went through a detailed confession about what he did to his family. They talked for about 45 minutes. He told his friend he killed his parents because he was going to steal from them and disappear. He said he had to kill his sisters because he was worried they would wake up and call the police and he would be arrested. But sometime that morning, Clay decided he wasn't going to flee. Two weeks earlier, Clay had gone to prom. His date was his friend, 15-year-old Danielle Butch. After Clay talked to his best friend, he drove over to Danielle's home. As she was walking out of her home, Clay walked up to her and grabbed her by the arm. He pulled out the gun and told her to come with him. Clay drove Danielle to their high school. Clay then led Danielle into his first period class, which was trigonometry. He had her sit at a desk. He told the teacher that a student had a gun and he was holding a class hostage. He told her to lock the door. After the door was locked, Clay pulled out his gun, but he didn't point it at anyone. He told his classmates to continue doing their work. He said he was just going to sit at the teacher's desk for a while. Clay said to his teacher, I've had a really bad day. I just killed my family. There was a knock at the door, and Clay let his teacher answer the door. It was a student who wanted the teacher to sign a piece of paper. The teacher mouthed to the student that a student had a gun. The student then went to the school's main office, and the sheriff's department was called. A vice principal went to the classroom and asked Clay to step out into the hallway. Clay said he didn't want to. The vice principal asked if he came into the classroom 
Could the teacher and the students leave? Clay agreed to that, and the vice principal stepped into the classroom. The teacher and the students quickly got out of the room. A sheriff's deputy arrived at the school shortly after the teacher and the students got out of the classroom. Clay saw the deputy in the hallway draw his gun, and he immediately surrendered his weapon to the vice principal. 17-year-old Clay Shrout was quickly arrested. Sheriff's deputies went to his home, and they found the bodies of his family. In September 1994, five months after the murders, Clay made a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. He pleaded guilty, but mentally ill. He was sentenced to life with a chance of parole after 25 years. This made him eligible for parole in March 2019. Clay was a problematic prisoner. Between 1995 and 2005, he had incurred 29 pages of infractions. The most serious of these infractions was that he had a shank in his cell. He applied for parole when he was first eligible. Clay's parole was denied. He'll be able to apply for parole again in May 2029. At the time of this video, Clay Shrout is 43 years old and he is serving his sentence at the Kentucky State Penitentiary in Eddyville, Kentucky. Number 2. Cody Posey In 2001, legendary reporter and news anchor Sam Donaldson was looking for a foreman to run his ranch near Honcho, New Mexico. He ended up hiring Delbert Posey, who went by the name Paul. Paul moved onto the ranch with his family. Paul was married to his third wife, Tryon Posey. Living with them was 11-year-old Cody, Paul's son from his first marriage, 11-year-old Marley Schmidt, who was Tryon's daughter. For three years, the family lived and worked on the ranch. Donaldson liked the family. He thought that they were hardworking and polite. On Independence Day 2004, Donaldson called the ranch. 14-year-old Cody answered the phone. Donaldson told Cody he was going out of town for the holiday, but he would be back the next afternoon. Donaldson knows nothing amiss with Cody. Donaldson returned to the ranch on the evening of July 5th with his wife and his parents-in-law. They went and checked out the horses. They did not see the Posey family. After a short visit with the horses, they left the ranch. The next day, Donaldson returned to the ranch. Once again, it appeared that no one was around. He went to the house where the Posey family lived. He saw some congealed blood on the porch. He went inside and found some more dried blood on the floor of the kitchen. He looked around the house to see if the Poseys were there, but he didn't find them. Donaldson called the sheriff's department. Donaldson had been corresponded during the Vietnam War, and he knew that someone couldn't lose that much blood without being in serious trouble. A sheriff's department searched the property and found a backhoe. On the bucket of the backhoe, there appeared to be blood. The deputy followed the tracks of the backhoe. It led to a pile of manure. He noticed a smell that was more powerful than the manure. Using a stick, he moved some of the manure and he found a human arm. The sheriff's department secured the proper warrants and they returned to the ranch the next morning. They removed the manure and found three bodies piled on top of each other. On top was 34-year-old Paul Posey Beneath his body was the body of his 13-year-old stepdaughter, Marley, 
and on the bottom was 44-year-old Tyrone. Paul had been shot once above the right eye. Tyrone had been shot twice on the right side of the head. Marley, like her mother, had been shot twice in the head. The sheriff's deputies tracked down 14-year-old Cody Posey. He was staying at a friend's home. Cody explained that he had been staying at his friend's home since the morning of July 5th after he got into an argument with his father. His father had given him a hard time about not cleaning out the horse stalls fast enough. Cody said he had not talked to his family since he left home. He had called the ranch, but no one answered the phone. The deputies took some photos of Cody, including some without his shirt on. On his left shoulder, the officers noticed a burn mark. They asked him how he got the burn mark, and he said that a few days ago, he was welding on the ranch. He said he accidentally bumped against some hot metal and burned himself. Cody was then brought to the sheriff's department. After a few minutes of being interrogated, Cody said he was tired of being abused by his father, so he decided to kill him. Cody explained that on the evening of July 4th, his father summoned him to the master bedroom. His father was only wearing underwear and his stepmother was naked in the bed. Cody claimed that his father ordered him to have sex with his stepmother. Cody said that if he didn't, his father was going to burn him with a hot welding rod. Cody said that his father held a welding torch and he was heating up the rod as he ordered him to have sex with his stepmother. Cody refused to get into bed with his stepmother, so his father burned him. Then Cody ran away from the ranch. But he returned a short time later. The next morning, Cody was cleaning out the horse stalls. His father told him he was doing it too slowly. They started arguing, and his father slapped him. Cody said that after he was slapped, something in his mind snapped. Marley kept a 38 caliber pistol in her saddlebag. She had the gun in case she came across a snake while she was riding her horse. Cody went into the house and found Tryone reading on the couch. He shot her twice in the head. He killed her first because he didn't want her calling the police. His father, Paul, then entered the house and Cody shot him once in the head. Right behind him was Marley. He shot her once in the head. Then, as she was lying on the ground, he shot her again to make sure she was dead. Cody said he killed Marley because he didn't want her to turn him in to the police. Cody said he tried to bury the bodies, but the ground was too hard. So he buried them under the manure. After this was done, he threw the gun into a river near the ranch. The sheriff's deputies were able to retrieve the gun from the river. The sheriff's department looked around the property and two things were notably absent. They did not find a welding torch or a welding rod. The sheriff's department examined Paul's computer and they found pornographic videos that portrayed scenes of incest. Specifically, it was fathers with daughters and mothers with sons. The police investigated Cody's background. After Cody's parents divorced in January 1992, Cody lived with his father. His father got remarried just over a year after the divorce. Paul's second wife said that Paul had a violent temper and he abused Cody. She thought that Paul didn't like Cody. When Cody was in the fourth grade, he went to his mother's home for the weekend. 
His mother was horrified to see that he had bruises on his buttocks and his back. She took him to the hospital and she reported the abuse to the police. But the police never investigated the allegations. In 1996, Paul started having an affair with Tryon Schmidt, who was also married. Paul and Tryon ended things with their respective spouses and they got married in 1997. Paul's second wife started dating and eventually married Tryon's ex-husband. According to several people, Tryon flat out hated Cody. When Tryon talked to other mothers at the school where Marley and Cody attended, she would call Cody names and say mean things about him, such as calling him stupid and worthless. When Cody was 10 years old, he went to live with his mother and her new husband. Tragically, a few months after moving in with them, Cody, his mother, and his stepfather were in a single vehicle accident. His mother was thrown from the pickup truck and she was killed. So Cody went back to live with his father. In high school, several of Cody's fellow students noticed that he would have unexplained bruises. Cody also mentioned to several of his friends that he hated his parents and his parents hated him. Several people who worked with the Posies on different ranches also said that Paul was physically and verbally abusive to Cody. However, other people, like Paul's extended family, saw no signs of abuse and they thought that Paul and Tryon were good parents. Cody Posey went to trial in January 2006 for the murders of his father, stepmother, and stepsister. The prosecutor said that Cody was a cold-blooded killer who decided that the world would be better off without his family. The defense argued that Cody snapped after years of abuse. The prosecution had witnesses who testified that Cody wasn't abused. The defense had witnesses who claimed Cody was abused physically and verbally by his father and stepmother. The defense said that after years of abuse, his father demanding that he have sex with his stepmother was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Four psychiatrists testified and they said that Cody had all the signs of a child who suffered abuse. Something else that was entered into evidence was the pornography that was found on Paul's computer. But this was a point of contention. The prosecution argued that it was Cody who downloaded the videos. While the defense said that the videos were downloaded by Paul, which they said backed up Cody's statement that his father tried to force him to have sex with his stepmother. Cody testified on his own behalf he talked about the abuse he experienced at the hands of his father and stepmother. The trial lasted for three weeks. The jury deliberated for 12 hours over two days. Cody was found guilty on different counts for each murder. For the murder of his stepsister, he was found guilty of first degree murder. For the murder of his stepmother, he was found guilty of second-degree murder. Finally, he was found guilty of manslaughter in the death of his father. Seven members of the jury asked for Cody, who was 14 at the time of the murders, to be sentenced as a juvenile. This would allow Cody to be released at the age of 21. The prosecution argued that Cody could not be rehabilitated and he would be a danger if he was released. They wanted him to be sentenced as an adult so he would serve 50 years of prison. Cody ended up being sentenced as a juvenile. He could have been released on parole within 40 days of being sentenced. Instead, Cody was released on October 10, 2010 the day after he turned 21. Including the time Cody spent in jail before his trial, he was incarcerated a little more than six years for the triple murder. 
Since being released, Cody Posey has stayed out of the news. His current whereabouts are unknown. At the time of this recording, Cody Posey is 31 years old. Number 1. Peter Zimmer In late 2009, school teacher Candy Williams was on a beach in St. Petersburg, Florida. Williams had recently moved to the area. She was looking to start a new life there after several family members had died. That day on the beach, she met a 37-year-old man named Joe Van Collier. Collier was a construction supervisor and he had also recently moved to St. Petersburg. Collier told Williams that he had also suffered quite a bit of loss in his lifetime. He said that when he was young, his parents were killed when their car was struck by a drunk driver. Williams and Collier started dating and the relationship progressed fast. After three months, Collier moved in with Williams. They also talked about getting married. Collier told Williams he had previously been married and he had a son with that woman. They lived in Indiana. Collier would fly out to Indiana every so often and stay for the weekend. Then Williams found out something shocking about Collier. It turned out that Collier and his wife were still married and he was trying to reconcile with his wife. So Williams broke off the relationship. But Collier was a smooth talker and he convinced Williams to take him back. After they got back together, Collier revealed he had another secret. He had been married once before and he had a daughter who was 21. His daughter lived in Wisconsin. Collier had been absent from his daughter's life for the past six years and he was trying to reconnect with her. Around the same time, Collier told Williams he had been talking to his mother. Williams was shocked by this admission because one of the first things that Collier told her was that his parents died in a car accident when he was young. Collier clarified that his adopted parents were killed in a car accident. He had been adopted when he was an infant. Collier said that his adopted parents always told him bad things about his mother, like she was trailer trash and a whore. It turned out that his birth mother, Linda Zavorsky, had gotten pregnant when she was 18 and unwed. Savorsky's family was Catholic and her mother was furious she had gone pregnant. Savorsky was forced to live in a Catholic group home in Chicago, Illinois while she was pregnant. Then she gave up the baby for adoption hours after he was born. She only got to hold him twice before the nuns took him away. In 2004, Savorsky was a real estate agent in Atlanta, Georgia. She was married to her third husband, who was a plastic surgeon. In spring 2004, she learned that Illinois had changed their adoption laws, making it easier for people to find their birth parents. In June 2004, Savorsky filled out a form that would allow her son to contact her. About a year later, she got a call from Joe Van Collier and he said that he thought he was her son. They started exchanging emails. They met for the first time in the summer of 2005. A DNA test would later confirm that they were mother and son. At first, Savorsky and Collier got along great. She introduced her long-lost son to her friends and family. Collier even went to his maternal grandmother's 80th birthday. In the spring of 2008, Collier moved in with Savorsky and her husband because he got a job as a project manager in Atlanta. But after a few months of living with his birth mother and her husband, Collier suddenly moved out and stopped talking to them. Collier was still dating Williams and she asked why they had stopped talking. 
Collier told Williams that Savorsky had badmouthed her and he was not going to put up with that. In August 2008, Collier lost his job in Atlanta and he moved back in with Williams, who was still living in St. Petersburg. After he moved in, Williams noticed that he was spending a lot of time on the computer. It turned out that he had profiles on two dating websites. Williams broke it off with Collier for good in May 2009, and he moved out. Shortly after he moved out, Collier bombarded Williams with hundreds of emails and Facebook messages. Sometimes they would be from Collier's email address and Facebook account. Other times they were from fake email addresses and Facebook accounts that he had created. The emails and the messages from the fake accounts talked about how great Collier was and that Williams should take him back. After about a month of harassment, Williams got several emails that said that Collier had died by suicide. Attached to one of the emails was a photo of what looked like a man hanging by the neck at a construction site. She replied to these emails, but she did not get any responses. Williams wasn't sure if Collier was alive, so she decided to call his mother. Savorsky's husband answered the phone. Williams asked him if he knew if Collier had died. He said he didn't think so, but he wasn't sure. They said that they had not talked to Collier for about a year after they learned about the murders. That caught Williams by surprise. It turned out that Joe Van Collier had been hiding his darkest secret. In 1968, Hans and Sally Zimmer, who lived in the Chicago area, adopted a baby boy whom they named Peter. Four years later, they adopted another boy whom they named Perry. The family lived in Wakanda, Illinois until 1983. In April 1983, they moved to Mineral Point, Wisconsin. About a month after they moved to Mineral Point, on May 24, 1983, the Sheriff's Department received a phone call. The caller was a high school counselor who lived in Wakanda. He told the Sheriff's Department that a young man planned on killing his family and then running away. He gave the Sheriff's Department the address of the family. Deputies went to the home and they made a horrifying discovery. On the back porch, they found the dead body of 48-year-old Hans Zimmer. He had been shot five times. Then they found the body of 44-year-old Sally Zimmer in a shed. She had been stabbed at least 15 times and then her body was dragged into the shed. In an upstairs bedroom, they found the dead body of 10-year-old Perry Zimmer. He had been stabbed 25 times. The Sheriff's Department started an immediate search for 14-year-old Peter Zimmer. Later that same day, a motel clerk in Kansas City, Missouri called the police. He became suspicious of a young man checking into the motel with a credit card that belonged to Hans Zimmer. The police arrested the young man and identified him as 14-year-old Peter Zimmer. He was charged with the murders of his adopted parents and brother. Authorities wanted Peter to be tried as an adult. But because of the laws regarding prosecution of minors in Wisconsin, Peter could only be tried as a juvenile. In July 1983, about two months after the murders, he pleaded no contest. The judge did not find him guilty. Instead, Peter was found delinquent. This distinction between guilty and delinquent would play a significant role in court matters a few years later. Peter was ordered to stay in a juvenile detention center until his 19th birthday. He was sent to the Ethan Allen School for Boys, which was a reform school in Delafield, Wisconsin. 
During Peter's time there, he turned down all psychological treatment. While Peter was incarcerated, he changed his name to Joe Van Collier. He also tried to get the inheritance from his family's estate. The estate was estimated to be $370,000 in 1987, which, accounting for inflation, is about $846,000 in 2020. Collier's argument was that he was entitled to the money because he was never found guilty of the murders. Instead, he was found delinquent. Collier ended up selling out of court for an undisclosed amount. He was released from Ethan Allen on July 2nd, 1987, a few days after he turned 19. For the three murders, he spent just over four years at the reform school. After he was released, he moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Since he was a juvenile, he had a clean record. Collier got work in construction, and eventually, he started several of his own construction companies. He got married, and his wife gave birth to a daughter within a year of his release. They got divorced in 1993. In 1994, he married his second wife, and she had a son. Then in late 2005, Collier started dating Candy Williams. After Williams found out about her ex-boyfriend's past, she became extremely alarmed. She purchased a gun and got a restraining order against him. In June 2009, Collier was arrested for violating the restraining order. He posted bail and then he vanished. Then the stalking got more intense. He started sending Williams things in the mail. This included sex toys, flowers, and a dead piglet. He also created profiles on sex websites posing as Williams. He posted her real name and address. Several men ended up going to her home. The police searched for Collier, but they couldn't find him. They asked the U.S. Marshal Service for assistance in October 2009. Three days later, 41-year-old Jovan Collier was arrested in a hotel room in Savannah, Georgia. Collier pleaded guilty to aggravated stalking, and in May 2010, he was sentenced to three and a half years of prison. He was released in October 2012. He supposedly moved to San Diego, California after he was released. The last news report about him said he was living in Escondido, California. Jove Collier is 52 years old at the time of this video. Collier has never talked about the murder of his adopted family. The motive as to why he killed them is a mystery to this day. Number 3. Earl Gibson Denson In early March 1971, Earl Gibson Denson of Colorado Springs, Colorado was 31 years old. He had two sons and a daughter. He had been employed as a mechanic. Unfortunately, in early March 1971, he was going through some tough times. He and his wife had split up. He had lost his job and his car had been repossessed. Things got to be so bad that Denson wanted to end his life. So he asked his son, 8-year-old Earl Eugene Denson, to stab him with a butcher knife. His son refused to do it. Then Denson picked up his gun, a 38 caliber revolver, and stood on his bed. He unscrewed the light bulb from the socket. He cocked the revolver and he handed it to his son. For reasons that were never made clear, Benson stuck one of his fingers into the light socket. He then ordered his eight-year-old son to shoot him. Earl Jr. did as he was told and he fired a bullet into his 31-year-old father. Benson fell onto the bed. 
He told his son to keep what just happened a secret. He also said that God would return him to life after three days. He then asked his son for a glass of water. Earl Jr. got his father a glass of water and put a blanket over him. Earl Jr. then went to sleep on a couch. The next morning, the boy's grandmother came into the home. She found her grandson sleeping on the couch and her son dead in the bed. The police took Earl Jr. into protective custody after the body was found. After talking to him, they realized he had no understanding of what he had done. He had only shot his father because his father had told him to do it. So they released the eight-year-old boy into his mother's custody and he was never charged in connection with his father's death. Number 2. Hilma Marie Witt Beverly Shores is a small town in northwest Indiana. It is situated on the banks of Lake Michigan. In 1981, the population of the town was about 850 people. 44-year-old Paul Witt lived in Beverly Shores with his wife of 18 years, Hilma, who went by the name Marie, and their two sons, 15-year-old Eric and 12-year-old John. For 23 years, Paul worked as a millwright. He was also a volunteer firefighter. On the night of September 1st, 1981, one of Paul's sons called 911. Paul had been shot in the head and he was dead. Eric said that his father had been sleeping on the couch, but he wanted to ask him a question about a gun. He claimed that he tripped over a rug and the gun accidentally went off. Paul's death was ruled an accident and the case was closed. After Paul's death, Marie, John and Eric moved in with Paul's stepmother, 71 year old Elaine Witt. She lived just outside of Michigan City, Indiana. Nearly three years later, in November 1984, Marie, John, and Eric were arrested in California. They were arrested after trying to cash one of Elaine's social security checks. The police investigated the situation and they learned that no one had seen 74-year-old Elaine Witt in 11 months. The police questioned 15-year-old John about the whereabouts of his step-grandmother. John said that on January 4th, 1984, Elaine was sleeping in her bed. John, who was 14 at the time, shot Elaine once in the chest with a high-power crossbow. John told the investigators they killed his step-grandmother because his mother had ordered him to murder her. It turned out that Elaine found out that Marie had been siphoning money from her bank account. Marie had convinced John that if he killed Elaine, their money troubles would be over. They could take the money from her savings account and keep cashing her social security checks. Marie told John that he could either strangle her or shoot her with his crossbow. He was allowed to decide that for himself. Marie was not at home when the murder happened. After Elaine was dead, the family set to work dismembering her body in a closet. They used knives, a circular saw, chisels, and a chainsaw. They put the pieces in a chest freezer. They tried various ways of disposing of the remains, including putting in a trash compactor and trying to dissolve it with acid. They also used a microwave and a deep fryer. The family spent about four months dismembering and trying to dispose of the body. Eventually, they discarded the body parts throughout Indiana and Illinois. When they moved to California, they brought the freezer with them and threw out the rest of the remains. John also told the police that his father's death was not an accident. 
He said he knew it wasn't an accident because he had witnessed it. He had watched his brother Eric, who was 15 at the time, shoot their father in the head as he was sleeping on the couch. John explained that the experience with their father's death led them to dispose of Elaine's body. They disposed of Elaine's body because they did not want to endure another police investigation. The police then questioned Eric about his father's death and he confirmed that he intentionally shot his father in the head while he was asleep. Eric said he killed his father because his mother had forced him to do it. Eric said he initially refused to kill his father. His mother, Marie, told him he had to do it or she was going to kill herself. She told him that he could either shoot his father or beat him to death with a hammer. She told Eric they had to do it because he wouldn't get in as much trouble if he got caught because he was a juvenile. Marie told Eric that she was going out and while she was gone, he had to kill his father. While Marie was out, she called Eric and told him she wasn't coming home until he had killed his father. So Eric shot his father in the head while he was sleeping on the couch. The family claims that Paul was killed because he was abusive. It turned out that Marie and her mother, Margaret O'Donnell, had tried to kill Paul in the month before he was shot. They had laced his food with rat poison and Valium. Marie thought that Paul was allergic to Valium. O'Donnell also helped dispose of Elaine's remains and cleaned up the crime scene. None of Elaine's remains have ever been found. Marie, Eric, and John Witt were all charged with murder. Marie's mother was charged with attempted murder. For the two murder charges, Marie had two trials, which both happened in the fall of 1998. Her sons and her mother testified against her at the trials. Marie Witt was found guilty on all counts and she was sentenced to 140 years in prison. She appealed and her sentence was reduced to 90 years. She is currently incarcerated at the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. Her earliest possible release date is April 15, 2027. Maria's mother, Margaret O'Donnell, made a plea deal and she was sentenced to six years of prison in March 1986. Marie's sons, Eric and John, were both sentenced to 20 years of prison for their roles in the murders. They were both released in 1996 after serving about 11 years of prison and they have not had any trouble with the law since being discharged. Number 1. David Brown In March 1985, 32-year-old David Brown lived in Golden Grove, California. Brown owned his own computer business that recovered data from damaged computer systems. His business was successful and he claimed to be a multi-millionaire. In that spring of 1985, his living situation was a bit complicated. He lived with his 23-year-old wife, Linda Marie Brown, and their 8-month-old daughter. David's 14-year-old daughter from a previous marriage, Cinnamon, lived with them as well. Linda's 17-year-old sister, Patty Bailey, lived with them as well. Patty had lived with them for the past five years. When David and Linda met in the late 1970s, Linda was living with her mother and her 10 siblings. David lived next door to them and he claimed he had cancer. He asked his neighbor if her daughters could come over and help him do chores and he would pay them. The neighbor readily agreed. Eventually, David and Linda's relationship turned sexual. David later announced that he had been cured of cancer. 
David and Linda got married in early 1979 when Linda was just 17 years old. The marriage lasted a month and then they got divorced. David married again soon afterward. This was David's fifth wife. But that marriage only lasted a few months and then they filed for divorce. After his divorce, David went back to Linda. Not long afterward, David got married for the sixth time to his fourth wife. In the early morning hours of March 19, 1985, David called 911. Several officers arrived at the family's home minutes later. David was there with his 17-year-old sister-in-law, Patty, and his 8-month-old daughter. In the master bedroom, the police found the dead body of 23-year-old Linda Brown. She had been shot twice with a 38 caliber handgun. The police asked David what happened. David explained that earlier that night, he and Linda had a bit of a spat and he couldn't sleep, so he went out for a drive. He bought some comic books and some snacks at a 24-hour convenience store. He then went to the beach, where he said he sat and did some thinking. He thought he was away from home for about an hour. When he returned home, he found Patty looking nervous and she was holding the baby. She was upset and said that Cinnamon had tried to kill her by shooting at her. David told the police that Cinnamon was a problem child and that she and Linda did not get along. In fact, Cinnamon had been banished from the house and was forced to sleep in a trailer in the yard. David said he had no idea where Cinnamon was. He was afraid to check the master bedroom, so he called the police. Police officers started to search the property. In a dog pen in the back, there were two large dog houses. A detective noticed that something was inside one of the dog houses. It turned out to be 14-year-old Cinnamon lying in a pool of her own vomit and urine. Cinnamon crawled out of the doghouse and it was clear she was ill. In her hand was a roll of paper tied with a ribbon. The note was open and it read, Dear God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to hurt her. Cinnamon was taken to the police station in an ambulance. On the way to the hospital, she said she swallowed about 80 pills from three bottles. Cinnamon Brown was interviewed by a detective and she admitted to shooting her stepmother. The detective asked her why she did it and she said it was because Linda didn't like her and wanted to send her away. After a while, Cinnamon became unresponsive and she was taken to the hospital. She was treated and released back into police custody. On the surface, the case seemed straightforward. Simon didn't like her stepmother and feared being sent away, so she killed her. Simon Brown's trial started on August 7, 1985. She pleaded guilty by reason of insanity. Simon claimed that she could not remember the murder. Simon's father was supposed to testify against her, but he claimed he was sick and he didn't come to the trial. The trial lasted for five days. Cinnamon, who celebrated her 15th birthday behind bars, was found guilty of first degree murder. In 1985, 15-year-old Sinman was sentenced to 27 years to life. She was sent to a juvenile detention center in Camarillo, California. After Linda's murder, David got a payout of $835,000 for four life insurance policies that he had taken out on Linda's life. 
accounting for inflation that is about $2 million in 2020. Some of the policies were taken out just weeks before Linda was murdered. With the money, David purchased two houses and some new cars. Then, in the summer of 1986, David got married for the seventh time. His sixth wife was 18-year-old Patty Bailey, the sister of his fifth wife, who had been murdered a year earlier by his daughter. However, at David's behest, they kept the marriage a secret. But then, months later, Patty became pregnant and eventually gave birth to a daughter. The deputy district attorney who prosecuted Cinnamon Brown thought that there were major problems with the case. He thought that there were just too many odd things surrounding it. For example, David just happened to be out of the house in the middle of the night when Linda was shot. When he came home, why didn't he check on his wife, who might be in dire need of help? Also, Cinnamon didn't have a history of violence. She was meek and mild-mannered, and unlike any killer the deputy district attorney had ever come across. The case bothered the deputy district attorney so much that he kept tabs on David Brown. He became even more suspicious of David when he found out that he married Patty and that Patty had given birth to his child. In the summer of 1988, about three years in his cinnamon sentence, the deputy district attorney contacted her in jail. Cinnamon immediately started telling a new story. Cinnamon said that her father told her and Patty that Linda and her twin brother were plotting to kill him. She said that Patty and her father discussed plans to get rid of Linda. David told her they had to get rid of Linda or he would have to leave town. Simon told her father that she didn't want him to leave. Then one day, Simon went on a drive with David and Patty. David asked Simon if he really loved her. Simon said that she did. David said that if she really loved him, that she would trust him. He then asked her if she had the stomach to murder someone. Over the next few weeks, anytime Cinnamon was in the car with her father and step-aunt, they tried to convince her that she needed to kill her stepmother. On the night of the murder, Cinnamon said that her father told her that it had to happen that night. He told Cinnamon that if she really loved him, that she would kill Linda. Cinnamon said that her father made her get the suicide note that she had written days before. He then made her swallow a bunch of pills and then go out to the doghouse. In that initial conversation, Simon claimed that she wasn't in the house when the deadly shots were fired. She said that when she was in the doghouse, she heard three gunshots. The deputy district attorney got another deputy to help him with the case. They arranged for Cinnamon to wear a wire when her father visited her. During David's visit, Cinnamon talked about the murder and David made some incriminating statements that implicated both him and Patty in Linda's murder. The next time David came to visit Cinnamon, Patty came with him. Once again, Cinnamon was wearing a wire. Cinnamon confronted them about their roles in Linda's murder, and Patty and David claimed that they didn't remember much about what happened that night. After her father's second visit, Cinnamon told the deputy district attorneys that she was the one who shot Linda. She also said that her father suggested shooting herself in the head afterward. He told her to shoot herself in a way that it would only nick her head and not cause any serious damage. But Cinnamon refused, and David said that the pills would be sufficient. What Cinnamon did not know was that if she had not vomited, 
the pills probably would have killed her. The deputy district attorneys were sure that David wanted Sinmin to die to tie up any loose ends. Sinmin said that Patty gave her the gun and told her she just had to pull the trigger. Sinmin went into the master bedroom and shot Linda once. She left the room, but she could hear Linda moaning. Sinmin went back into the bedroom and shot her again. Then she went into Patty's room and shot a hole in the wall to make it look like she shot at Patty. Sinman then went out to the doghouse and passed out for several hours. In October 1988, both David and Patty were arrested for the murder of Linda Brown. Patty cooperated with the deputy district attorneys. She told them that not long after moving in with her sister and David, she and David got involved in a sexual relationship. She was just 11 years old at the time. Starting sometime in 1984, Patty said that David tried to get her to murder her sister. Patty said that six months before Linda was killed, David sent her into the bedroom where Linda was sleeping with a handgun. But Patty couldn't go through with it. Patty also said that David came up with several scenarios as to how they could kill Linda and make it look like an accidental shooting. Patty then verified that Cinnamon's confession was accurate. Patty was asked why she wanted her sister dead. Patty said that David instilled in them that the family was the most important thing and Linda was the enemy because she was trying to destroy the family. Patty compared it to being in a cult. In jail awaiting trial, David developed a plan with a fellow inmate to murder the two deputy district attorneys who were prosecuting his case and Patty. The inmate went directly to the deputy district attorneys and cooperated with them. The inmate was transferred to a different jail, but David was told he was released. The inmate was then brought back to the jail where David was being held and they met in the visitor's area. He wore a wire and recorded David planning out the murders. After the meeting, the inmate would call David and their conversations were recorded. On the phone calls, David said that the deputy district attorneys were to be shot. Since Patty was in jail, David wanted the inmate's girlfriend to get arrested and then kill Patty in jail. David was subsequently charged with three counts of conspiracy to commit murder, amongst other charges. The inmate who helped catch David did not get anything in return for his cooperation. He had gone to the deputy district attorneys because David Brown disgusted him. Patty Bailey pleaded guilty to murder. She was sentenced to the custody of the California Youth Authority until the age of 25. David Brown went to trial at the end of April 1990. Both Patty and Cinnamon testified against him. The recordings of him plying the murders of Patty and the two district attorneys were also played in court. In June 1990, David Brown was found guilty on all counts. At David's sentencing hearing, the judge called him a scary person. The judge said that he was even afraid of him. He said to David, you make Charlie Manson look like a piker. According to Merriam-Webster, a piker is one who does things in small ways. David Brown was ultimately sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Simon Brown was paroled in February 1992 at the age of 21 after serving nearly eight years. She went on to lead a normal life and she did not have any further trouble with the law. 
When Patty Bailey was convicted, she was 21 years old, and she was released when she was 25. Upon release, Patty married a correctional officer who worked at the prison. David Brown died of natural causes in March 2014 at the age of 61. Number 3. Unnamed 14-year-old boy. Oatley is a suburb of Sydney, Australia. On January 28, 1987, the police were called to a home in the suburb, which is in the south of Sydney. When they got there, they found a woman sitting in an armchair and there was a bloody bandage wrapped around her head. The woman explained that her husband was at work and she had gone out shopping. When she came home, she found her 11-year-old daughter dead on the kitchen floor. It was clear she had been beaten in the head. Then suddenly, her 14-year-old son attacked her with a hammer. The police went into the kitchen and they found the dead body of the 11-year-old on the floor. A towel had been placed over her battered head. In the bedroom of the 14-year-old boy, the officers found a bloody hammer. Then they went out to the garage and found the boy who was covered in blood. He said to the officer, they made me do it. He was asked what he meant and he said, bash my sister. Then the boy started humming the theme song from the Twilight Zone. The officer asked who they were, but the boy kept humming the theme song. The boy then asked if he could watch TV. The officer noted that the boy didn't seem remorseful and there were no signs that he had been crying. The boy's mother was taken to the hospital. She had a skull fracture and had to undergo surgery. She ultimately survived her injuries. Her son was arrested and charged with murder and attempted murder. The last article that could be found about the case was printed in May 1987, about four months after the murder. It said that the boy was to undergo a psychiatric evaluation and then stay in trial. The boy planned to plead not guilty. As to what happened to him after the article was printed is not known. The young man's name and the name of his sister have never been made public. If he is still alive today, at the time of this video, he would be 48 years old. Number 2. Heather Smith In the autumn of 1985, 14-year-old Heather Smith started 9th grade at Spanaway Junior High in Spanaway, Washington. Heather was a bright girl who had straight A's and she was a teacher's aide. She was also a member of the school's gymnastic team. Sometime that autumn, she started dating 15-year-old Gordon Pickett. Gordon was a member of the high school wrestling team. He also played soccer and he was in the Boy Scouts. Sometime in mid-October, Gordon broke it off with Heather. He thought that they should be friends. Over the next several weeks, Heather revealed to several friends that she was angry that Gordon had dumped her. She said she was going to get him and even told a few people she was going to kill him. However, no one took her seriously. In mid-November, Heather slashed one of her wrists. She told her parents, Alan and Brenda, that she was depressed because she had received some bad marks in school. They took her for counseling at a local hospital. On November 26, 1985, two days before Thanksgiving, 14-year-old Heather Smith attended school as usual. Then she went home and grabbed a 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle that belonged to her family. She then got a ride back to school with a friend. Heather then stood outside the school's gym. Then a boy in the 8th grade who knew Heather came out of the gym. 
Heather asked the boy to go get her ex-boyfriend, 15-year-old Gordon Pickett, who was inside the gym for wrestling practice. The boy asked Heather why she wanted him. He then asked if she was going to blow his brains out. Heather said no and said she didn't even know how to load the gun. Then Gordon and his friend, 14-year-old Chris Rico, walked out of the gym. Heather aimed the gun at Gordon. In an effort to save his friend, Chris stepped in between Gordon and the gun. Heather shot Chris three times. She then shot Gordon once in the head. After shooting the two boys, Heather ran from the schoolyard with the gun in her hand. 911 was called and paramedics and police officers descended onto the schoolyard. Sadly, 15-year-old Gordon Pickett was pronounced dead on the scene. 14-year-old Chris Rico was rushed to the hospital. About two hours after the shooting, 14-year-old Heather Smith returned to the schoolyard. She was still armed with a rifle. As police officers approached her slowly, they tried to convince her to put the gun down. But then, Heather shot herself in the temple. Heather was taken to the same hospital where Chris Rico had been taken. As both their children were in the intensive care unit, Chris Rico's father, James Rico, talked to Heather's parents, Alan and Brenda, and tried to comfort them. That night, 14-year-old Chris Rico died from his wounds. The next morning, 14-year-old Heather Smith passed away. After the deadly shooting, Gordon Pickett's mother, Sandra Lauderdale, talked to a reporter. She said she had reached out and spoke to Heather's parents. She said that they were all suffering a loss and it was probably harder for the Smiths because they had to live with what Heather did. Gordon's mother called Heather a nice girl and said she had to be so troubled that she didn't know what she was doing. Number 1. Dennis Ottoson In early August 1962, Dennis Roger Ottoson was 16 years old. He lived on his family's farm, which was about six miles outside of the small town of Arlington, South Dakota, which had a population of around a thousand people. Ottoson was an honor student who regularly attended church. According to many people in the town, he was always first to help when there was a problem. Ottoson didn't love farm life, but he always did his chores without complaining. According to some people, Ottoson wanted to be a journalist, while his parents thought he wanted to be a civil engineer. He was a school's photographer. Ottoson was also an avid outdoorsman. He liked to hunt, fish, and he read many natural science books. Ottoson was tall and gangly, and he didn't have many friends. As far as anyone knew, he didn't date much. Around dinner on August 3rd, 1967, Dennis Ottoson left his home. He left a note for his parents saying that he had gone hiking and he would be back in two days. But he really made his way to a neighboring farm which belonged to the Paulson family. 44-year-old Hugh Paulson and his 35-year-old wife, Lorraine, had three daughters. Carlin, their oldest, was 13, Anita was 9, and Leanne was 6. In a grove of trees between the farms, Ottoson changed into some work clothes. After changing his clothes, he then got into the Paulson family's home. The Paulsons were shopping when he entered their house. For the next three hours, Ottoson waited for the family. At first, when they arrived home, they weren't too startled to find 16-year-old Dennis Ottoson in their home. But then they saw that he was armed with a 22 caliber rifle. Ottoson forced Hugh Paulson and his two youngest daughters to lay down on the living room floor. 
Using clothesline rope and leather shoelaces, he bound the wrists and ankles. He led 35-year-old Lorraine to a hallway and tied her up as well. He then took 13-year-old Carlin to an upstairs bedroom where he made her undress. Once she was nude, he bound her as well. Otterson then started executing the family members one by one by shooting them in the head. When he was done slaughtering the family, he left the house. Hours later, Dennis Austin was found wandering around downtown Arlington. The town marshal called his home and asked his parents to come get him. When his parents picked him up, they immediately noticed that he was acting very oddly. He didn't seem to understand what was going on and his father had to shake him to get his attention. He also refused to talk. Iosin's parents took him home and put him to bed. The next morning, Iosin still wouldn't talk, but he started responding to yes or no questions by nodding or shaking his head. Iosin's parents asked if they should call the doctor, and he shook his head no. They asked him if they should call the police, and again he shook his head no. Then they asked if they should call the pastor, and he nodded his head. So they called the pastor, and he came to the family's home. For a while, Otterson and the pastor prayed in his bedroom together. The pastor then came out of the bedroom and told Otterson's parents that he said he had shot one of the Paulson girls. Otterson's parents were confused by their son's statement. The Paulsons had been their neighbors for about 15 years, and they thought they would have been notified if one of them had been shot. Allison's father and the pastor decided to go to the Paulsons' home. When they got there, they knocked on the door and heard no movement inside. The front door was unlocked, so they let themselves in. They found the dead bodies of 44-year-old Hugh, 35-year-old Lorraine, 13-year-old Carlin, 9-year-old Anita, and 6-year-old Leanne. While the pastor and Iosin's father were at the Paulson's home, Iosin talked to his mother. She said that he was very remorseful. He kept asking, why didn't something stop him? The sheriff was alerted and he came to the scene. He arrested Iosin, who brought his Bible to the jail with him. The Paulson's home was searched and nothing had been stolen. Also, while Carlin was nude, there was no signs of sexual assault. But the sheriff said there was a definite sexual element to the crime. 16-year-old Dennis Allison was questioned and he was asked why he killed the family. He said, I just had to do something, that's all. He also said, I couldn't just leave them there tied up like that. The mass murder shocked the small town and many people attended the funeral of the Paulsons. 16-year-old Dennis Allison was charged with murder. After he was arrested, he was held without bond. While Allison was waiting to go to trial, he went through an extensive psychological examination. Austin's trial was supposed to start on November 13, 1962, about three months after the murders. Austin planned on pleading not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. But after the defense reviewed the reports from the doctors, Austin changed his plea to guilty. On November 4, 1962, 16-year-old Dennis Austin was sentenced to life without parole. However, his sentence could be changed later so that he could be paroled. The psychiatrist who examined Ottosin said that he was a loner who lived in his own fantasy world. Ottosin had also been mentally ill for the past six or seven years. In prison, Dennis Ottosin was the editor of the prison's magazine. 
He also wrote several poems and short stories that were published in publications outside the prison. According to the South Dakota Inmate Database, Dennis Allison completed his sentence in May 2009 when he was 63 years old. Including the time Allison spent in jail awaiting his trial, he had been incarcerated for 46 years and 9 months. It's unclear what happened to Dennis Roger Otteson after he was released. Number 3. Gavin Mondaw Located in northwest Alberta, Canada is Valley View. The town has a population of less than a couple thousand people. In the summer of 1991, the Mondon family had a cottage just outside the town. 41-year-old Susan and 46-year-old Maurice Mondon got married five years earlier in July 1986. It was Susan's second marriage and Maurice's third. Susan had three children from her previous marriage, 15-year-old Gavin, 12-year-old Isley, and 10-year-old Janelle. The three children lived with Susan and Maurice. The birth father of the three children, Ian McLean, was abusive. He eventually lost visitation rights to his children. Maurice was a good stepfather to Susan's three children. Both Maurice and Susan were school teachers, and the family lived in St. Albert, Alberta. Gavin was a bright young man. He had an IQ of 133, which put him in the superior range. Gavin had several close friends, but he wasn't considered popular. He had a passion for science fiction books, and his nose was often in a book. Some people said that Gavin had temper, and once in a while, he would get violin. Maurice had three children from a previous marriage. Two of his children had lived with the family. They remembered one time Gavin chased them with a hockey stick, and another time he chased one of them with a knife. Gavin despised doing chores, like washing the dishes, and he didn't like going to church. On August 6, 1991, 41-year-old Susan, 46-year-old Maurice, 12-year-old Isley, and 10-year-old Janelle went out shopping. They returned to the cottage a few hours later. 15-year-old Gavin was waiting for them with a 22 caliber rifle. As soon as his stepfather stepped out of the car, Gavin shot him in the head. He then shot his mother. He walked towards the car and shot his stepfather again. He waited for his mother to look at him and then he delivered the kill shot. Gavin then shot his 12 year old and 10 year old sisters at point blank range. In total, Gavin pumped 10 bullets into his family. He then tied his stepfather's dead body to the back of an ATV and dragged him into some tall grass that was about a mile from the scene of the shooting. Then Gavin went back to the body of his mother. Using a knife, he cut open his mother's dress and undergarments, exposing her body. But there were no signs of sexual assault. Gavin then drove the car with the bodies of his mother and sisters inside of it into a group of trees. After hiding the car, Gavin went inside the cottage. He watched some TV and he tried to eat. He thought about taking his own life several times. Gavin ended up staying on the property for over 24 hours. Then, in the early morning hours of August 8, 1991, Gavin loaded up some clothing, a cooler, two knives, a shotgun, and the murder weapon into the family's minivan. He also grabbed a mystery novel, A Graveyard for Lunatics, by Ray Bradbury. Gavin then got into the minivan and started driving. He was planning on heading home to St. Albert, which is about 200 miles from the cottage. But before long, an officer noticed him and thought he was driving erratically. He tried to pull him over, but Gavin wouldn't stop. Instead, he led the police on a high-speed chase. 
At times, he reached speeds of over 105 miles per hour. He was finally stopped after he ran over a set of spike strips that the police had laid down. Once Gavin was in custody, he confessed to killing his family. The police went to the family's cottage and found the four dead bodies. What no one understood was why Gavin killed his family. He said that he was annoyed by the attitude of the entire household. He also said that he felt like a slave because he had to do so many chores. But Gavin said he's not exactly sure if the anger over the chores was the motive. He talked to a reporter for the newspaper, the Edmonton Journal, and he said, It doesn't make sense. At the time, the reasons seem acceptable. Now, I can't even remember the reasons. While Gavin was awaiting trial, he was held in a youth detention center. Shortly after the murders, he became a born-again Christian and he was baptized. It was decided that even though Gavin was 15 at the time of the murders, he would be tried as an adult. In November 1993, about two years after the murders, Gavin pleaded guilty to four counts of second-degree murder. In March 1994, he was sentenced to the maximum life in prison with the possibility of parole after 10 years. In prison, Gavin changed his name to Gavin Ian McLean, which is his father's name. Since Gavin had already been incarcerated for two and a half years when he was sentenced, he was able to apply for parole for the first time in 2001 when he was 25. He applied for parole at the first opportunity and his parole was denied. The parole board thought he lacked remorse for what he did. In 2009, Gavin was granted permission to take temporary, unescorted leaves from the minimum security prison where he was being held. But the parole board noted that he still showed a lack of remorse. He showed a lot of hostility towards his mother and he considered himself to be the victim. In 2010, Gavin's case was reviewed and he was considered to be in the low moderate range when it came to violent reoffending. In 2012, Gavin was granted day parole. He had also gotten a job doing remote IT support. His supervisor called him an ideal employee. Then in 2016, 25 years after the murder, 40-year-old Gavin Ian McLean was granted full parole. The parole board said that his view about the murders had changed over the years. He accepted that he had a loving mother who did not deserve to die. One concern that the authorities had was that Gavin had never had a romantic partner. So they thought that he might not be able to handle rejection from an intimate partner. As a result, he has to immediately report any romantic relationships to the authorities. The authorities have said that Gavin will probably be monitored for the rest of his life. It's been five years since Gavin Ian McLean received full parole and he has stayed out of the news since. At the time of this video, he is 45 years old and his whereabouts are unknown. Number 2. David Brom The Brom family lived in Cascade Township, Minnesota. It is a suburban, well-to-do area that is home to a few thousand people. In February 1998, it was home to the Brom family. 41-year-old Bernard and his 41-year-old wife, Paulette, had four children, 19-year-old Joseph, 16-year-old David, 14-year-old Diane, and 9-year-old Rick. In early 1988, Joseph wasn't living with the family. For 20 years, Bernard worked at IBM. In 1988, he was an advisory engineer who helped develop new computer products. The family was devoutly Catholic and Bernard and Paulette were strict parents. 
Many people thought that 16-year-old David Brom was a nice young man. He attended church every week. He babysat for neighbors and he would shovel neighbors' driveways. But David and his father butted heads over his musical taste. David liked hardcore punk bands like Suicidal Tendencies. David had recently dyed his hair black, shaved the sides of his head, and spiked up the remaining hair. On the night of February 8, 1988, David and his father got in a fight over a cassette that David had recently purchased. The next day, teachers at the Catholic prep school that David attended started hearing a disturbing rumor. David, who did not attend school that day, had apparently told several friends that he had killed his family. One of the teachers called the police and that afternoon, police officers went over to the family's home. When the police got into the family's home, they found a grisly crime scene. In a the hallway, they found the dead bodies of 41-year-old Paulette and 14-year-old Diane. In the master bedroom was the dead body of 41-year-old Bernard. In another bedroom, they found the dead body of 9-year-old Rick. They had been brutally hacked to death with a 28-inch axe that was found in the basement. Bernard had been struck 22 times, Paulette 17 times, Diane was whacked 9 times, and Rick suffered 8 axe blows. The police launched a massive search for David. The next morning, someone called the police because they saw David using a phone booth near a post office in Rochester, Minnesota. When the police arrested David in his possession, they found a wig and makeup. The police think that he was planning on using the wig and the makeup to disguise himself. After David was arrested, he confessed to the murders. It was decided that even though David was 16 at the time of the murders, he would be tried as an adult. David's trial began in late September 1989. David pleaded not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. In Minnesota, when the defendant pleads not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity, it is a two-phase trial. The first phase is to determine if he is guilty or not guilty, and the second is to determine if he was sane when the crime was committed. Several of David's friends testified. They said he had been planning the murders for about six months. After the murders, David called a female friend and told her about it. She testified and she said that David initially attacked his parents in bed. He then went to his younger brother's room and killed him. When he got back to the hallway, he found his mother lying on the floor. Although David had attacked his mother in bed, he had not killed her, and she managed to get out of bed and made her way to the hallway. His sister was leaning over her. So he attacked both of them. The jury deliberated for less than five hours. On October 3, 1989, which was David Brahms' 18th birthday, he was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder. The second phase of his trial started two days later. David's lawyer argued that David was mentally ill. He said that in 1987, David attempted suicide twice. He also said that David suffered from multiple personality disorder and he had three distinct personalities. The second phase of the trial lasted a week. Then, for 22 hours over three days, the jury deliberated. They found that David was sane at the time of the murders. Therefore, he was guilty of murdering his four family members. David was looking at four consecutive life sentences. At the time in Minnesota, someone serving a life sentence had to serve at least 17 and a half years before they could apply for parole. 
If David were to be sentenced to four consecutive life sentences, he would have to serve at least 70 years of prison. His lawyer argued that the sentences should run concurrently. Then he would have been eligible to apply for parole after 17 and a half years. On October 16, 1989, for the murders of his mother, father, and brother, David Brom was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. For the murder of his sister, David was given a life sentence that would run concurrently with the three other life sentences. That means David will have to serve 52 and a half years of prison before he can apply for parole. He won't be able to apply for parole until 2041 when he'll be 70 years old. David Brom is currently serving a sentence at the Minnesota Correctional Facility Stillwater in Bayport, Minnesota. At the time of this video, he is 49 years old. Number 1. Eric Burrell Solias Pone is a commune in the south of France. It's about 10 miles from downtown Toulon. In September 1995, 16-year-old Eric Burrell lived with his mother, Marie-Jean Pantarine, his stepfather, Yves Bichet, and his half-brother, 11-year-old Jean-Yves Bichet. Up until about the age of 13, Eric had lived with his biological father's parents. Shortly after moving in with his mother and stepfather, Eric started to have problems. He did not get along with his stepfather and his strictly religious mother. Eric attended a vocational school. His teachers did not notice anything unusual about him. None of them recommended that he should seek counseling. They expected Eric to graduate as an electrical mechanic. But Eric had a dark side to him. Eric mentioned to a few people that he hated his home life. He did not like taking out the garbage or doing the dishes. He had several photos of Adolf Hitler in his bedroom and he had Nazi literature. Eric never dated and he was pretty much a loner. He only had one friend, Alan Guimet. Unlike Eric, 17 year old Alan was popular, he dated young women, and he played in a band. At around 7.30 on the morning of September 24th, 1995, Eric rang the doorbell of Alan's home. Alan and his family lived in Couer, which is a village that is about four miles from Solies Pont. Alan's mother was surprised to see the young man on her doorstep since it was 7.30 a.m. on a Saturday. She got Alan out of bed and then he and Eric went out to the garden. They had an intense conversation and then Alan turned and started walking towards the house. Eric aimed the 22 caliber rifle he was carrying and shot his only friend in the head. Eric quickly left the family's home. An ambulance was called for and Alan was rushed to the hospital. Tragically, 17-year-old Alan Guimet died on the way to the hospital. Eric started walking around the streets of Kiras. 48-year-old Jeanette Violette was opening a window and Eric shot her. He then shot 77-year-old Denise Otto and her husband. Eric then encountered an elderly couple and he shot the woman. Then two young brothers crossed his path. Eric shot them both. 59-year-old Rodolfo Corvala was in his home and Eric shot him through an open window. Eric shot 65-year-old Andre Coletta as she was walking her dog. Mohamed Murad, age 41, was shot when he stepped outside of his apartment building. 81-year-old Mario Pagini was out that morning buying a newspaper. Eric shot him as well. 59-year-old Marius Boudon and 62-year-old Andre Touré were shot outside of a bank. Eric walked for a little bit 
And then he came across 15-year-old Pascal Mostachi. Eric shot the teenage boy. At some point, he came across 68-year-old Pierre Mariano and 68-year-old Jean Logiero, and he shot them both. Unfortunately, it was hunting season in the area, so no one thought that the sound of gunshots was out of place. Also, no one was alarmed to see a young man with a rifle. Eric was calm throughout his rampage. He walked quickly, but he never ran. He did not shoot everyone he came across. He seemingly picked out people at random to die. Unfortunately, Eric was incredibly methodical in his rampage. He always aimed for the head, and he usually hit his mark. If he didn't, he walked up to the injured victim and delivered a kill shot at close range. Finally, about 30 minutes after the rampage began, the police found Eric and surrounded him. At the time, he was in front of a school under a cypress tree. Eric aimed the gun at his head and he pulled the trigger. He died nearly instantly. Several of his victims were taken to the hospital, but for most, it was too late. Eric claimed the lives of 13 people, including his own. He also injured five other people. After the shooting, the police went to Eric's home and they made a horrifying discovery. The night before the massacre, Eric was at home with his stepfather, Yves Bichet, and his half-brother, 11-year-old Jean-Yves Bichet. His mother was at church. The police surmised that Yves and his stepson got into an argument. Eric grabbed the rifle, which belonged to his stepfather, and then shot him four times. Afterward, he beat his body with a hammer. Eric then went into the living room, where 11-year-old Jean-Yves was watching TV. Eric shot his half-brother and also beat him with a hammer. He then hid the bodies and cleaned up the blood. When his mother, Jean-Marie Parenti, walked in the door, Eric shot her to death. There are conflicting reports about what happened afterward. Some news accounts say that her body was beaten with a baseball bat, while others say that her body was not beaten. Nevertheless, this brought Eric's total body count to 16, including himself. People in France were shocked by the mass shooting. Many people were looking for answers. Why would a 16-year-old boy kill his family, his best friend, and 12 random strangers? People have speculated, but there are no definitive answers. Eric Burrell did not leave any form of communication behind to explain his actions, and since he's dead, he cannot explain why he committed these horrible acts. Number 3. John Jane In early 1959, the Jane family lived on a farm just outside of Kelloggsville, New York. 66-year-old Willis and his 55-year-old wife, Amber, had three children, 19-year-old Willard, 16-year-old John, and Elizabeth, who was 13. John was an average student and no one noticed anything abnormal about him. On the night of January 28, 1959, 16-year-old John went over to a neighbor's home. He told them he had shot someone. The police arrived at the family's farm and they discovered that the Jane family had been murdered. John was questioned and he freely admitted that he committed the murders. He said that he thought about killing his family the night before while he was watching TV. Then he came home from school that day and decided to follow through with his plan. After dinner, he was in the kitchen with his 55-year-old mother, Amber, and his 13-year-old sister, Elizabeth. He got them each a dish of ice cream. He then picked up his father's 12-gauge shotgun. 
He shot them both in the stomach and in the head. He then went out to the barn where he shot his father twice with a shotgun. When John killed his father, mother, and sister, his 19-year-old brother, Willard, was working at a local plant. John decided to wait for him. He hung out in the front yard and waved at several neighbors who drove by. When Willard came home, John opened the door to the barn so that Willard could park inside the barn. When Willard stepped out of the car, John shot him. John also shot the family's dog, a beagle. Once he had wiped out his entire family, John went over to the neighbor's house and told them he had shot someone. John was asked why he did it and he didn't have a specific motive. He said it was just a bunch of different things. For example, that past summer he had been spanked and he thought he was too old to be spanked. He also said that his father was abusive. He also said that he and his brother would fight and his sister would side with his brother. John was arrested and held in jail after the murders. On May 8, 1959, John Jane pleaded guilty to second-degree murder as part of a plea deal. A few weeks later, he was sentenced to 20 years to life. The judge said that he should spend the rest of his life in prison unless he got mental help. John Jane was paroled in October 1978 at the age of 36. He had served 19 and a half years in prison. It's unknown what happened to John after he was paroled. He wasn't convicted of any other crimes and he has stayed out of the media spotlight. If John Jane is still alive at the time of this video, he's 78 years old. Number 2. Unnamed 14 year old boy. Arthur Irwin, who went by his middle name, Bruce, was a famous gambling expert. The Canadian board man was a dental technician until 1962. Then his uncle died and left him with a mathematical formula that supposedly would ensure he always wins at games of chance. This includes games like blackjack, roulette, and craps. Bruce traveled around North America gambling using the formula. He spent four months in Las Vegas, but then he started getting in trouble with the casinos. He claims that in three and a half years, he won $200,000. Accounting for inflation, that is about $1.5 million in 2021. In 1967, Bruce published a book called The Midas Touch. It was about his experiences gambling, but it did not give his formula for winning. However, the formula was for sale, it just wasn't in the book that had a cover price of 95 cents. Instead, people could write to Bruce and buy a photocopy of the formula for $25, which is about $200 in 2021. In the 1970s, Bruce Irwin traveled to Europe and tried his system. But he ended up losing money. He said that thinking about the system in different currencies affected his concentration. Evidently, Bruce got a skill back because he was eventually banned from the five biggest casinos in the United Kingdom. He was also eventually banned from the casinos in Las Vegas. Bruce made, media, Bruce made many media appearances where he showed off his gambling skills. He took on both human competitors like mathematicians and computers. He never lost in any of his media appearances. In the 1980s, Bruce Irwin opened 60 schools for gambling in the United States and Canada. Supposedly, he uses gambling winnings to fund the schools. In 1983, Bruce published another book called The Winner's Edge, How to Win at Casino Gambling. 
In the book, he reveals his formula for winning at Games of Chance. In the spring of 1985, Arthur Bruce Irwin was 55 years old and he was living in an upscale house in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. He was living with his 39-year-old wife, Joyce, their 7-year-old daughter, Kelly, and his unidentified 14-year-old stepson. The 14-year-old boy was fascinated with Satanism and he loved heavy metal music. The boy regularly read the Satanic Bible and he even carved the number 666 into his chest with a knife. Just after 7 a.m. on April 12, 1985, the 14 year old boy called one of his friends. He was excited and he told his friend he had did it. His friend asked him what he meant and he said they had killed his mother, stepfather and half-sister. Later that same day, the 14 year old boy and his friend went out shopping. They bought records and sunglasses. They ate lunch at a popular hamburger restaurant. They also got their ears pierced. That afternoon, the boy took some of his friends through the crime scene and showed off the dead bodies. One of the friends contacted the police. Officers went over to the Irwin's house. They found 55-year-old Arthur and 39-year-old Joyce in their bed in their second floor bedroom. They had both been shot once in the head with a 303 caliber rifle. 303 caliber rifles are powerful enough to kill moose and grizzly bears. In the living room on a chair they found the dead body of seven-year-old Kelly. She was still clutching a doll. She had been shot once in the chest with a rifle. The medical examiner said that she had drowned on her own blood. The police arrested the 14 year old boy who could not be identified because of Canada's Young Offender Act. The Young Offenders Act only became a law a year earlier. The boy told the police that he got the rifle from a closet and he went into the bedroom of his mother and stepfather. He stood over them for about five minutes with a rifle barrel a few feet from their heads. Then his mother woke up and started screaming, so he shot her. This woke up his stepfather, so he shot him as well. He then went down to the living room and found Kelly, who had been watching cartoons. She was crying and hugging her doll, too scared to move. He shot her in the chest. The boy claimed that he wasn't in control of his body when he committed the murders. Instead, another entity, Eddie, the mascot of the heavy metal band Iron Maiden, was in control. He thought that by committing the murders, it would set Eddie free. The unidentified boy went to trial in December 1985. Had he been tried as an adult, he could have been sentenced to 25 years to life. Instead, he was tried as a youth under the Young Offender Act. It was the first time that someone went to trial for first degree murder under the Young Offender Act. The boy was found guilty of first degree murder. For murdering three people, including a child, he was sentenced to the maximum three years of prison. At the end of his sentence, if he were to be found mentally ill or a danger to society, he could have been placed in a mental institution. Many Canadians were shocked by the lenient sentence and meetings were held. But no changes were made to the Young Offenders Act in the wake of the trial. The boy was offered counseling while he was incarcerated, but he turned down all help. Many people were afraid what might happen if he were to be released into the community. When he had finished serving his three years, the authorities saw no reason to keep him incarcerated. So he was released in February 1989 at the age of 18. 
As part of the Young Offenders Act, the murders were not on his permanent record. His name has also never been made public. It's unknown what name he's using today or where he might be living. Number 1. Robert and Michael Bever Broken Arrow is a city in northeast Oklahoma. In 2015, it was home to just over 100,000 people. This included the Bever family. 52-year-old David and his 44-year-old wife, April, had seven children. 18-year-old Robert, 16-year-old Michael, 13-year-old Crystal, 12-year-old Daniel, 7-year-old Christopher, 5-year-old Victoria, and 2-year-old Autumn. The children were homeschooled and the family generally kept to themselves. People in the neighborhood saw the children, but not many of them knew them by name. At 11 p.m. on July 22, 2015, the following call came into 911. 911. Broken Air 911. Hello? Hello? Hi, where are you at? Broken Air, Oklahoma, 7411. What address? <laughs> Seven hundred Okay. Are you the only one there? No. My brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Um, okay, who's attacking your family? What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who who is it? Do they have Are you there? The police went to the address where the call came from and they saw blood on the front patio, so they entered the house. They found 13 year old Crystal bleeding in the front of the house. Her throat had been slit and she had been stabbed multiple times in the stomach and the arms. Amazingly, she was still conscious. She told the officers that she was attacked by her brothers, 18-year-old Robert and 16-year-old Michael. The police searched the rest of the house. In a first floor bathroom, they found the dead bodies of 7-year-old Christopher and 5-year-old Victoria. Christopher had been stabbed 21 times in the upper body and the lower leg, and Victoria had been stabbed 23 times in the upper body. The dead body of 44-year-old April was found in the living room. She had suffered a blunt force trauma wound, and she had been stabbed 48 times in the head, neck, and chest. In the upstairs office, they discovered the dead body of 12-year-old Daniel, who had been stabbed 21 times in the back chest and shoulder. Also upstairs was the body of 52-year-old David Bever. He had been stabbed in the upper body at least 28 times. In a bedroom, officers found 2-year-old Autumn Bever. She was alive and unharmed in her crib. Of the six family members who had been attacked, Crystal was the only one who was still alive, so she was rushed to the hospital. The police searched the area around the family's house. In a wooded area behind their house, they found 18-year-old Robert and 16-year-old Michael. They were both covered in blood and mud. Crystal underwent emergency surgery and she survived the brutal assault. Based on Crystal's statements and what Robert and Michael told the police, the investigators were able to piece together what happened. For at least a year, the brothers planned the murders. Robert had started buying guns and ammunition online. The guns were sent to a local gun shop, and this is where the brothers ran into a problem. 
They needed someone 21 or older to pick the guns up. The morning after the massacre, they were expecting over 2,000 rounds of ammunition to be delivered to their home. They had also started buying knives and body armor, which they kept hidden in their bedroom. Crystal told her parents that her brothers were collecting weapons, but they didn't do anything about it. They just thought that Robert and Michael wanted attention. Around 11.30 on the night of the murders, most of the family was in bed. The matriarch, April, was up and she was watching TV. She told Robert and Michael, who were also up, to wash the dishes. Instead, they went to their bedroom. Crystal, who was also awake, went to the bedroom and saw Robert and Michael putting on body armor and they had a collection of knives out on the bed. Crystal wasn't alarmed because she had seen her brothers put on body armor before and she knew they had knives. They told her to look at something on the computer. When she did, she turned her back to them. Michael said, should we do it now? Robert replied, yeah. Then Robert slit Crystal's throat. The plan was to kill Crystal quickly and quietly and then hide the body in the closet. Then they would kill the rest of the family one by one. But that didn't happen. Crystal started fighting back and Robert kept stabbing her. She then ran for the bedroom screaming. She managed to make it out the front door but she was caught and pulled back into the house where she was stabbed several more times. Robert then turned his attention to his 44 year old mother and stabbed her to death. The attacks and the screaming woke up most of the children in the house. Seven year old Christopher and five year old Victoria got into a bathroom and they locked themselves in. Michael went to the bathroom and asked them to let him in because Robert was trying to kill him. One of them opened the door and once inside Michael stabbed them both to death. Then Robert and Michael went to the home office where 12 year old Daniel was hiding behind a locked door. He was the one who called 911. Once again, Michael used the ruse that Robert was doing the killing and he was hiding from him. Daniel, who was still on the phone with the 911 operator, opened the door to find his brothers. Michael told Robert that Daniel was all his. Robert then stabbed him to death. Then 52 year old David came out of his bedroom. Robert stabbed his father to death. The brothers said that they were planning on killing two-year-old Autumn by decapitating her, but they had forgotten about her in their melee. The brothers had also planned on making two videos. One video was going to be gory and they were going to leave it behind for the police to watch. Another video was going to be less bloody and they planned on uploading it to YouTube. They had also planned on dismembering the bodies and hiding the body parts in the attic. But since 911 had been called, they had to change their plans and they fled the house. They were arrested about an hour after the murders. When the brothers were asked why they killed their family, they had several reasons. They claimed that their parents were abusive. They also said that their parents were strictly religious and they often talked about biblical apocalypse that would wipe out everyone they hated. Also, the massacre was just the start of their murderous plans. They planned on traveling to different cities and murdering random people. That is why the ammo was going to be delivered the next morning. They wanted to kill over a hundred people. They wanted to go down in history as infamous killers. They idolized serial killers and mass murderers. In October 2015, it was determined that Michael, who was 16 years old at the time of the murders, 
would be tried as an adult. Nearly a year later, in September 2016, a plea deal was struck with Robert. He pleaded guilty to five counts of first-degree murder and one count of assault and battery with intent to kill. Instead of being sentenced to death, he was given six life sentences without the possibility of parole. A few months later, in March 2017, a fire destroyed the Bever House, which had stayed vacant since the murders. It was decided that a memorial park would be constructed on the property. Michael Bever's trial started on April 20th, 2018. Robert testified and he took responsibility for the murders. He said that he never saw Michael stab anyone. The trial lasted a little less than three weeks. Then the jury deliberated for just over five hours. Michael Bever was found guilty of all the same charges that his brother was convicted of. For the five counts of first degree murder, Michael was given five life sentences. For attempting to kill Crystal, he was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Even in prison, Robert has not been able to stay out of trouble. In July 2019, he attacked prison staff with an 8 inch long sharpened instrument. It was not made public if anyone was hurt in the attack. In August 2020, Robert pleaded guilty to two counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and one count of possessing a weapon in a penal institution. He was given three life sentences which are to run concurrently with his consecutive life sentences. Robert Bever, who is 24 years old at the time of this video, is serving a sentence at the Joseph Harp Correctional Center in Lexington, Oklahoma. 22-year-old Michael Bever is serving a sentence at the Lexington Correctional Center in Lexington. It's expected that both brothers will die in prison. Number 3. Diana Day Humphreys In September 1958, the Humphreys family lived in Houston, Texas. Artie Humphreys was a retired Navy SEAL man and in September 1958, he was working at a manufacturing plant. His 34-year-old wife was an airlines clerk. They had two children, 16-year-old Diana Day Humphreys and 14-year-old Robert D. Humphreys. Diana was a bright young woman. She had an IQ of 142. One of her teachers said she had a strong interest in health and she had a bright future. On September 23, 1958, Diana stayed home from school because she had an upset stomach. The rest of her family left for the day. When they were gone, Diana went into the garage and found an old 22 caliber rifle that belonged to her grandfather. The bullet from the rifle had been removed and it was hidden for safety reasons. Diana found the bolt and put the rifle back together. She then went out and bought some ammunition from a store in the neighborhood. She returned home and wanted to see if the rifle worked. So she shot a mattress. Diana then went out into the den and waited for her family to return home. Her brother, 14-year-old Robert, came home first. When Diana heard the door open, she hid behind the TV. She didn't want her brother to know she was the one who shot him. When Robert walked into the den, Diana shot him once in the forehead and he fell face down. Diana wasn't sure if she had killed him, so she loaded the rifle quickly and shot him in the back of the head. She then sat down and waited for the rest of her family. Her mother arrived home not long afterward and Diana watched her come up the walkway. Diana didn't think she could shoot her mother without her mother seeing her, so she decided not to wipe out the rest of her family. Diana told her mother not to come inside because Robert was dead. Initially, her mother thought she was joking. 
Then she got into the house and took the gun away from Diana. Then she saw that her son was dead on the floor of the den. She called the police, her husband, and her pastor. Diana was arrested and brought to the police station. She made a full confession. Diana said she wasn't angry. Instead, she was just bored. She said, I did it because nothing ever exciting happens around here. I did it because everything was so routine. My mother goes to work every day and comes home tired. So does my father, and he is sick with ulcers. Everyone was always tired. Robert was tired of school. It seemed we were always getting up, going to school or work, coming home, cooking meals, eating, washing the dishes, going to bed, and getting up again. I couldn't stand it. I wanted to kill everyone quickly so we wouldn't have to suffer anymore. In January 1959, 16-year-old Diana Day Humphreys was committed to a psychiatric hospital in Austin, Texas for an indefinite amount of time. It's unknown what happened to her after she was committed to the hospital. Number 2. The Cars Louisville is a suburb of Dallas, Texas. Rita and Michael Carr and their three children, who were 14, 9, and 5, moved into a quiet street in the suburb at the end of August 2001. Their daughter, who was the eldest, and their two sons all had behavioral problems. In 1997, Michael filed for divorce. The following year, their daughter and their middle child set fire to their school. It only caused minor damage and no charges were laid. Michael and Rita later reconciled. Their daughter was emotionally disturbed and it appeared that her brothers were afraid of her. By the spring of 2002, she was two grades behind and she was attending an alternative school. She was a loner who didn't seem to care that she didn't have any friends. The middle car child had Tourette's syndrome. People often saw him staring into space and slap himself. Jackson Carr, the youngest, was quite adventurous according to his neighbors. He was often exploring dangerous areas like creeks and construction sites by himself. In the spring of 2002, Michael was working for a company that provided materials and services for people starting home-based businesses. Rita was an administrative assistant at a law firm. Over the course of four years, the Child Protective Services Agency had investigated the family three times to see if the children were being abused or neglected. The last visit was in March 2002 but no evidence of abuse or neglect was found. Rita was a devout member of a non-denominational church. She and the children attended church services three times a week. On April 15, 2002, the car's 10-year-old boy told his father that he and 6-year-old Jackson had been playing hide-and-seek and he couldn't find Jackson. The police were called and a massive search was launched. Firefighters and neighbors also joined in the search. About six hours into the search, police officers searched the family's home and they found something incriminating. What they found was never made public. The officers asked the car's 15-year-old daughter and 10-year-old son about the item. Then the 15-year-old girl admitted that she had killed her six-year-old brother and buried his body. She said she had planned the murder, dug the grave, and then asked him to play hide-and-seek. The ten-year-old boy admitted to holding his brother down while his sister killed him. The fifteen-year-old then led the police to a wooded area behind the family's home. Buried in about two feet of mud was the dead body of six-year-old Jackson Carr. An autopsy was performed. It was determined that Jackson had been suffocated and stabbed in the neck. 
The 15-year-old and the 10-year-old were arrested for the murder of their 6-year-old brother. The police declined to comment on the motive behind the murder. The court cases were closed to the public, so it's unclear what happened to the 15-year-old and the 10-year-old. A plea deal was offered to the 15-year-old girl, but the details of the plea deal were not made public. The 15-year-old girl's lawyer told the Dallas Morning News that a 25-year sentence seemed reasonable. She could have been sentenced up to 40 years in prison. In November 2002, the girl accepted the plea deal, but again, the details weren't made public. The boy's lawyer also tried to get a plea deal, but it's unknown if he did. If he were tried in the juvenile system, then the maximum he could have served would have been less than 11 years because he would have been released on his 21st birthday. The names of the two car children have never been released, so it's unknown where they are at the time of this video. At the time of this video, the eldest car child would be about 34 years old. If she had been sentenced to 25 years and she had to serve her whole sentence, she will be released from prison in 2027. The middle child would be about 29 at the time of this recording. If he were tried in juvenile court, he would have been released about 8 years ago. Number 1. Frank attack. In the summer of 1937, Cecilia attack had four children, 17-year-old Leo, 16-year-old Frank, 9-year-old Teresa, and 7-year-old Gordon. Cecilia was married to a man named Peter, who was a stepfather to the children. They lived in Buffalo, New York. On the night of August 22, 1937, 17-year-old Leo and 16-year-old Frank started arguing about who would go to the Civilian Conservation Corps camp. The Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC for short, was a work relief program. According to History.com, usually young men whose families were on government assistance attended the camps. They did things like battle forest fires, plant millions of trees, cleared and maintained access roads, reseeded grazing lands, and implemented soil erosion controls. The two brothers argued about who would go to the CCC camp until early the next morning. Leo then went to bed. While 17 year old Leo slept, Frank picked up an axe and hacked his brother several times in the head. He then dropped the axe beside the bed. A family member found Leo unconscious and bleeding to death in his bed. He was rushed to the hospital, but tragically, he died the next day. Frank was arrested and he admitted to killing his brother. He was convicted of manslaughter and he was sent to a reformatory in Elmira, New York. Frank spent about two years there and then he was paroled to the custody of his mother and stepfather. A year later, on July 5, 1939, Cecilia and Peter went out to a show at a local theater. 19-year-old Frank was left at home with his siblings, 11-year-old Teresa and 9-year-old Gordon. Shortly after 10.30 p.m., Frank walked into the police station and said that he had killed his siblings. He told the police where they could find their bodies. The police went to the family's flat and they found Teresa and Gordon's dead bodies in their beds. They both had been beaten to death with a hammer. On a windowsill in the kitchen was a basket. In the basket was a bloody hammer. On a table near the windowsill was a note that Teresa wrote. It was addressed to her mother and it asked her to wake her up when she got home from the show. Frank was arrested and he was asked why he killed the rest of his siblings. He claimed that his stepfather goaded him to do it. Several psychiatrists examined Frank in the lead up to his trial. Frank went to trial in December 1939. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. There is no record of what happened to him after the verdict but he was most likely committed to a psychiatric hospital.
number three, Alex Barani and David Anderson. On the morning of January 5th, 1997, two boys were playing in a park in Bellevue, a suburb of Seattle, Washington. They found the dead body of a young woman. They told their parents and the police were alerted. Officers came to the park and it was clear that the woman had been murdered. An electrical cord was wrapped around her neck. It was later confirmed that she had been strangled to death. She was fully clothed and there were no signs of sexual assault. The police found her identification on her. She was 20-year-old Kimberly Wilson and she lived a few blocks from where her body was found. The detectives went to her home dreading having to break the news to her family. When they got to her home, they found three cars parked in the driveway. They rang the doorbell and knocked on the door, but no one answered. The detective went around to the side of the house and found a sliding door. He knocked and again, no one answered. The door was unlocked, so he opened it. He called out and no one responded. He got a bad feeling, so he entered the house. Inside, he discovered a gruesome crime scene. In the master bedroom, he found two dead bodies. On the bed was the body of a woman who was later identified as 46-year-old Rose Wilson, Kimberly's mother. She had been stabbed in the neck and the head, and she had been bashed in the head with a blunt object. On the floor near the bed was the body of a man. He was Rose's husband and Kimberly's father, 52-year-old Angus Wilson. He had been stabbed in the neck, chest, and face, and a blunt object had crushed his skull. In another bedroom, the detectives found the dead body of 17-year-old Julia Wilson. Like her parents, she had been stabbed in the neck, chest, and head, and bludgeoned to death. The murder weapons were not found on the property. It's believed that the family was killed late on January 3rd or early on the 4th. It was a horrifying crime scene, even to the veteran detectives. It was baffling to them as to why anyone would want to kill the family. Julia was a quiet senior with a small group of close friends. She was excited because she had recently been accepted at Central Washington University. Angus was an accountant at a steel firm and Rose was the accounting supervisor at the University of Washington Library. Kimberly had recently graduated from high school and she joined AmeriCorps, which is a voluntary civil society program. She had been away in San Diego, California for basic training. She had just come home for the holidays. The Wilson family was well liked and they didn't have any enemies. They also weren't involved in any criminal activity. The police learned that Kimberly had some strange friends. Many of them were described as goths and they were obsessed with role playing games. They would often hang out on Saturday nights at Denny's. The police talked to Kimberly's friends and most of them said that dressing like a goth was their way of expressing themselves and the role playing games were fun. But there were two young men who seemed to take the games too far. They also talked about how they wanted to commit an actual murder. They were Alex Barani and David Anderson who were both 17. Alex and David were both high school dropouts. The police brought Alex in for questioning five days after the bodies were found. He admitted to killing the family. He said he had arranged to meet Kimberly in the park and he strangled her to death. He realized that Kimberly may have told her family whom she was going to meet, so he went over to their house to make sure they couldn't identify him. He was armed with a baseball bat and a combat knife. He said they attacked Rose first while she was sleeping. The attack woke up Angus, so he attacked him. Once Angus was dead, 
he turned his attention back to Rose and made sure she was dead. He then went to Julia's room and he killed her. Later in the interview, Alex said that he worked with an accomplice, but he wouldn't say who that accomplice was. He did say that his only real friend was David Anderson. Alex was asked why he slaughtered the family. Alex said that he felt like he was in a rut and he was becoming decadent. He also said that he wanted the opportunity to experience something truly phenomenal. The police interviewed David and he denied being involved in the murders. David, who lived with several roommates, said that he was home all night on the night of the murder. His roommates were questioned and they said that he wasn't home that night. The police searched David's room and they found some bloody boots. The DNA on the boots matched the Wilson's blood. David said that he didn't know Kimberly and he told the police that she was just Alex's friend. But in Kimberly's room, the police found a promissory note dated June 1996. The promissory note said that David was supposed to pay Kimberly $500 that he owed her by September 1996. Several people told the police that David was furious at Kimberly because she was bugging him to repay her. One person even said that he wanted to kill her. So less than a week after Alex was arrested, David was taken into custody as well. Alex went to trial in October 1998. The evidence against him was overwhelming. Not only had he confessed, but some items that belonged to the Wilsons were found in his home. Also, some of the Wilsons' blood was found on his shoes. The prosecution said that Alex was armed with a knife and David used the baseball bat. They started by attacking Rose. Then when Angus woke up, David attacked him with a bat and then Alex finished him off with a knife. Then they worked together to kill Julia. The jury deliberated for three hours before finding Alex guilty. In a jailhouse interview with the local newspaper, Alex said he wasn't surprised. He said, if I was the jury, I would have found me guilty too. In January 1999, Alex was given four consecutive life sentences without the chance of parole. A week after Alex was sentenced, David went to trial. His lawyer pointed out that no fingerprints or shoe prints could link him to the crime scene. The jury deliberated for seven days. The trial ultimately ended in a hung jury, with one juror refusing to vote to convict. David went to trial again in October 1999. The trial lasted three months. This time, the jury deliberated for six hours. They found David Anderson guilty. Like his best friend, David was sentenced to four consecutive life sentences. Alex Brody is serving a sentence at the Clallam Bay Correction Center in Clallam Bay, Washington. David Anderson is serving a sentence at the Monroe Correctional Complex in Monroe, Washington. At the time of this video, they are both 42 years old. Unless their sentences are commuted, both men will most likely die in prison. Number 2. The Murder of Anthony Darnell Wilson Floyd is a town in a small city in southern Wisconsin. The town and the city are adjacent to each other. In the mid-1980s, the town had a population of about 7,000 people and the city's population was about 35,000. Nine-year-old Anthony Darnell Wilson lived in the city with his mother and stepfather, but he spent a lot of time at his grandparents who lived in the town. Anthony was smaller than many children his age, and he didn't excel at sports. Anthony loved his dirt bike, and he was very protective of it. He had recently started riding it again, because he had been waiting six months for parts. 
On the evening of July 26, 1985, Anthony was visiting his grandparents. He went out riding his bike. When his grandfather returned home from work that evening, he saw that the TV in the room where Anthony slept was on, so he thought that Anthony was home. The next morning, his grandparents realized he was missing. At 9.20 a.m., his grandmother found his body in a neighbor's garden. She initially thought he had become so exhausted that he simply fell asleep. But tragically, he had been brutally murdered. Anthony had been stabbed 14 times in the chest, neck, and shoulders. There was also a shallow stab wound on his back. He had also been struck three or four times in the head with something like a meat cleaver or a hatchet. He also had a chop wound on his left arm, which most likely came from defending himself. His pants and underpants were pulled down around his knees, and his shirt was pulled up around his armpits. About eight feet from his body was a butcher knife. Another kitchen knife was found about 50 feet away. Whatever weapon caused the chopping injuries was not found. An investigation was launched and the police found a witness. It was Anthony's five-year-old cousin. She claimed that three teenage boys, two who were white and one who was mixed race, attacked Anthony. Anthony screamed three times, don't do it, and they fell to the ground. She said that all three boys took turns stabbing him. The murder shocked the people of Wisconsin, but no one was prepared for what happened next. On July 31st, four days after the body was found, the police made several arrests. They arrested a 14-year-old boy, a 12-year-old boy, and an 11-year-old girl. The girl was so young that she couldn't be charged with any crimes. The 14-year-old boy and the 11-year-old girl were residents of the town, and the 12-year-old boy was from Detroit. He was in town visiting relatives. The 12-year-old boy's relative's home was searched. A bloody t-shirt and two pairs of bloody shoes, one belonging to the 12-year-old and one belonging to the 14-year-old, were found in the home. The police surmised that Anthony was murdered over his dirt bike. About five hours before the murder, the 11-year-old girl asked to ride his dirt bike, and he said no. She ended up stabbing him in the back with a sharpened stick. The police believe that hours later, she and the two boys swarmed Anthony and killed him. The families of the children who were arrested had significant problems with the case against them. The first was the reliability of the five-year-old witness. She didn't even understand the concept of death and kept asking when she would see Anthony again. She said that the killers were teenage boys, two white and one mixed race. Yet, all three children they arrested were black. The 12-year-old's relatives explained that the blood on the shoes and the shirt was from a bloody nose. The blood was tested and the results were inconclusive. Also, the families thought that since Anthony's pants had been pulled down and his shirt was pulled up, it was a sex crime which was probably committed by an older killer. However, besides his genitals being exposed, there were no signs of sexual assault. The police also learned that one of the children liked to torment other children by pulling their pants down. The 14-year-old boy went to trial first in September 1987. His lawyer claimed that the boy merely witnessed the murder and he wasn't involved. The detectives who interviewed the 14-year-old boy say he knew too much about the murder to have just been a witness. The detective testified that based on the statements from all three children, the 12-year-old boy and the 11-year-old girl were teasing Anthony. They took his money and candy and kept pushing him to the ground. Anthony said he was going to go tell his grandmother. The detective said that the 14-year-old boy told him that the 11-year-old girl went to her home and got a knife. Earlier that day, she had brought out a knife and she picked that up as well. 
Then she and the 12-year-old boy attacked Anthony with the knives. The 14-year-old boy told the detective that the 12-year-old and the 11-year-old hit Anthony in the head with a hatchet, but he later called the hatchet a bar. Anthony's 5-year-old cousin, who supposedly witnessed the murder, testified. She said that she only saw the 14-year-old stomp on Anthony's chest. The trial lasted four days. The jury deliberated for just five hours. They found the 14-year-old boy delinquent of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to a reform school for a year and then his case would be reviewed. His sentence could be renewed for a year every year until he turned 19. When Anthony's grandmother, who found the body, learned about the verdict, she had a stroke. Tragically, she died the next morning. In December 1986, the 11-year-old girl went to trial. She couldn't be sent to a juvenile detention center or a reform school because she was too young. Her trial was to see if she would be placed in protective custody, foster care, or receive some type of treatment. The 11-year-old girl testified on her own behalf and she said she had nothing to do with the murder. Anthony's five-year-old cousin testified against her and she said that she saw her stab Anthony several times. The trial lasted about two weeks. Then the jury deliberated for six hours and 15 minutes. They concluded she was a party to the murder. She was ordered to undergo treatment at a psychiatric hospital. The 12-year-old boy from Detroit went to trial in July 1986. By then, he was 13 years old. This time, the defense had a new theory. His lawyer argued that all the children were innocent and the real killer was a relative of the 14-year-old boy. The lawyer said that the relative possibly committed the murder in a drug-induced frenzy. The lawyer claimed that family members actively covered up the relative's involvement in the murder. The lawyer said that the family members thought it would be better if the kids took the rap for the murder because they would only serve a few years in something like a reform school. Whereas if the relative were to be convicted, he would have been sentenced to life in prison. The jury deliberated for 12 hours. The jury found the young boy from Detroit delinquent to first degree murder as well. He was sent to a reform school where his case would be reviewed every year. He would be released when he was 19 years old. Lawyers for all three children appealed the convictions. The lawyer for the oldest boy argued that he should not have been interrogated for nine hours by the police. The Court of Appeals agreed and in February 1986 they granted him a new trial. In August 1987, the boy shocked everyone when he changed his plea from innocent to no contest. He said that he acted alone when he murdered Anthony. He claimed that Anthony exposed himself and started rubbing him. He said he slapped him and then choked him. But he never admitted to stabbing or hitting Anthony in the head. A few weeks after the oldest boy confessed, the other boy and the girl were released and they were sent home to await the decisions on their appeals. On September 21st, 1987, the oldest boy was again sentenced to a year at a reform school and every year his sentence would be reviewed. At his sentencing hearing, he had a new story about what happened to Anthony. It was his eighth version of events. Once again, he said that Anthony exposed himself and started rubbing him, so he beat him up. This time, he said that someone else hit Anthony with an axe while he was lying in the garden, but he didn't know who hit him with the axe. The district attorney said that they believed an adult was with the three children when the murder was committed. But the district attorney did not name the adult and he did not say if any charges would be brought against him or her. Both the younger boy from Detroit and the girl requested new trials based on the older boy's confession. In October 1987, 
The boy from Detroit was granted a new hearing, but the district attorney opposed it. The district attorney requested the judge reconsider the decision, and the judge agreed. In July 1988, the girl was denied a new trial, and she was returned to the treatment center. Later that year, she was released on parole. In February 1989, it was finally decided that the boy from Detroit would get a new trial. But in June 1989, the prosecutor said he would not retry the boy. The district attorney was not convinced that they would get a conviction and since the boy had been out of reform school for over a year and had not caused any trouble, he doubted that the judge would give him a severe sentence. The oldest boy was released from the reform school in August 1989 after serving four years. He had to be released because he would be turning 19 before he could serve another full year term. The names of the three children have never been released and their current whereabouts are unknown. Several people believe that the children are innocent and their arrests and convictions were the result of residents wanting fast results and the national media's obsession with violent children. They think that an adult committed the murder and got away with it at the expense of the three children. But other people think it was just a tragic case of kids killing kids. Number 1. Sandy Charles and William Martin LaRange is a small town in northern Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is a province in Canada's prairies. LaRange is about 365 miles from the capital of Saskatchewan, Regina. It's on the shores of Lake LaRange and it's an arboreal forest. It was a fur trading outpost but in the mid-1990s it was a mining center. In the mid-1990s it had a population of about 5,500 people. In July 1995 it was home to seven-year-old Jonathan George Thimpson. Jonathan was a playful and outgoing boy who loved The Lion King and Zorro. Jonathan sometimes stayed with his mother and other times he stayed with his grandmother. His father was no longer in the picture. His grandmother last saw him on the morning of July 8, 1995. On the night of July 9th, Jonathan's mother and grandmother happened to run into each other and they realized that neither of them had seen Jonathan since early the day before. They immediately reported him missing. But the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, also known as the RCMP, didn't start an immediate search. It wasn't until the next morning that search groups were formed. The RCMP also conducted interviews with people in the neighborhood. They learned that Jonathan was last seen with his 7-year-old cousin, William Martin, and William's 14-year-old neighbor, Sandy Charles. Shortly after the searches began, Jonathan's body was found in a wooded area not far from his house. His murder had been brutal. He had been stabbed six times in the head with a paring knife. One of the stabs cut his jugular vein. The blade of the paring knife was in his left eye socket. The handle of the paring knife had broken off. Jonathan had also been bludgeoned several times with a small object and he was struck on the head with something much heavier. After he was dead, 10 to 15 strips of flesh were cut off his body. It appeared that Jonathan was killed somewhere else and then dumped there. The police searched the area and a few hundred feet away, they found the spot where he was murdered. They found a bloody paring knife handle, a smashed beer bottle, and a bloody 11 pound rock in that area. The police interviewed 14 year old Sandy Charles and 7 year old William Martin. During the interview, they learned about Sandy's background. When Sandy was born, his mother was 17 years old. 
His father left his mother soon after she got pregnant. When Sandy was three, his father was killed when a drunk driver ran him over. His mother went on to have two more children, a boy and a girl, with two different men. Neither man stuck around long. Sandy's mother was often out of the house working, and Sandy babysat from a young age. Sandy said he first started hearing voices in his head when he was three years old. Despite his problems, Sandy was considered a good kid, and he was a solid student. When he became a teenager, he became obsessed with the occult and Satanism. At some point, Sandy saw the movie Warlock, which was released in North America in 1991. He became obsessed with the film and watched it dozens of times. In the film, a warlock is captured in 1691 by a witch hunter. Before the warlock is executed, Satan opens a portal and the warlock escapes through it with the witch hunter in hot pursuit. They both end up in Los Angeles, California in the late 1980s. Once there, the warlock continues his goal of becoming the Antichrist. He wants to fly, and to do that, he needs a potion that contains the rendered fat of an unbaptized baby boy. So he kills an unbaptized baby boy, and then renders the fat in a soup can and uses it in the potion. Not long after Sandy and William were taken into custody, they confessed to murdering Jonathan. Sandy told the detectives that he believed that Satan came to Earth every thousand years. He wanted to be a disciple of Satan, so he decided to do something to get into his good graces. About a week before the murder, Sandy and William watched the movie Warlock together. They loved the idea of creating a potion that would give them the ability to fly. William chose his cousin, Jonathan, to be the sacrifice. On July 8th, they hid a paring knife in a field near their homes. Then they asked Jonathan to come over and play baseball. When Sandy hit a baseball close to where the knife was hidden, they asked Jonathan to go find it. Once he was in the area, they tackled him. First, Sandy tried to break his neck, but that didn't work. Then Sandy got the knife and stabbed Jonathan while William cheered him on. William screamed, You deserve it, Jonathan. After the knife broke, William handed Sandy a beer bottle. Sandy struck Jonathan in the head with it several times and then it broke. But Jonathan still wasn't dead. So they looked around for something else to use and William found an 11 pound rock. Sandy picked it up over his head and dropped it on Jonathan's head. Somehow the 7 year old boy was still breathing. So Sandy put his hand over his mouth and nose until he stopped breathing. Sandy then had William fetch him a towel. William ran and got him one. Then Sandy gave William his bloody t-shirt and William balled it up and hid it under his shirt. Then they went to Sandy's home and Sandy washed up. Then William reminded him that they needed the flesh for the potion. So Sandy got some tongs from his kitchen and another knife. They went out to the body and Sandy cut some strips of flesh off. He then went to his kitchen and rendered the fat into a soup can on the stove using tin foil. Sandy told the detectives he never planned to consume any of the fat. The next day William told Sandy that they should move the body further away from their homes. So Sandy dragged the body to an area William had picked out. The police searched Sandy's home and they found some bloody clothes, a bloody knife, and some bloody tongs. They also found a soup can with what looked like rendered fat in it. Sandy Charles was arrested on July 13th, five days after the murder. William Martin was not arrested because he was only seven years old and the age of criminal responsibility in Canada is 12. When the murder happened, Sandy Charles was three days past his 14th birthday. 
Nevertheless, it was decided he be tried as an adult. Sidney Charles went to trial in June 1996. He pleaded not guilty due to mental incapacity. His lawyer argued that his mental health problems, along with his belief in the occult and the supernatural, and his fascination with horror movies, made him delusional and he could not tell the difference between fantasy and real life. His lawyer also argued that seven-year-old William Martin was the ringleader. William chose his cousin as the victim and he encouraged Sandy at every step of the murder. Apparently, William smiled as he watched his cousin be brutally murdered. Sandy's lawyer said that Sandy never planned on eating any of the body. But William wanted to eat the heart and the rendered fat because he thought it would give him superpowers. The trial lasted a month and a half. The judge ultimately ruled that Sandy was not guilty due to mental incapacity. He was ordered to go to a psychiatric hospital until he was no longer a danger to society. At the time of this video, 40-year-old Sandy Charles is still hospitalized in Saskatchewan. He has been institutionalized for 25 years. He hopes one day to be released. It is unknown what happened to William Martin after the murder. His current whereabouts are unknown. Number 3. Scott Turland Shelby County is in central Alabama and it is home to about a quarter million people. In early 2001, the Turland family lived there. Nathan Turland was 17 years old and he was the eldest of the Turland children. He was a solid student with a 3.02 GPA. He was a star athlete on his high school's basketball team. He was also a popular kid who made friends easily. After high school, Nathan planned on attending the University of Idaho on a partial basketball scholarship. Nathan's 15-year-old brother, Scott, was considered the opposite of his brother. Scott had a hard time in school, he had mental health problems, and he experimented with hard drugs. But he was still known to be friendly, helpful, and outgoing. To many people who knew them, the two brothers had clearly defined roles. Nathan was the golden boy, and Scott was the black sheep. On the night of February 10, 2001, 17-year-old Nathan and 15-year-old Scott were at home, and their parents were out. Apparently, they got into a fight over the remote control, and things escalated quickly. In the foyer of their home, Scott shot Nathan in the abdomen. He then stabbed his older brother 26 times. Once he killed his brother, he used a front-end loader on a tractor and moved his body to a pit that they used for burning garbage that was about 150 yards from the house. He then put some dirt on him. Not long afterward, their parents returned home and found the house splattered with blood. Scott got into his family's Chevrolet Suburban and took off. The police pursued him. After about an hour, they shot at the tires. Then 15-year-old Scott Turlin was arrested. His brother's body was recovered from the pit. In December 2001, Scott Turlin pleaded guilty to murder. Even though he was just 15 at the time of the murder, he was sentenced as an adult. He was given 25 years in prison. After the murder, Scott's parents disowned him. They sold their house and moved to a different state. In 2006, five years after Scott pleaded guilty, he tried to have his conviction excused. He claimed he only committed the murder because he was using Neurotin, an anti-epileptic drug produced by Pfizer. He said he was wrongly prescribed the drug to treat his bipolar disorder. The side effects of the drug include depression, thought disorders, and anger. He said that these side effects led to Nathan's murder. The judge ultimately denied the request to have the plea excused. In April 2015, 29-year-old Scott Turlin was serving a sentence 
at the Stagg Correctional Facility in Elmore, Alabama. He had served about 14 years of his sentence. On April 15, 2015, he was stabbed to death by a fellow inmate, 29-year-old Edward Doe. Doe was serving a 25-year sentence for robbery. After Scott was murdered, his parents refused to claim his body. So he was going to be buried in a pauper's grave on the prison grounds. Shelby County Chief Probation Officer John Miller got to know Scott when he was in the juvenile system before he was transferred to an adult facility. Miller claimed the body and arranged to be buried in a public cemetery. Another person donated a grave marker. In November 2018, Edward Doe was sentenced to an additional 25 years for murdering Scott Turlin. He is currently serving a sentence at the William E. Donaldson Correctional Facility in Vesemer, Alabama. Number 2. Patricia Kirk In the early 1960s, the Kirk family lived in a mobile home in Walton, New York. Walton is a village in the Catskills Mountains. At the time, it had a population of about 3,800 people. In the summer of 1961, Wesley and Sadie Kirk had three children, five-and-a-half-year-old Patricia, Wesley Jr., who was three-and-a-half years old, and Lois, who was nearly two years old. On the morning of July 18, 1961, Sadie woke up and noticed that their youngest child, Lois, was missing. She asked Patricia where Lois was, and she said she was in the bushes. Wesley Sr., Sadie, and some neighbors began searching for Lois. In a shed, one of the neighbors came across what looked like a pile of blankets. She removed the blankets, and under them, she found a suitcase covering a 20-gallon earthenware crock. She found Lois in the crock. She was alive and unharmed. She had been in there for about two hours. Patricia had either helped or placed her in the crock. Weeks later, on August 1st, 1961, Lois turned two. Five days later, on August 6th, Sadie got up and saw Wesley Jr. and Patricia playing. She went to check the bed where the three children slept. Lois was still in bed. Sadie tried to rouse her, but she wouldn't wake up. So Lois was rushed to the hospital. Tragically, the two-year-old was pronounced dead hours later at 6.15 p.m. Initially, the police thought she may have overdosed on sleeping pills. But a toxicology report showed that she had not ingested anything that could have killed her. The autopsy revealed she had died from several blows to the head. Sadie and Wesley Sr. told the police about the earlier incident involving the croc. They also said that Patricia tended to be jealous of her sister and she got annoyed by Lois's crying. Sadie and Wesley asked Patricia, who was five and a half years old, if she had done anything to Lois, but she refused to talk to her parents. So Patricia's step-grandmother was brought in to talk to her. Patricia told her that Lois wouldn't go to sleep, so she spanked her, and then she stopped crying. Five-year-old Patricia then said she hit two-year-old Lois with a toilet seat lid, which she called a pretty stick. Lois's death was ruled a homicide. However, at the time, New York state law said that no one under the age of seven could commit a crime. It was determined that Patricia should be sent to a state facility. The district attorney said that Patricia had a wild imagination and she was very mixed up emotionally. He said that at the state facility, she would get proper care. Her parents were charged with neglect. However, the results of those charges are unknown. It is also unknown what happened to Patricia Kirk. If she is still alive today, she would be about 65 years old. Number 1. Paris Bennett In February 2007, Charity Lee and her two children, 13-year-old Paris Bennett and 4-year-old Ella Bennett, lived in Abilene, Texas. 
When Charity was 17 years old, she was a heroin addict, but she managed to get clean. After about a year of sobriety, she was miserable and she thought about overdosing to end her life. But then she found out she was pregnant with Paris and she said it saved her life. Paris was a smart young man. He was tested and his IQ was 141. Ella was a loving and adorably bossy little girl. She had a huge personality and a small body. Whenever one of her friends got into a fight with their parents, she wanted to adopt them. Unfortunately, Paris also had a history of mental health problems and odd behavior. For example, he would bang his head against the wall until it bled. In the fall of 2006, Paris tried to stab Charity. She ended up putting him in a psychiatric hospital. The doctor told Charity that Paris had homicidal tendencies. But Charity decided not to keep Paris in treatment, so in November 2006, she pulled him out of the hospital and brought him home. She said she does not regret the choice because she does not feel Paris would have gotten the help he needed. In February 2007, Charity was working as a server at a Buffalo Wild Wings restaurant. On February 4th, 2007, the Indianapolis Colts were playing the Chicago Bears in Super Bowl 41. Charity had to work that evening. So she left Paris and Ella at home with a babysitter. Around midnight, the police came to the restaurant and Charity was called to the manager's office. She was told that her four-year-old daughter, Ella, was dead and that her son, Paris, was in custody. While Paris was in custody, he was honest about what happened that night. One thing that the police noted was that Paris would cry, but he didn't shed any tears. Paris told the police that he, Ella, and the babysitter watched a movie after dinner. When the movie was over, Ella was put to bed. Paris told the babysitter that he was going to do some homework in his bedroom. He convinced the babysitter to go home, so she left. Shortly after she left, 13-year-old Paris went into the kitchen and picked up a knife. He went into Ella's bedroom. First, he sexually assaulted her. Then he stabbed his 4-year-old sister 17 times. After killing his sister, Paris called a school friend and they talked for about 6 minutes. At 11.43 p.m., Paris called 911 and he sounded emotional. Paris told the dispatcher he had accidentally killed someone. The dispatcher didn't hear him correctly and asked him if he said he thought he had killed someone. Very firmly, Paris said he knew he had killed someone. He told the dispatcher that he had killed his sister. The dispatcher told him to give her CPR and advised him on how to do it. At first, Paris hesitated, but then he started counting to 30. The lead detective does not believe that Paris gave her CPR. Ella had been killed on the bed, but when the police came, she was on the floor. There was not much blood on the floor. Had he given her CPR, there would have been a lot more blood on the floor. Paris was asked why he killed his sister. He had always seemed like a loving older brother. He said that he was angry at his mother. She had relapsed into drug addiction after 12 years of sobriety. About a year earlier, Charity had started using cocaine. Paris said that he wanted to kill his mother as well. But after killing Ella, he realized that committing a murder was more challenging than he thought. He also wanted his mother to suffer. Paris thought that if he killed her, her suffering would only last about 15 minutes or so. But living in the wake of her child's death would mean a lifetime of suffering. After Paris was arrested, Charity found notes that he had written that indicated he was obsessed with shootings, murder, and suicide. Paris Bennett pleaded guilty to capital murder six months after he killed his sister. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. 
He served his first five years at Texas Juvenile Justice's Kidding State School. When he was 19, he was transferred to the Ferguson Unit in Midway, Texas. At the time of this video, Paris Bennett is 28 years old. He'll probably be able to apply for parole in February 2027 when he's 33 years old. In 2012, Charity gave birth to another son, Phoenix. She allows Phoenix to talk to his half-brother, Paris, on the phone. Charity also visits Paris in prison. The psychiatrist talked to Charity and told her that Paris was a psychopath. He also had some advice for Charity. He told her to change her name and move out of state before Paris was released. Charity has admitted that she's afraid that Paris might hurt her or Phoenix if he's paroled in 2027. Number 3. John Duncan, Emmanuel Sanchez Wenatchee is a small city in Washington State. In the mid-1990s, it was home to about 25,000 people. In the summer of 1994, it was home to John Duncan and Emmanuel Sanchez, who were both 12 years old. Both boys had behavioral problems. Sanchez's problems started about four years earlier after his mother had brain surgery to remove a tumor. The surgery left her partially paralyzed. His mother said it changed him the first time he saw her face drooping. After that, he started acting out. Between the ages of 10 and 12, Sanchez was in and out of foster homes. In spring 1994, he was transferred to a new school. But then he was expelled because he brought a pellet gun to school and threatened a teacher and several students. In August 1994, Sanchez was living with his mother. But around August 10th, he ran away. On August 19th, Manuel Sanchez and John Duncan tried to break into a neighbor's home. They cut the phone line, removed the motion sensing lights, and broke a basement window. But they were stopped before they got into the house. The two 12 year olds ran away from the scene. They went to a friend's home the next day and stole three handguns. Then they went to the banks of the Columbia River and started firing the guns into the river. Camping near the river was 50 year old seasonal worker Emilio Pernetta. Pernetta screamed at the boys to stop shooting so they started firing their guns at him. Pernetta responded by throwing rocks at the two boys. Sanchez was hit in the chin and it caused him to bleed. They continued to shoot at Pernetta until he fell to the ground. Then the two boys ran up the embankment where they had more ammunition stored. Sanchez said, I'm not leaving until this guy is dead. Duncan said he'd take care of it. Duncan took two guns and he went down to the riverbank. He saw Pernetta lying on the riverbank and he was bleeding from two wounds. He wasn't moving and Duncan thought he was dead. Duncan later said, I shot Manuel's gun until it was empty. My first shot hit him in the eye and it was sick, so I closed my eyes and shot him more. The sounds of the gunshots caught the attention of someone who called the police. When John Duncan walked back up the embankment, the police were waiting for him. Both he and Manuel Sanchez were arrested. 50-year-old Emilio Pernetta was found dead in the water. The medical examiner determined they had been shot at least 18 times. The police asked Duncan why he returned to the riverbank and continued to shoot him. He said, I wanted to shoot him. I was mad at him for hitting my best and only friend with a rock. The two boys were tried separately in January 1995 in juvenile court. They were both found guilty of first degree murder. They were sentenced to a juvenile detention center until the age of 21. This means they would have been released in 2004. 
What happened to them after they were released is unknown. John Duncan and Emmanuel Sanchez would both be about 40 years old at the time of this video. Number 2. Demarquis Hawkins and Dominic Lang In March 2013, Sherry West was living in Brunswick, Georgia with her 13-month-old son, Antonio Santiago. Antonio was born on February 7, 2012. Sherry considered him her miracle baby. Four years earlier, in New Jersey, her 18-year-old son was in a fight. He pulled out a knife but was wrestled away from him. My son ended up being stabbed to death. The man who killed him wasn't charged because it was determined that he was acting in self-defense. Wes had been permanently injured in a car accident a few years earlier. She also suffered from mental illness and she was on medication. On the morning of March 21, 2013, Wes took Antonio for a walk to the post office. She was pushing him in his stroller. As she was walking back home, she was confronted by two teen boys. One was armed with a handgun. The two teen boys demanded her money, and she said she didn't have any. The boy with the gun aimed it at Antonio, and he said he would shoot at last she handed over her purse. He then started counting down for five. When he got to two, West stopped him. The teen boy tried to wrestle the purse away from her, but he couldn't. So he started counting down for five again. When he finished counting, he fired a warning shot at the ground. Then he shot Wes to the right thigh. Then he aimed the gun at Antonio in the stroller. About six inches away from his face, he pulled the trigger. The bullet went right between his eyes and he died nearly instantly. Antonio Santiago was just six weeks past his first birthday. After firing off the deadly shot, the two teen boys ran off. Sherry West was taken to the hospital and she was treated for her wound. She survived her wound. The next morning, West looked at several photo lineups. She identified the shooter. He was 17-year-old DeMarquis Alkins. The police then identified his accomplice, 15-year-old Dominic Lang. They were arrested the day after the murder. They were both charged with first-degree murder. A few days after they were arrested, the police went to Alkins' mother's home. Alkins' mother and aunt tried providing Alkins with an alibi for the time of the murder. But the police determined they were lying, so they were arrested. They eventually gave statements that led the police to search a saltwater pond. In the pond, they found a 22 caliber handgun. Testing proved it was the murder weapon. After Elkins and Lang were arrested, the pastor of a church, Reverend Wilfredo Calix Flores, contacted the police. Eleven days before Antonio was murdered, he was outside of his church. Three teen boys came up and one was armed with a gun. They told him to hand over his wallet and his phone. Calix Flores refused and one of the young men shot him in the left arm. The bullet went through his arm and grazed his chest. After shooting him, the three teen boys ran off. Calix Flores called 911 and they went to the steps of the church where he prayed. He survived his injury. He said that the Marquis Salkins was the person who shot him. Salkins went to trial for the murder of Antonio Santiago in August 2013. Dominic Lang made a plea deal and he testified against Salkins. The trial lasted for two weeks. Then the jury deliberated for two hours. Elkins was found guilty of murder. Since he was under 18 at the time of the murder, he was not eligible for the death penalty. Instead, he was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. 
In April 2015, Dominic Lang pleaded guilty to armed robbery. He was sentenced to two years of prison and eight years of probation. When he pleaded guilty, he had already served two years, so he was released based on time served. At the time of this video, the Marquis Alkins is 27 years old. He is serving a sentence at the Macon State Prison. Number 1. Omir Nidham, Richard Capo, Jeffrey P., Amanda G., and Christian G. In the autumn of 1998, 13-year-old Zong Vang was living with his family in Green Bay, Wisconsin. On the evening of September 23, 1998, Zong's older brother made dinner, but he needed some tomatoes. The sun was still up, so Zong's brother asked him to ride his bike to a nearby grocery store. Zong got on his bike, rode to the store, and bought the tomatoes. But, for some reason, on his way home, he stopped at the parking garage at St. Vincent Hospital. A man was driving out of the parking garage when he heard what sounded like a wet bag of cement hitting the concrete. He saw the body of a young boy lying in the driveway. It was 13-year-old Song Bang. The man got out of his car and told the parking attendant to call 911. By the time the man got to Zong, an off-duty nurse was attempting to help him. The man gave the nurse his shirt to help stem the bleeding from the back of Zong's head. Before Zong was moved into the hospital, a police officer drew a chalk outline around his body. He was then moved into the hospital. But tragically, 13-year-old Zong Bang died from head injuries. The police determined that, based on where his body was found, he hadn't accidentally fallen. His body landed too far away from the building. His family also was adamant that he was not suicidal. So the police believed that he was thrown from the top of the five-story parking garage. But why would someone want to kill the 13-year-old boy? No arrests were made in the case in the days or weeks after the murder. Then, months later, in the spring of 1999, 14-year-old Richard Capro was arrested for car theft and burglary. In custody, he started to make some incriminating comments about the death of Song Bang. After some questioning, Capro told the police what happened that fateful day in September. Capro said he was angry with his mother and he wanted to fight someone or see a fight. He was hanging out with his friends. 14-year-old Omir Ninham, 13-year-old Jeffrey P., 14-year-old Amanda G., and 14-year-old Christian J. The last names of the three youths were not made public. They were hanging outside the parking garage when they saw a song ride up on his bike. He was a complete stranger to them. Capro said let's mess with him and Ninham told him he had his back. Capro and Ninham taunted Zong while the other three encouraged them. Kripo pulled Zong's bike away from him. Zong demanded it back, and then Ninham punched him in the face. The punch knocked Zong to the ground. Zong got to his feet and then ran into the parking garage. The three teenage boys and two girls chased him. They caught him on the fifth floor. Zong begged to be left alone. He wanted to know why they wanted to hurt him. Kripo and Ninham started pushing him and then Ninham punched him in the chest. Ninham grabbed Zong by the wrist and pinned him against the wall. While he couldn't defend himself, Kripo punched him in the face. Then Kripo grabbed Zong by the ankles. With Ninham holding Zong by his wrist and Kripo holding him by his ankles, they started swinging Zong over the parking garage wall. Zong was obviously terrified and begged for them to stop. One of the three kids watching encouraged them to drop him over the wall. Another one of them said, wouldn't it be funny if he fell? As they were swinging him, Kripo said to drop him. Kripo said that Zong just sailed over the wall. He plummeted 45 feet to his death. 
Song screamed all the way down. On June 11, 1999, about nine months after the murder, Kripo and Ninham were arrested for the murder. They were both charged as adults, even though they were just 13 and 14 when the murder was committed. The other three teenagers were not arrested. Frederick Kripo went to trial first in November 1999. The trial lasted a week, and the jury deliberated for less than three hours. He was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide and physical abuse of a child. In January 2000, he was sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole after 50 years. Amir Nidham went to trial in March 2000. Like her post trial, it lasted a week and the jury deliberated for less than three hours. He was also found guilty. On January 29th, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. In January 2016, the United States Supreme Court ruled that mandatory life sentences without parole for people who committed crimes under the age of 18 were unconstitutional. Ninam's lawyers appealed to get him a new sentencing hearing. In October 2016, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled that he would not get a new trial. They said it was because his life without parole sentence was discretionary and not mandatory. So, unless something changes, Omar Ninham will die in prison. He is currently 38 years old. Richard Capro is 37 years old and he could be paroled in 2050 when he will be 65 years old. Number 3. Tyasia Jackson In the fall of 2012, Tyasia Jackson lived in DeKalb County, Georgia with her mother, Hanefa Ray, her stepfather, Shelton Ray, and her four younger siblings. On November 12, 2012, Tyasia was babysitting her four siblings. That afternoon, the neighbor across the road, Veronica Hillman, who also worked with Hanefa, called Hanefa at work. She had been watching the family's house and saw that Tyasia had let a boy inside. Hanefa asked Hillman to get the boy to leave. Hillman went over and found the boy hiding in a closet. She then had the boy leave. A short time later, Tyasia called Shelton. She told him that two-year-old Sasha was missing. Sasha was Tyasha's half-sister and Shelton's daughter. Sasha was known as a sassy and outgoing girl who often acted older than she actually was. She was also very protective of her loved ones. She was lovingly given the nickname Grandma. Tyasha said that she thought that Hillman took Sasha. Shelton and Hanefa rushed home. The family, along with Hillman, searched for the missing two-year-old. Hillman found Sasha in a wooded area adjacent to the family's house. She was lying on the ground, bleeding. Hillman called out to Shelton and Hanefa. Shelton picked up his two-year-old daughter and then tried to rush her to the hospital. Shelton said that she died in his arms before they even left the neighborhood. Initially, Shelton and Hanefa thought that a dog had attacked Sasha. But the medical examiner determined that she had been stabbed seven times in the chest with a kitchen knife. 13-year-old Tyasha was brought to the police station and questioned. Initially, she said she had nothing to do with the murder. But later that night, she called her stepfather and confessed. She said she had ordered her other siblings to go upstairs. She took Sasha to the back door and grabbed a kitchen knife along the way. She stabbed Sasha seven times outside, close to the back door. She then carried her to the wooded area and dumped the toddler. She came back home, changed her clothes, and washed up. 
She said she had not been in her right mind. She didn't give any other motive other than saying that she didn't want Sasha to say anything about the boy being in their house. A psychiatrist evaluated Taisha to determine that she could be rehabilitated. Taisha's lawyer said that her actions were the result of a brief mental break. In September 2013, Taisha was offered a plea deal that would have given her 10 years in prison if she pleaded guilty to manslaughter. If she went to trial and was convicted of secondary murder, she was looking at a mandatory 30-year sentence. She turned down the offer. In December 2013, she accepted a new plea deal. She was to serve eight years in prison with four years of probation. Taisha would have been released from prison around 2021 and will be on probation until 2025. Taisha's mother and stepfather supported her during her criminal proceedings. They told her they loved her as she was being taken away to prison. Sheldon said he felt partially responsible for what happened. He thinks that they might put too much pressure on the young teen girl. Sheldon urged parents to make sure their kids were not overwhelmed. Number 2. Kevin Pimentel In spring 2015, 38-year-old Helen Cambachero lived in a trailer park in Hudson, Florida with her four sons. Hudson is about 45 miles north of Tampa, Florida. Helen and the boy's father had divorced about two years earlier. The four boys were well-behaved and played sports. Neither the police nor child welfare officials had ever been called to the family's home. Helen had to work two jobs to make ends meet and support her family. On the evening of March 25th, 2015, she was working at one of her jobs. Her three youngest sons, 16-year-old Trevor Pimentel, 12-year-old Kevin Pimentel, and 6-year-old Brady Pimentel, were all left home to cook dinner for themselves. By all accounts, the evening was an ordinary one. 12-year-old Kevin started preparing fish sticks in the kitchen. He called out to his older brother, 16-year-old Trevor, to come and help him. Supposedly, there was some argument over the food. Kevin left the kitchen, and Trevor continued to prepare dinner. Suddenly, the sound of a gunshot shattered the quiet of the night. Trevor went to see what happened and found his 6-year-old brother, Brady, dead from a gunshot wound. Kevin was holding a 38 caliber handgun that his mother owned for protection. Kevin walked towards Trevor and then Trevor pushed him. Kevin fired the gun at Trevor and shot him in the leg. Then Kevin turned the gun on himself and fatally shot himself. Trevor then called 911. Trevor was taken to the hospital and survived his wound. The sheriff's deputies were shocked by the scene. Later, at a press conference, the sheriff said that the deputies at the scene were scarred because of what they saw. The police looked through Kevin's computer files and journal for a motive, but they found nothing to explain why he killed his six-year-old brother, shot his other brother, and then took his own life. Kevin was described as a quiet and highly intelligent kid who liked playing on his iPad. The boy's father, Lewis, thought that Kevin might have been jealous of Brady. After the divorce, Kevin pulled away from his father and his father grew closer to Brady. But this is only speculation and only Kevin knows why he did what he did on that fateful night. Number 1. Jane Shushko Elmira is a small city in New York's southern tier. It's a short distance from the Pennsylvania border. In the summer of 1959, it was home to 46,000 people, including the Shushko family. 
Michael and Lillian Shushko had 10 children who ranged in age from 14 to 11 months old. On the night of July 11, 1959, the eldest Shushko child, 14-year-old Jane, was sitting on the front porch with Lillian. Michael was working at a milk processing plant. The rest of the children were inside the house sleeping. Suddenly, Jane and Lillian heard a loud boom come from inside the house. A fire ripped through the main floor of the house within minutes. Jane and Lillian tried to get inside to help the children on the second floor, but they couldn't. A neighbor came to help, and he managed to get 13-year-old Catherine, 11-month-old Annette, out safely. Tragically, the other seven children couldn't be saved. The medical examiner determined that 12-year-old Michelle, 11-year-old Dolores, 9-year-old Laura, 8-year-old Donald, 6-year-old Patsy, 4-year-old Sarah, and 2-year-old Christine had all perished due to asphyxiation. Lily and Jane told the fire marshal about the loud boom, but the fire crew found no evidence of an explosion. They thought that the boom they heard came from canned goods and bottles bursting because of the intense heat. At first, the fire department couldn't figure out the source of the fire. But then, Jane admitted that she had started the fire. She said she threw a match onto some papers in the clothing closet on the main floor. The day before, she had said two other fires, but they didn't cause much damage. She couldn't explain why she had started the fire. She wasn't angry with anyone in her family and didn't hold a grudge against any of them. She then signed her four-page confession. Many people who knew the family were shocked by Jane's actions. They thought she was hardworking and responsible. She often cared for her nine siblings. But in hindsight, people remembered an odd incident. Jane had always been good at returning home from school on time. But months earlier, on November 3, 1958, Jane didn't return home. The next day, her parents reported her missing. Local radio stations broadcasted the news that Jane was missing. An unidentified woman heard the report and called the police. She said she saw a girl resembling Jane talking to a man in a car not far from the school. At 9.30 that evening, the family's phone rang. Michael answered it, and he heard a female voice say, Hello? And then the caller hung up. Michael was sure it was his daughter Jane who had called. The next day, Jane was found at her friend's home. No one besides Jane has any idea if her two-day escapade had anything to do with the fire. 14-year-old Jane was indicted on seven counts of first-degree murder. Jane showed no remorse for her actions. The grand jury recommended that Jane should be considered for handling in children's court due to her age. The recommendation was later approved. Jane Shushko was committed to a state institution for treatment and rehabilitation. It's not known if Jane is still alive, and if she is alive, her whereabouts are unknown. Number 3. Bernadette Parati Orinda, California is about 17 miles from downtown San Francisco. In the mid-1980s, it was home to about 16,000 people. 15-year-old Kirsten Costas lived there with her parents and her younger brother. Kirsten's father was an executive at 3M and her mother was a homemaker. She was a popular girl and a varsity cheerleader. She was also a member of a group called the Bobolings, also known as the Bobbies. The Bobbies are a sorority-like group. On June 23, 1984, Kirsten was supposedly picked up by another one of the Bobbies to go for a special dinner for the Bobbies. A short time later, a couple in Morgan, California, Alex and Mary Jane Arnold, were surprised to find Kirsten at their doorstep. 
Kristen's family was friends with the urinals. She explained that her friend had gone weird and she wanted to know if she could use their phone to call her parents. They let her inside and she tried to call her parents. Her family wasn't home because they were at her brother's baseball game. Alex Arnold offered to drive Kirsten home and she accepted the offer. As they drove, Alex noticed a yellow or gold Ford Pinto following them. Kirsten told him not to worry about it. When they got to Kirsten's home, she said she was going to her neighbor's home until her family returned. On the front porch of her neighbor's house, Alex saw Kirsten get attacked by another young woman. Initially, Alex thought the girl was punching her, but then he saw that she had a large knife in her hand. Afterward, the young woman ran off. Kirsten was taken to the hospital. Tragically, 15-year-old Kirsten Costas was pronounced dead shortly after arriving at the hospital. Kirsten had been slashed or stabbed five times. This included two foot-long cuts on her back and a 15-inch slash on her chest that was so deep it cut her lung. The police talked to Alex Arnold, the only witness to the murder. He told them about the Ford Pinto and described the killer as a young woman who was blonde and chunky. The police were sure that the killer had gone to school with Kirsten. They interviewed many students and two young women took polygraph tests but no one was arrested in the weeks after the murder. Six months went by. During that time, the police conducted 300 interviews, followed up on more than a thousand leads, and examined 750 Ford Pintos. But the police were stumped, so they asked the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit for a profile of the killer. They sent them a 10-page profile of the killer. The profile said that when they interviewed the killer, she wouldn't be upset because she felt that the murder was justified. Since Kirsten was stabbed and slashed, it suggests that there was a lot of anger. They also thought that class and income may have played a role in the motive. After reading the profile, the police thought it sounded a lot like a young woman they had interviewed, 16-year-old Bernadette Prodi. Prodi wasn't a friend of Kirsten's, but they knew each other. Prodi went to school with Kirsten, and she was also a member of the Bobbies. Her family owned an orange Ford Pinto. Prodi was the youngest of six children. She was not in the same economic class as many other people at her school, including Kirsten. Her father was a retired engineer with the city of San Francisco. The Prodi's home was full of old furniture and looked run down. The police had interviewed Bernadette Parati four times. Before reading the profile, the police were under the impression that the killer would get emotional when they interviewed her, and Parati never got emotional. She also had an alibi for the time of the murder. She said she was babysitting for another family. Also, she had taken a polygraph exam, and she passed. It turned out that no one had followed up to confirm the alibi. Then an FBI agent reviewed the polygraph results. He concluded that the initial interpretation was wrong. The agent believed that Prodi was being dishonest. This time, an FBI agent interviewed Prodi. Once again, she denied being the killer. The profile and the polygraph results were not enough to arrest her, so she was released. The next day, Prodi left a letter for her parents. She told her mother not to read it until 30 minutes after she left for the day. The letter reads, Dear Mom and Dad, I've been trying to tell you this all day, but I love you so much it's hard, so I'm taking the easy way out. The FBI man thinks I did it, and he is right. I've been able to live with it, but I can't ignore it. It's too much for me, and I can't be that deceiving. Please, still love me. I can't live unless you love me. I ruined my life and yours. I don't know what to do, and I'm ashamed and scared. Bernadette. P.S. Please don't say, how could you, or why, because I don't understand this, and I don't know why. Prodi's mom went and picked up her daughter and brought her to the FBI office. Prodi gave a full confession. She explained that she had tried out for the varsity cheerleading team, but she didn't make it. Kristen Costas made the team, though. 
Probably said that she wanted to join the yearbook club and she wasn't accepted into that either. She also wanted to join the Atlantis club, but didn't get into that club. Instead, she settled for the Bobbies. Then they went on a ski trip and Prady was using older skis and boots. Kirsten's stuff was all new and top of the line. Prady said that Kirsten made some remarks that bothered her. The day before the murder, Prady called and told Kirsten's mother that there was a dinner for the Bobbies. She then picked up Kirsten and told her there was no dinner. Instead, they were going to a party. Kirsten agreed to go to the party, but wanted to go somewhere and smoke marijuana first. Prady said that she didn't want to smoke, but she drove to a church parking lot so Kirsten could smoke. Prady said as they talked, Kirsten said that she was acting weird. She then got out of the car and went to a house. Prady said that she followed Kirsten home. She said that she was worried that Kirsten would tell people that she was weird and make her out to be even more of an outcast. She grabbed an 18 inch knife that she found in the car. She then stabbed and slashed Kirsten. Afterward, she ran back to the car and drove away. She explained that it was never her intention to kill Kirsten. She said she wanted to be friends with her and thought she would become her friend that night. 16-year-old Bernadette Prati was charged with first-degree murder. She went to trial in March 1985 and it was a media circus. There were lineups for people to sit in the courtroom and many were turned away. The trial lasted for three days. The prosecution said that the motive was simple. Bernadette Parati was envious of Kirsten Costas. Kirsten was a varsity cheerleader and from a wealthier family. Kirsten symbolized everything Parati wanted. So she set up the plan to murder her out of jealousy. She made up the story about the dinner and the party. She also brought the knife with her and then killed her. The defense argued that things just spiraled out of control and it was never Prati's intention to kill her. One of Prati's sisters testified and she said she kept the 18 inch knife in the car to chop tomatoes during her lunch break when she worked as a bank examiner. The trial lasted three days. The judge then found her guilty of second degree murder, meaning he did not believe that there was intent. She was sentenced to nine years in California's youth authority. The judge criticized the media and people who attended the trial for treating the case as entertainment. Kirsten Costa's family was incensed by the verdict and they didn't believe Prati's story. They didn't believe that there was a party that night and if there was one, Prati had no intention of taking her there. They noted that she was dressed casually and wasn't dressed for a party. Secondly, they said that their daughter didn't smoke pot. Also, Prati's story about Kirsten wanting to smoke marijuana didn't make sense. If Prati didn't want to smoke pot, why did she take Kirsten somewhere to do it? Why not tell her to smoke when they got to the party? Finally, they didn't believe Prati's sister. Why would she use an 18 inch knife to chop tomatoes? After the murder, Kirsten's family relocated to Hawaii. Bernard Parati was paroled in June 1992 after serving a little more than seven years in prison. Kirsten's family was strongly against her release. After she was released, she changed her name and moved out of the state. Her current whereabouts are unknown. In 1994, NBC released a made-for-TV movie based on the case called A Friend to Die For. Tori Spelling plays the popular cheerleader who is murdered, and Kelly Martin plays her killer. In some markets and on reruns, the film is called Death of a Cheerleader. In 2019, Lifetime remade the movie. Number 2. Christian Romero 29 year old Vincent Romero lived in the small town of St. John's, Arizona, with his 8 year old son, Christian and his second wife, Tiffany. Vincent worked in construction. One of Vincent's co-workers, 39-year-old Timothy Romans, rented a room in their house. St. John's is in East Arizona, and in November 2008, it had a population of less than 4,000. Vincent got sole custody of Christian after he and Christian's mother, Erin Bloomfield, divorced in 2001. Bloomfield lived in Mississippi, but visited her son regularly. 
Vincent was well known in St. John's. He grew up there and knew many of the residents. He often helped his friends, neighbors, and church by doing maintenance. Vincent had constructed his own house. On November 5, 2008, eight-year-old Christian rushed to a neighbor's house. He told them that his father and Timothy Romans were dead. The police came to the house and found eight-year-old Christian outside. He had tears in his eyes and kept saying his dad was dead. He claimed he found them when he got home from school. A 39-year-old Timothy Roman's dead body was found near the front door. He had been shot six times. On the staircase was the dead body of 29-year-old Vincent Romero. He had been shot four times. The police were initially baffled by the shooting. The two men were well liked, so they didn't know who had wanted to murder them. Then Timothy Roman's wife got in contact with the police. She has shocking accusation. She told the police that a year old Christian might be the killer. She said she had been on the phone with Timothy. He had been waiting for Vincent to grab something and then they were going to head out. He then heard Vincent admonish Christian for taking the gun out from under his bed. Then she heard gunshots. Christian then yelled for Timothy to come help because there was something wrong with his dad. Then the call went dead. The police were convinced that the eight-year-old boy was the killer, but they thought he may have witnessed the murders, so they brought him to the police station for questioning. He didn't have a parent, or a guardian, or a lawyer with him. He also wasn't read his rights. Christian then confessed to shooting his dad and Timothy. In order to shoot them multiple times, the bullets had to be loaded once at a time. Controversially, the police released segments of the confession to the media. Here are some clips that were taken from CBS News. So then I went inside and I saw my dad upstairs. I saw a bunch of blood, like a puddle of blood around his head. Did you go anywhere else in the house? No. I went upstairs and I saw him. And then and I cried right there and I was laying down with this crying. Who would you think might have done that? I don't know. So my dad, though. There's some people down the street that are pretty, pretty bad people and all the smoking and driving pretty fast down the road in a blue car. When you shoot a gun, um, some of the powder comes off of it and comes on the clothes. Were any guns shot yesterday? Um, I don't know. Maybe they shot it in the house mm -hmm. and I was wearing the same clothes and maybe mm -hmm. it got on my clothes. Because mm -hmm. those guys could have shot in the house and make some smoke mm -hmm. and I could have walked into it. So we wouldn't find a whole bunch on your clothes yesterday? I don't know. But I wasn't shooting any guns. If you shot a gun yesterday, it would be important that you told us that you shot the gun because we're going to find the house. So we, we I, really need to I know. I think I might have shot the gun. How many times do you think you fired the gun? I think twice. How many times did that gun shoot him? I think twice. I think, um, I think I shot my dad because he was suffering, I think. I think I thought I he was suffering. Okay. So I might have shot him. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that. I didn't want him to suffer. Did you shoot your dad? I think so. Did you shoot him because you were mad at him? So? You think so? So how often do you get in trouble? Most of the time. You get in trouble a lot? For what kind of stuff, huh? For Lauren. Mm -hmm. But you told the truth right now, didn't you? It's a good kid, you know that? Mm -hmm. Eight-year-old Christian Romero was charged with first-degree murder as a juvenile. However, the district attorney wanted the eight-year-old boy to be charged as an adult. Instead, a plea deal was made. No one thought it was in the boy's best interest to acknowledge in court that he had murdered his father. Instead, he pleaded guilty to negligent homicide as a juvenile and the murder of Timothy Romans. Part of the deal is that Christian would never be charged with the murder of his father. He was sentenced to an indeterminate time in a treatment unit. He was then sent to a group home. At age 15, he was placed in a foster home and he went to public school. When Christian was 12, he had three probation violations. Other than that, he had stayed out of trouble. 
In December 2017, when Christian turned 18, he was released from all the conditions surrounding his sentence. The police have never released the motive for why the 8-year-old boy killed his father and his friend. What is known is that when Christian was arrested for the murders, his paternal grandparents were in shock. They said that if any 8-year-old could do it, it was Christian. They thought it was because his father and stepmother had been pushing him too hard. Christian told a Child Protective Services worker that his thousandth spanking would be his last. He had supposedly kept track of the spankings in the ledger. The night before the double homicide, he had been spanked four times for not bringing home papers from school. But the police and the district attorney never confirmed the motive behind the murders. It's been over five years since Christian Romero became a free man. He has continued to stay out of trouble. His current whereabouts are unknown. Number 1. Joe Clark In the early morning hours of July 29, 1995, 13-year-old Thad Phillips fell asleep on the couch in his family's home in Baraboo, Wisconsin. He was awoken by someone carrying him out of the house. He was groggy and assumed the young man was a family friend. The young man convinced him to run to a house less than half a mile away. Thad did as he was told and ran to the rundown house. When they got inside, Thad realized he didn't know the young man. The young man said his name was Joe. Joe said he lived with his parents while they were out of town. Then suddenly and totally unprovoked, Joe grabbed Thad's right leg and twisted his ankle until it broke. Despite having a broken ankle, Thad tried to escape, but Joe caught him. Joe grabbed Thad's right leg, which was already broken, and pushed it towards his head until his femur snapped. Joe then snapped Thad's left ankle. That night, Joe jumped on Thad's legs and twisted his broken ankles until he was tired. Over the next two days, Joe tortured Thad by twisting his ankles and jumping on his legs. In between torture sessions, Thad asked Joe why he was doing this. Joe said he liked the sound of bones breaking. Thad also asked Joe if he had done this before. He said he had done it to Chris Diner and another boy. Thad could not remember the other boy's name. Chris Steiner was a 14-year-old boy who had disappeared from his family's home in Baraboo in the middle of the night a year earlier on July 4, 1994. His body was found in a river five days after he went missing. The cause of death had been drowning and it was thought that his death was an accident. 43 hours after Thad was kidnapped, Joe locked him in the closet and Joe left the house. Thad broke out of the closet and dragged himself down the stairs. He passed out several times. He managed to find a phone and called the police who rescued him. The young man who kidnapped and tortured him was identified as 17-year-old Joseph Clark. In his bedroom, the police found a list with other boys' names on it with a headline that read, Leg Thing. The police looked at Chris Downer's autopsy report and found that no x-rays had been performed on his body. His body was exhumed and x-rayed. It turned out that the bones in his legs had breaks and fractures similar to Thad's injuries. Joe Clark was charged with first degree murder. Joe Clark pleaded no contest to attempted murder amongst other charges for torturing Thad. In November 1996, he was sentenced to 100 years in prison. He went to trial in November 1997 for Chris's murder. The trial lasted five days. Then the jury deliberated for seven hours. Joe Clark was found guilty of first degree murder. Clark, who was nicknamed the Bone Breaker, was sentenced to life in prison. Thad needed surgery to walk again. But he was hailed as a hero because the police think that Joe Clark would have killed other boys had Thad not escaped. Oddly enough, in October 1997, two years after Thad was tortured, Thad was feuding with a 15-year-old boy. The boy shot Thad in the back because he thought that Thad was going to beat him up. Thad also survived that ordeal. Joe Clark is currently in prison, but it's unclear where. 
Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.